Chapter One of Malcolm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Malcolm by George MacDonald. Chapter One Miss Horn. Na, na, I had no feelings, I'm thankful to say. I never kent any good come of them. That a terrible sight in the gate. "'Nobody ever thought of laying it to your charge, ma'am. "'Deed, I had enough ado to do the thing I had to do, "'not to say the thing that nobody would do but myself. "'I had no leisure for feelings in that,' insisted Miss Horn. "'But here a heavy step descending the stair just outside the room "'attracted her attention, "'and checking the flow of her speech perforce, "'with three ungainly strides she reached the landing. "'Watty Witherspale! Watty!' she called after the footsteps down the stair. "'Yes, ma'am.' "'answered a gruff voice from below. "'Watty, when you fess the bit boxy, "'just pit a hammer and a puckle nails in your pouch "'to mend the hen-house door. "'The tain mun be a tenant till as well as the tither.' "'The bit boxy was the coffin of her third cousin, "'Griselda Campbell, "'whose body lay in the room on her left hand "'as she called down the stair. "'Into that on her right, Miss Horne now re-entered, "'to rejoin Mrs. Mellis, "'the wife of the principal draper in the town, "'who had called ostensibly to condole with her.' but really to see the corpse. "'Ay, she was tain young,' sighed the visitor, with long-drawn tones and a shake of the head, implying that therein lay ground of complaint, at which poor mortals dared but hint. "'Not that young,' returned Miss Horne. "'She was upon the edge of aught and thirty. "'Well, she had a sair time o't. "'Not that sair, so far as I can see. "'And who should ken better? "'She's had a bin down sitting, and should have had as long as I was to the fore.' "'Na, nah, na, nah. it was neither so young, nor yet so sair. "'Ay, but she was a patient creature with all flesh,' persisted Mrs. Mellis, "'as if she would not willingly be foiled in the attempt to extort for the dead "'some syllable of acknowledgment from the lips of her late companion. "'Deed she was that, a ween or a patient with some. "'But that came a had mere her heart nor brains. "'She had feelings, gin ye like, and to spare. "'But I never took o'er any of the stock. "'It's a pity she had not the judgment to match.' "'for she never misdoubted anybody enough. "'But I wot it is not matter, no, "'for she's gone where it's less wanted. "'For when it has the harmlessness of the dove "'in this ill-walled world, "'there's a thick a ten that has the wisdom of the serpent, "'and the serpents make sair work with the doves, "'let alone them it flees into the very mills of them. "'Well, you're just right there,' said Mrs. Mellis. "'And as you say, she was aye some easy to persuade. "'I had no doubt she believed to the very last "'he would come back and marry her.' "'Come back and marry her? "'Who or what div you mean? "'I just tell you, Mistress Mellis, "'and it's well you're named. "'Can you dare to hint at one word of such clavers? "'It's this side of this door of mine "'you used to be less acquaint with.' "'As she spoke, "'the hawk eyes of Miss Horn "'glowed on each side of her hawk nose, "'which grew more and more hooked as she glared, "'while her neck went craning forward "'as if she were on the point "'of making a swoop on the offender. "'Mrs. Mellis's voice trembled "'with something very like fear "'as she replied.' "'Good guide is Miss Horn. "'What have I said to gar you look at me so by ordinary as that?' "'Sid,' repeated Miss Horn, "'in a tone that revealed both annoyance with herself "'and contempt for her visitor. "'There's not a clever in all the countryside "'but ye mon fess at home and eat your oxter, "'as gin it were the prodigal afore he repented. "'You should get small thanks for such like here, "'and her lying there as she'll lie till the judgment day, poor thing.' "'I'm sure I meant no offence, Miss Horn,' said her visitor. "'I thought nobody kent that she was ill about him.' "'About who in the name of the father of lies? "'Oh, about that long-legged doctor that set out for the Ingies "'and died afore he won across the equator. "'Only folks said he was no more dead nor a halvert worm "'and would be home when she was married. "'It's all lies frae head to foot and frae heart to skin.' "'Well, it was plain to see she dwined away after he got "'and never was herself again. "'You dinna deny that.' "'It's all havers,' persisted Miss Horn, "'but in accents considerably softened. "'She cared no more about the child, nor I did my sail. "'She dwined, I grant ye, and he goed away, I grant ye. "'But the wind blows and the water runs, "'and the tain has little to do with the tither. "'Well, well, I'm sorry I said anything to offend ye, "'and I cannot say mair. "'With your leave, Miss Horn, "'I'll just gang and take a last look at her poor thing. "'Deed, ye should do nothing of the kind. "'I shall let nobody glower at her "'it would gang and spare just a cavers about her, Mistress Millis. "'To say it, such a dove as my Griselle, "'poor, soft-hearted, winsome thing,' "'Would it look twice at any sicker serpent as him? "'Na, na, ma'am. "'Gang your ways home, "'and come back straight for your prayers the morn's morning. "'By that time she'll be quiet in her coffin, 
and I'll be quiet in my temper. Sign I'll let you see her, maybe. I wish I was well rid of the sight of her, for I cannot bide it. Lord, I cannot bide it. These last words were uttered in a murmured aside, inaudible to Mrs. Mellis, to whom, however, they did not apply, but to the dead body. She rose notwithstanding in considerable displeasure, and with a formal farewell walked from the room, casting a curious glance as she left it in the direction of that where the body lay, and ascended the stairs as slowly as if on every step she deliberated whether the next would bear her weight. Miss Horne, who had followed her to the head of the stair, watched her out of sight below the landing, when she turned and walked back once more into the parlour, but with a lingering look towards the opposite room, as if she saw through the closed door what lay white on the white bed. "'It's a God's mercy I had no feelings,' she said to herself. "'To even my bonny Griselle, to sick a long, kite-clung child as yon. "'Ay, poor Griselle. She's gone frae me like a knotless thread.'" End of chapter 1《ハッピーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバー but hearing no footstep along the passage to the kitchen, concluded, "'It's not her, for she gangs about the host like the fore half of a new shod coat,' and went down the stair to see who might have thus presumed to enter unbidden. In the kitchen, the floor of which was as white as scrubbing could make it and sprinkled with sea-sand, under the gaily painted Dutch clock, which went on ticking as loud as ever, though just below the dead, sat a woman about sixty years of age, whose plump face to the first glance looked kindly, to the second, cunning, and to the third, evil. To the last look, the plumpness appeared unhealthy, suggesting a doughy indentation to the finger, and its color also was pasty. Her deep-set, black, bright eyes, glowing from under the darkest of eyebrows which met over her nose, had something of a fascinating influence, so much of it that at a first interview one was not likely for a time to notice any other of her features. She rose as Miss Horne entered, buried a fat fist in a soft side, and stood silent. "'Well,' said Miss Horne interrogatively, and was silent also. "'I thought you might want a cast of my calling,' said the woman. "'Na, na, there's not a hand it shall lay finger upon the bairn but mine ain,' said Miss Horne. "'I had it all o'er my lee lawn afore the scree a day. She's layin' quiet now, very quiet, waitin' upon Watty with her spale. When he fesses home her bit boxy, we shall have laid canny into it, and he'd done with it. "'Well, ma'am, for a lady born like yourself, I mun say you take your uncle composed. "'I'm not aware, Mistress Catanal, o' any necessity laid upon you to say your mind in this house. "'It's not expected. But what for should I not take it with composure? "'We'll have to take our own turn ere long, as composed as we have the skill of, "'and gang out like a long nibbit kennel. "'Ay, and leave just sick a memory o' hind some o' us, Bobby.' "'I cannot gin ye me and me, Miss Horne, said the woman. "'But it's not that muckle o' memory I expect to lee ahind me.' "'The less the better,' muttered Miss Horne, but her unwelcome visitor went on. "'Them it's most in my debt kens least about it, and then mithers cannot be said to have muckle to be thankful for. It's God's truth. I ken warn or ever I did, mem. A body in my trade can I help fawn among ill company wiles, for we're all born in sin, and brought forth in iniquity, as the book says. In fact, it's all sin together. We come a sin and we gang for sin, but ye ken the likes o' me mon a clipe. "'All the same, can ye dinna take the help o' my hand, "'ye winna refuse me the sight o' my ain, poor thing. "'There's none to look upon her dead "'it wasna a pleasure till her livin', "'and ye ken well enough, Bobby, "'she couldna thole the sight o' you. "'And good reason had she for that, "'gin all it gangs through my hair ere I fall asleep in the long mirk nights "'be a hair better nor one of the old wives' fables "'that folk says the holy book makes a light o'. "'What mean ye?' demanded Miss Horne, "'sternly and curtly. "'I ken what I mean myself.' "'and one that's not content with that, but ill be a howdy. "'Midwife. "'I would fain a gotten a fancy out o' my head "'that's been there this many a lang day. "'But please yourself, ma'am, gin ye winna be neighbourly. "'You so no gang near her, "'not to save you frae all the ill dreams "'that ever gathered about a sin-stappit boaster. 
cried Miss Horn, and drew down her long upper lip in a strong arch. Cacani, cacani, said Bobby. Dinna anger me or sair, for I am but mortal. Folk take a heap frae you, Miss Horn, at they'll take frae nen either, for your temper's will, Kent and little Madel. But it's an ill fared thing to anger the howdy. Some muckle lies upon her, and I'm not in the tune to put up with muckle the night. I wonder at ye being so unneighbor like. At sick a time, too, with a corp in the house. Gang away. Gang out to it. It's my house, said Miss Horn, in a low, hoarse voice, restrained from rising to tempest pitch only by the consciousness of what lay on the other side of the ceiling above her head. I would as soon let a cat into the dead chamber to gang lope nor the corp, or maybe were, as I would let your cell into it, Bobby Catana, and there's till ye. At this moment, the opportune entrance of Jean afforded fitting occasion to her mistress for leaving the room, without encountering the dilemma of either turning the woman out, a proceeding which the latter, from the way in which she set her short, stout figure square on the floor, appeared ready to resist, or of herself abandoning the field in discomfiture. She turned and marched from the kitchen with her head in the air, and the gait of one who had been insulted on her own premises. She was sitting in the parlor, still red-faced and wrathful, when Jean entered, and closing the door behind her, drew near to her mistress, bearing a narrative, commenced at the door, of all she had seen, heard, and done, while oaten a boat in the tone. But Miss Horne interrupted her the moment she began to speak. "'Is that woman forth the host, Jean?' she asked, in the tone of one who waited her answer in the affirmative, as a preliminary condition of all further conversation. "'She's gone, ma'am,' answered Jean, adding to herself in a wordless thought. "'I'm not saying where.' "'She's a woman I wouldna have you throng with, Jean.' "'I ken na ill her, ma'am,' returned Jean. "'She's enough to corrupt a kirkyard,' said her mistress, with more force than fitness. Jean, however, was on the shady side of fifty, more likely to have already yielded than to be liable to a first assault of corruption. And little did Miss Horne think how useless was her warning, or where Barbara Cadenach was at that very moment. Trusting to Jean's cunning, as well she might, she was in the dead chamber, and standing over the dead. She had folded back the sheet, not from the face, but from the feet, and raised the nightdress of fine linen in which the love of her cousin had robed the dead for the repose of the tomb. "'It would have been telling her,' she muttered, "'to a spoken Bobby fair. "'I'm no use to be fallen foul of that gate. "'I to be even with her yet, I'm thinking. "'The old Spelden. "'Losh, and praise be thanked. "'There it is. "'It's there. "'A wee darker, but the same. "'Just where I could have laid the pint of my finger upon it in the murk. "'No, let the worms eat it,' she concluded, "'as she folded down the linen of shroud and sheet. "'And no mortal kennel it but myself, "'and him at bode till I seen it, "'gin he was a hair better nor Glen Candy's man in the old ballant. "'The instant she had rearranged the garments of the dead, "'she turned and made for the door with a softness of step "'that strangely contrasted with the ponderousness of her figure, "'and indicated great muscular strength, "'opened it with noiseless circumspection to the width of an inch, "'peeped out from the crack,' and seeing the opposite door still shut, stepped out with a swift, noiseless swing of person and door simultaneously, closed the door behind her, stole down the stairs, and left the house. Not a board creaked, not a latch clicked as she went. She stepped into the street as sedately as if she had come from paying to the dead the last offices of her composite calling, the projected front of her person appearing itself aware of its dignity as the visible sign and symbol of a good conscience and kindly heart. End of chapter 2。Chapter 3 of Malcolm by George MacDonald。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Devora Allen。Chapter 3 。The Mad Laird。When Mistress Cadena arrived at the opening of a street which was just opposite her own door, and led steep toward the sea town, she stood and shading her eyes with her hooded hand, although the sun was far behind her, looked out to sea. It was the forenoon of a day of early summer. The larks were many and loud in the skies above her, for, although she stood in a street, she was only a few yards from the green fields. But she could hardly have heard them, for their music was not for her. To the northward, whither her gaze, if gaze it could be called, was directed, 
All but cloudless blue heavens stretched over an all but shadowless blue sea. Two bold, jagged promontories, one on each side of her, formed a wide bay. Between that on the west and the sea town at her feet lay a great curve of yellow sand, upon which the long breakers, born of last night's wind, were still roaring from the northeast, although the gale had now sunk to a breeze, cold and of doubtful influence. From the chimneys of the fishermen's houses below ascended a yellowish smoke, which against the blue of the sea assumed a dull green color as it drifted vanishing towards the southwest. But Mrs. Cardinal was looking neither at nor for anything. She had no fisherman husband, or any other relative at sea. She was but revolving something in her unwholesome mind, and this was her mode of concealing an operation which naturally would have been performed with down-bent head and eyes on the ground. While she thus stood, a strange figure drew near, approaching her with step almost as noiseless as that with which she had herself made her escape from Miss Horne's house. At a few yards' distance from her it stood, and gazed up at her countenance as intently as she seemed to be gazing on the sea. It was a man of dwarfish height and uncertain age, with a huge hump upon his back, features of great refinement, a long thin beard, and a forehead unnaturally large over eyes which, although of a pale blue mingled with a certain mottled milky gleam, had a pathetic, dog-like expression. Decently dressed in black, he stood with his hands in the pockets of his trousers, gazing immovably in Mrs. Cadenaugh's face. Becoming suddenly aware of his presence, she glanced downward, gave a great start and a half-scream, and exclaimed in no gentle tones, "'Preserve us! Where come you, Frey?' It was neither that she did not know the man, nor that she meant any offence. Her words were the mere embodiment of the annoyance of startled surprise, but their effect was peculiar. Without a single other motion he turned abruptly on one heel, gazed seaward with quick flushed cheeks and glowing eyes, but apparently too polite to refuse an answer to the evidently unpleasant question, replied in low, almost sullen tones, "'I do not ken where I come frae.' Ye ken er I dinna ken where I come frae. I dinna ken where ye come frae. I dinna ken where anybody comes frae. Hoot, laird, no offence, returned Mrs. Cadenaugh. It was your ain wife. What guard ye stand glorin' at a body that gate? On tell them it ye was there. I thought ye was looking where ye came frae, returned the man, in tones apologetic and hesitating. Deed, I fash with no such freights, said Mrs. Cadenaugh. So long as ye ken where ye go until suggested the man. Toots, I fash as little with that either, and kin just as muckle about the tain as the tither, she answered with a low, oily, guttural laugh of contemptuous pity. I ken mer no that myself, but no muckle, said the man. I dinna ken where I came frae, and I dinna ken where I'm goin' to, but I ken that I'm goin' where I came frae. That stands to reason, you see. But they tell me at ye ken all about where we all come frae. Deal a bit of it, persisted Mrs. Cadenaugh, in tones of repudiation. What care I where I come frae, so long as... So long as what, gin you please, pleaded the man, with a childlike entreaty in his voice. Well, gin you will have it, so long as I came frae... My mother, said the woman, looking down on the inquirer with a vulgar laugh. The hunchback uttered a shriek of dismay, and turned and fled. And as he turned, long, thin, white hands flashed out of his pockets, pressed against his ears, and intertwined their fingers at the back of his neck. With a marvellous swiftness he shot down the steep descent towards the shore. "'The deal's in it at I boot to anger him,' said the woman, and walked away, with a short laugh of small satisfaction. The style she had given the hunchback was no nickname. Stephen Stewart was laird of the small property and ancient house of Kirkbyers, of which his mother managed the affairs. Hardly for her son— seeing that, beyond his clothes and five pounds a year of pocket money, he derived no personal advantage from his possessions. He never went near his own house, for, from some unknown reason, plentifully aimed at in the dark by the neighbors, he had such a dislike to his mother that he could not bear to hear the name of mother, or even the slightest allusion to the relationship. Some said he was a fool, others a madman, some both. None, however, said he was a rogue, and all would have been willing to allow that whatever it might be that caused the difference between him and other men, throughout the disturbing element, blew ever and anon the air of a sweet humanity. 
Along the shore, in the direction of the great rocky promontory that closed in the bay on the west, with his hands still clasped over his ears, as if the awful word were following him, he flew rather than fled. It was nearly low water, and the wet sand afforded an easy road to his flying feet. Betwixt sea and shore, a sail in the offing the sole other moving thing in the solitary landscape, like a hunted creature he sped, his footsteps melting and vanishing behind him in the half-quicksand. Where the curve of the water-line turned northward, at the root of the promontory, six or eight fishing-boats were drawn up on the beach in various stages of existence. One was little more than half-built, the fresh wood shining against the background of dark rock. Another was newly tarred. Its sides glistened with the rich, shadowy brown, and filled the air with a comfortable odor. Another wore age-long neglect on every plank and seam. Half its props had sunk or decayed, and the huge hollow leaned low on one side, disclosing the squalid desolation of its lean, ribbed, and naked interior, producing all the phantasmic effect of a great swampy desert. Old pools of water overgrown with a green scum lay in the hollows between its rotting timbers, and the upper planks were baking and cracking in the sun. Near where they lay, a steep path ascended the cliff, whence through grass and ploughed land it led across the promontory to the fishing village of Scarnos, which lay on the other side of it. There the mad laird, or mad humpy, as he was called by the baser sort, often received shelter, chiefly from the family of a certain Joseph Mare, one of the most respectable inhabitants of the place. But the way he now pursued lay close under the cliffs of the headland, and was rocky and difficult. He passed the boats, going between them and the cliffs, at a foot-pace, with his eyes on the ground, and not even a glance at the two men who were at work on the unfinished boat. One of them was his friend, Joseph Mare. They ceased their work for a moment to look after him. "'That's the poor laird again,' said Joseph, the instant he was beyond hearing. "'Something's wrong with him. I wonder what's come o'er him.' "'I ha'n't seen him for a while now,' returned the other. "'They tell me it his mither made him o'er to the devil for he came to the light. "'And so I, as his birthday comes round, Satan gets the power o'er him. "'Eh, yeah, but he's a fearsome sight when he's ta'en that gate,' continued the speaker. "'I met him once in the gloamin', just o'er by the tone, "'with his eyen glorin' like oily lamps, "'and the sliver running down his long beard. "'I just lop as gin I had seen the muckle sartin himsel.' "'Ye not na ha' done that,' was the reply. He's just as harmless, e'en at the worst, as any lamb. He's but a poor creature, whose troubles o'er strong for him, that's all. Certain has as little to do with him as with any man I can. End of chapter 3《Femi Mare》With eyes that stared as if they and not her ears were the organs of hearing, this talk was heard by a child of about ten years of age, who sat in the bottom of the ruined boat, like a pearl in a decaying oyster shell, one hand arrested in the act of dabbling in a green pool, the other on its way to her lips with a mouthful of the seaweed called dulce. She was the daughter of Joseph Mare just mentioned, a fisherman who had been to sea in a man of war in consequence of which his toe-name, or nickname, was Blue Peter, where, having been found capable, he was employed as carpenter's mate, and came to be very handy with his tools. Having saved a little money by serving in another man's boat, he was now building one for himself. He was a dark-complexioned, foreign-looking man, with gold rings in his ears, which he said enabled him to look through the wind, on his ain water. Unlike most of his fellows, he was a sober and indeed thoughtful man, ready to listen to the voice of reason from any quarter. They were, in general, men of hardihood and courage, encountering as a mere matter of course such perilous weather as the fishers on a great part of our coast would have declined to meet, and during the fishing season were diligent in their calling, and made a good deal of money. But when the weather was such that they could not go to sea, when their nets were in order and nothing special requiring to be done, they would have bouts of hard drinking, and spend a great portion of what ought to have been their provision for the winter. Their women were in general coarse in manners and rude in speech, often of great strength and courage, and of strongly marked character. They were almost invariably the daughters of fishermen, 
for a wife taken from among the rural population would have been all but useless in regard of the peculiar duties required of her. If these were less dangerous than those of their husbands, they were quite as laborious and less interesting. The most severe consisted in carrying the fish into the country for sale, in a huge creel or basket, which, when full, was sometimes more than a man could lift to place on the woman's back. With this burden, kept in its place by a band across her chest, she would walk as many as twenty miles, arriving at some inland town early in the forenoon, in time to dispose of her fish for the requirements of the day. I may add that, although her eldest child was probably born within a few weeks after her marriage, infidelity was almost unknown amongst them. In some respects, although in none of its good qualities, Mrs. Mare was an exception from her class. Her mother had been the daughter of a small farmer, and she had well-to-do relations in an inland parish. But how much these facts were concerned in the result, it would be hard to say. Certainly she was one of those elect, whom nature sends into the world for the softening and elevation of her other children. She was still slight and graceful, with a clear complexion, and the prettiest teeth possible. The former two at least of which advantages she must have lost long before, had it not been that, while her husband's prudence had rendered hard work less imperative, he had a singular care over her good looks, and that a rough, honest elder sister of his lived with them, whom it would have been no kindness to keep from the hardest work, seeing it was only through such that she could have found a sufficiency of healthy interest in life. While Janet Mare carried the creel, Annie only assisted in making the nets, and in cleaning and drying the fish, of which they cured considerable quantities. These, with her household and maternal duties, afforded her ample occupation. Their children were well trained, and being of necessity from the narrowness of their house accommodation, a great deal with their parents, heard enough to make them think after their faculty. The mad laird was, as I have said, a visitor at their house oftener than anywhere else. On such occasions he slept in a garret accessible by a ladder from the ground floor, which consisted only of a kitchen and a closet. Little Femi Mare was therefore familiar with his appearance, his ways, and his speech, and she was a favorite with him, although hitherto his shyness had been sufficient to prevent any approach to intimacy with even a child of ten. When the poor fellow had got some little distance beyond the boats, he stopped and withdrew his hands from his ears. In rushed the sound of the sea, the louder that the caverns of his brain had been so long closed to its entrance. With a moan of dismay he once more pressed his palms against them, and thus deafened, shouted with a voice of agony into the noise of the rising tide, "'I dinna ken where I come frae!' After which cry, wrung from the grief of human ignorance, he once more took to his heels, though with far less swiftness than before, and fled stumbling and scrambling over the rocks. Scarcely had he vanished from view of the boats, when Femi scrambled out of her big mussel shell. Its upheaved side being toward the boat at which her father was at work, she escaped unperceived, and so ran along the base of the promontory, where the rough way was perhaps easier to the feet of a child content to take smaller steps, and climb or descend by the help of more insignificant inequalities. She came within sight of the laird, just as he turned into the mouth of a well-known cave, and vanished. Femi was one of those rare and blessed natures, which have endless courage because they have no distrust, and she ran straight into the cave after him, without even first stopping to look in. It was not a very interesting cave to look into. The strata of which it was composed, upheaved almost to the perpendicular, shaped an opening like the half of a Gothic arch divided vertically and leaning over a little to one side, which opening rose to the full height of the cave and seemed to lay bare every corner of it to a single glance. In length it was only about four or five times its width. The floor was smooth and dry, consisting of hard rock. The walls and roof were jagged with projections and shadowed with recesses, but there was little to rouse any frightful fancies. When Femi entered, the laird was nowhere to be seen, but she went straight to the back of the cave, to its farthest visible point. There she rounded a projection, and began an ascent which only familiarity with rocky ways could have enabled such a child to accomplish. At the top she passed through another opening, and by a longer and more gently sloping descent, reached the floor of a second cave, as level and nearly as smooth as a table. On her left hand, what light managed to creep through the tortuous entrance was caught, 
and reflected in a dull glimmer from the undefined surface of a well of fresh water, which lay in a sort of basin in the rock. On a bedded stone beside it sat the laird, with his head in his hands, his elbows on his knees, and his hump upheaved above his head, like Mount Sinai over the head of Christian in the Pilgrim's Progress. As his hands were still pressed on his ears, he heard nothing of Femi's approach, and she stood for a while staring at him in the vague glimmer, apparently with no anxiety as to what was to come next. Weary at length, for the forlorn man continued movelessly sunk in his own thoughts, or what he had for such, the eyes of the child began to wander about the darkness, to which they had already got so far accustomed as to make the most of the scanty light. Presently she fancied she saw something glitter away in the darkness. Two things. They must be eyes. The eyes of an otter or of a polecat, in which creatures the caves along the shore abounded. Seized with sudden fright, she ran to the laird and laid her hand on his shoulder, crying, "'Look, laird! Look!' He started to his feet and gazed bewildered at the child, rubbing his eyes once and again. She stood between the well and the entrance, so that all the light there was gathered upon her pale face. "'Where do you come from?' he cried. "'I come through the old boat,' she answered. "'What do you want with me?' "'Nothing, sir. I only came to see who you was getting on. I wouldn't have disturbed you, sir, but I saw the two een of a wolcat or such like glowering away yonder in the murk, and they flate me at I grip at you.' "'Well, well, sit you down, Bernie,' said the mad laird in a soothing voice. "'The wool cat sent a touch you. "'You're no flate at me, are you?' "'Eh, na,' answered the child. "'What for should I be flate at you, sir? "'I'm Femi Mare. "'Eh, Bernie, it's you, is it?' "'He returned in tones of satisfaction, "'for he had not hitherto recognized her. "'Sit you down, sit you down, "'and we'll see about it all.' "'Femi obeyed, and seated herself on the nearest projection. The laird placed himself beside her, and once more buried his face, but not his ears, in his hands. Nothing entered them, however, but the sound of the rising tide, for Femi sat by him in the faintly glimmering dusk, as without fear felt, so without word spoken. The evening crept on, and the night came down, but all the effect of the growing darkness was that the child drew gradually nearer to her uncouth companion until at length her hand stole into his, her head sank upon his shoulder, his arm went round her to hold her safe, and thus she fell fast asleep. After a while, the laird gently roused her and took her home, on their way warning her, in strange yet to her comprehensible utterance, to say nothing of where she had found him, for if she exposed his place of refuge, wicked people would take him, and he should never see her again. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Malcolm by George MacDonald – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen – Chapter 5 – Lady Florimel All the coast to the east of the little harbour was rock, bold and high, of a grey and brown hard stone which, after a mighty sweep, shot out northward, and closed in the bay on that side with a second great promontory. The long curved strip of sand on the west, reaching to the promontory of Skarnos, was the only open portion of the coast for miles. Here the coasting vessel gliding past gained a pleasant peep of open fields, belts of wood and farmhouses, with now and then a glimpse of a great house amidst its trees. In the distance one or two bare solitary hills, imposing an aspect only from their desolation, for their form gave no effect to their altitude, rose to the height of over a thousand feet. On this comparatively level part of the shore, parallel with its line, and at some distance beyond the usual high-water mark, the waves of ten thousand northern storms had cast up a long dune or bank of sand, terminating towards the west within a few yards of a huge solitary rock of the ugly kind called conglomerate, which must have been separated from the roots of the promontory by the rush of waters at unusually high tides. For in winter they still sometimes rounded the rock, and running down behind the dune, turned it into a long island. The sand on the inland side of the dune, covered in short, sweet grass, browsed on by sheep and with the largest and reddest of daisies, was thus occasionally swept by wild salt waves. And at times, when the northern wind blew straight as an arrow and keen as a sword from the regions of endless snow, 
lay under a sheet of gleaming ice. The sun had been up for some time in a cloudless sky. The wind had changed to the south and wafted soft country odors to the shore, in place of sweeping to inland farms the scents of seaweed and broken salt waters, mingled with a suspicion of icebergs. From what was called the Seton, or Sea Town, of Port Lossie, a crowd of cottages occupied entirely by fisherfolk, a solitary figure was walking westward along this grass at the back of the dune, singing. On his left hand the ground rose to the high road. On his right was the dune, interlaced and bound together by the long, clasping roots of the coarse bent, without which its sands would have been but the sport of every wind that blew. It shut out from him all sight of the sea, but the moan and rush of the rising tide sounded close behind it. At his back rose the town of Port Lossie, high above the harbour and the Seton, with its houses of grey and brown stone, roofed with blue slates and red tiles. It was no highland town, scarce one within it could speak the highland tongue, yet down from its high streets on the fitful air of the morning now floated intermittently the sound of bagpipes, born winding from street to street, and loud blown to wake the sleeping inhabitants and let them know that it was now six of the clock. He was a youth of about twenty, with a long, swinging, heavy-footed stride, which took in the ground rapidly, a movement unlike that of the other men of the place, who always walked slowly, and never but on dire compulsion ran. He was rather tall and large-limbed. His dress was like that of a fisherman, consisting of blue serge trousers, a shirt striped blue and white, and a Guernsey frock, which he carried flung across his shoulder. On his head he wore a round blue bonnet, with a tuft of scarlet in the center. His face was more than handsome, with large features, not finely cut, and a look of mingled nobility and ingenuousness, the latter amounting to simplicity or even innocence, while the clear outlook from his full and well-opened hazel eyes indicated both courage and promptitude. His dark brown hair came in large curling masses from under his bonnet. It was such a form and face as would have drawn every eye in a crowded thoroughfare. About the middle of the long sand hill, a sort of wide embrasure was cut in its top, in which stood an old-fashioned brass swivel gun. When the lad reached the place, he sprang up the sloping side of the dune, seated himself on the gun, drew from his trousers a large silver watch, regarded it steadily for a few minutes, replaced it, and took from his pocket a flint and steel, wherewith he kindled a bit of touch paper, which rising he applied to the vent of the swivel followed a great roar. Its echoes had nearly died away, when a startled little cry reached his keen ear, and looking along the shore to discover whence it came, he spied a woman on a low rock that ran a little way out into the water. She had half risen from a sitting posture, and apparently her cry was the result of the discovery that the rising tide had overreached and surrounded her. There was no danger whatever, but the girl might well shrink from plunging into the clear barrel depth in which swayed the seaweed clothing the slippery slopes of the rock. He rushed from the sand hill, crying as he approached her, "'Dinna be in a hurry, mem. Bide till I come to ye,' and running straight into the water, struggled through the deepening tide, the distance being short, and the depth almost too shallow for swimming. In a moment he was by her side, scarcely saw the bare feet she had been bathing in the water, heeded as little the motion of the hand which waved him back, caught her in his arms like a baby, and had her safe on the shore ere she could utter a word. Nor did he stop until he had carried her to the slope of the sand hill, where he set her gently down, and without a suspicion of the liberty he was taking, and filled only with a passion of service, was proceeding to dry her feet with the frock which he had dropped there as he ran to her assistance. "'Let me alone, pray!' cried the girl with a half-amused indignation, drawing back her feet, and throwing down a book she had carried that she might the better hide them with her skirt. But although she shrank from his devotion, she could neither mistake it nor help being pleased with his kindness. Probably she had never before been immediately indebted to such an ill-clad individual of the human race. But even in such a costume she could not fail to see he was a fine fellow. Nor was the impression disturbed when he opened his mouth and spoke in the broad dialect of the country for she had no associations to cause her to misinterpret its homeliness as vulgarity. "'What is your stockings, ma'am?' he said. "'You gave me no time to bring them away. You caught me up so rudely,' answered the girl half querulously, but in such lovely speech as had never before greeted his Scottish ears. 
Before the words were well beyond her lips, he was already on his way back to the rock, running, as he walked, with great heavy-footed strides. The abandoned shoes and stockings were in imminent danger of being floated off by the rising water, but he dashed in, swam a few strokes, caught them up, waded back to the shore, and leaving a wet track all the way behind him, but carrying the rescued clothing at arm's length before him, rejoined their owner. Spreading his frock out before her, he laid the shoes and stockings upon it, and observing that she continued to keep her feet hidden under the skirts of her dress, turned his back and stood. "'Why don't you go away?' said the girl, venturing one set of toes from under their tent, but hesitating to proceed further in the business. Without word or turn of head he walked away. Either flattered by his absolute obedience and persuaded that he was a true squire, or unwilling to forego what amusement she might gain from him, she drew in her half-issuing foot, and certainly urged in part by an inherited disposition to tease, spoke again. "'You're not going away without thanking me,' she said. "'What for, mem? he returned simply, standing stock still again with his back towards her. "'You needn't stand so. You don't think I would go on dressing while you remained in sight?' "'I was as good as away, mem, he said, and turning a glowing face, looked at her for a moment, then cast his eyes on the ground. "'Tell me what you mean by not thanking me,' she insisted. "'They would be dull thanks, mem, that were thanked afore I kenned what for. "'For allowing you to carry me ashore, of course. "'Be thanked, mem, with all my heart. "'Will I gang down on my knees? "'No, why should you go on your knees? "'Cause you're most o'er bonny to look at standing, mem, "'and I'm feared for angering ye. "'Don't say ma'am to me.' "'What am I to say, then, mem? "'I ask your pardon, mem. "'Say my lady. "'That's how people speak to me. "'I thought you would to be somebody by ordinary, my lady. "'That'll be how you're so terrible bonny,' he returned, "'with some tremulousness in his tone. "'But you mun put on your hose, my lady, "'or you'll get your feet cold, "'and that's no good for the likes of you.' "'The form of address she prescribed "'conveyed to him no definite idea of rank.' It but added intensity to the notion of her being a lady, as distinguished from one of the women of his own condition in life. "'And pray what is to become of you,' she returned, "'with your clothes as wet as water can make them.' "'The salt water kens me o'er well to do me any ill,' returned the lad. "'I gang wet to the skin money a day for a morning till night, "'and money a night for a night till morning, "'at the heron fishing ye can, my lady.' One might well be inclined to ask what could have tempted her to talk in such a familiar way to a creature like him. Human, indeed, but separated from her by a gulf more impassable far than that which divided her from the thrones, principalities, and powers of the upper regions. And how is the fact to be accounted for, that here she put out a dainty foot, and reaching for one of her stockings began to draw it gently over the said foot? Either her sense of his inferiority was such that she regarded his presence no more than that of a dog, or possibly she was tempted to put his behavior to the test. He, on his part, stood quietly regarding the operation, either that, with the instinct of an inborn refinement, he was aware he ought not to manifest more shamefacedness than the lady herself, or that he was hardly more accustomed to the sight of gleaming fish than the bare feet of maidens. "'I'm thinking, my lady,' he went on in absolute simplicity, "'that small foot of your has danced many a brawl dance on many a brawl floor.' "'How old do you take me for, then?' she rejoined, and went on drawing the garment over her foot by the shortest possible stages. "'You'll no be muckle or twenty, he said. "'I'm only sixteen, she returned, laughing merrily. "'What will you be or you behold?' he exclaimed, after a brief pause of astonishment. "'Do you ever dance in this part of the country?' she asked, heedless of his surprise. "'No that, muckle, at least among the fisher folks, except it be at a wedding. I was at one last night. And did you dance? Deed did I, my lady. I danced the most of the lasses clean off of their legs. What made you so cruel? Well, you see, ma'am, I mean, my lady. Folks said I was ill about the bride, and so I bowed to dance it out of their heads. And how much truth was there in what they said? She asked, with a sly glance up in the handsome, now glowing face. Gin there was any, there was Uncle Little, he replied. The child's welcome tiller for me but she was the bonniest lassie we had. It was what we call a penny wedding, he went on, as if willing to change the side of the subject. And what's a penny wedding? It's a kind of a custom among the fishers. There's some gay poor folk among us, you see, and one or two of them marries. The lave us wants to give them a bit of a start like. 
"'So we all gang to the wedding and eats and drinks plenty, "'and pays for all we have, "'and they make a good profit out of it, "'for the things does not cost them near handsome uncle as we pay. "'So they have a good handful o'er for the plenishing.' "'And what do they give you to eat and drink?' asked the girl, making talk. "'Ow, oh, skate and mustard to eat, and whiskey to drink,' answered the lad, laughing. "'But it's mere for the fun. I dinna care muckle about whiskey and that kind of thing, myself. It's the fiddles and the dancing it I like.' "'You have music, then?' "'Aye, just the fiddles and the pipes.' "'The bagpipes, do you mean?' "'Aye, my grandfather plays them.' "'But you're not in the highlands here. How come you to have bagpipes?' "'It's a stray bag and no more.' "'But the folk here likes the cry of it well enough, "'and have it to wake the milk a morning. "'Yon was my grandfather you heard afore I fired the gun. "'Yon was his pipes waking them, honest folk. "'And what made you fire the gun in that reckless way? "'Don't you know it is very dangerous?' "'Dangerous, mem, my lady, I mean. "'There was nothing into it but a pennyworth of blasting powder. "'It would not blow the froth off of the top of a jaw. "'It nearly blew me out of my small wits, though. "'I'm very sorry it frighted you.' "'but gin I had seen ye, I bode to fire the gun. "'I don't understand you quite. "'But I suppose you mean it was your business to fire the gun. "'Just that, my lady. "'Why? "'Cause it's been decreed in the town council "'that at six of the clock ilka morning that gun's to be fired. "'At least so long as my lord the Marquis is at Port Lossie House. "'You see, it's a royal butter this, "'and it costs but about a penny, "'and it's grand like to have a small cannon to fire. "'And gin I was to neglect it, "'my grandfather would gang on Skerlin.' "'What's the English for Skirlin, my lady? "'Skirlin of the pipes?' "'I don't know, but from the sound of the word "'I should suppose it stands for screaming.' "'Aye, that's it. "'Only screaming's not so good as Skirlin. "'My grandfather's an old man, as I was going on to say, "'and has hardly breath enough to fill the bag. "'But he would be after Dirk and anybody at said sick a thing. "'Until he heard that gun, he would gang on blowing "'though he should burst himself. "'There's nobody kens the smetterman an old highland man.' By the time the conversation had reached this point, the lady had got her shoes on, had taken up her book from the sand, and was now sitting with it in her lap. No sound reached them but that of the tide, for the scream of the bagpipes had ceased the moment the swivel was fired. The sun was growing hot, and the sea, although so far in the cold north, was gorgeous in purple and green, suffused as with the overpowering pomp of a peacock's plumage in the sun. Away to the left, the solid promontory trembled against the horizon, as if ready to dissolve and vanish between the bright air and the lucid sea that fringed its base with white. The glow of a young summer morning pervaded earth and sea and sky, and swelled the heart of the youth as he stood in unconscious bewilderment before the self-possession of the girl. She was younger than he, and knew far less that was worth knowing, yet had a world of advantage over him, not merely from the effect of her presence on one who had never seen anything half so beautiful, but from a certain readiness of surface thought, "'combined with the sweet polish of her speech, "'and an assurance of superiority "'which appeared to them both to lift her "'like one of the old immortals, "'far above the level of the man "'whom she favoured with her passing converse. "'What in her words, as here presented only to the eye, "'may seem brusqueness or even forwardness, "'was so tempered, so toned, "'so fashioned by the naivety with which she spoke, "'that it sounded in his ears "'as the utterance of absolute condescension. "'As to her personal appearance,' The lad might well have taken her for twenty, for she looked more of a woman than, tall and strongly built as he was, he looked of a man. She was rather tall, rather slender, finely formed, with small hands and feet and full throat. Her hair was of a dark brown, her eyes of such a blue that no one could have suggested grey, her complexion fair, a little freckled, which gave it the warmest tint it had, her nose nearly straight, her mouth rather large but well formed and her forehead, as much of it as was to be seen under a garden hat, rose with promise above a pair of dark and finely penciled eyebrows. The description I have here given may be regarded as occupying the space of a brief silence, during which the lad stood motionless, like one awaiting further command. "'Why don't you go?' said the lady. "'I want to read my book.' He gave a great sigh, as if waking from a pleasant dream, took off his bonnet with a clumsy movement, which yet had in it a grace worthy of a Stuart court, and descending the dune walked away along the sands towards the sea-town. When he had gone about a couple of hundred yards, he looked back involuntarily. The lady had vanished. He concluded that she had crossed to the other side of the dune, but when he had gone so far on his way to the village as to clear the eastern end of the sand-hill, and there turned and looked up its southern slope, she was still nowhere to be seen. 
the old Highland stories of his grandfather came crowding to mind, and altogether human as she had appeared, he almost doubted whether the sea, from which he had thought he rescued her, were not her native element. The book, however, not to mention the shoes and stockings, was against the supposition. Anyhow, he had seen a vision of some order or other, as certainly as if an angel from heaven had appeared to him, for the waters of his mind had been troubled with a new sense of grace and beauty, giving an altogether fresh glory to existence. Of course no one would dream of falling in love with an unearthly creature, even an angel. At least something homely must mingle with the glory ere that become possible. And as to this girl, the youth could scarcely have regarded her with a greater sense of far-offness had he known her for the daughter of a king of the sea, one whose very element was essentially death to him as life to her. Still he walked home as if the heavy boots he wore were wings at his heels, like those of the little Eurus or Boreas that stood blowing his trumpet forever in the round open temple, which from the top of a grassy hill in the park overlooked the Seton. "'Sick ain,' he kept saying to himself, "'and sick small white hands, and sick a bonny foot. "'Eh, ho, she would glitter through the water in a bag net. "'Faith, gin she were to sing, come down to me, I would gang. "'Would that be to lose both soul and body, I wonder? "'I'll see what Maister Graham says to that.' It's a fine question to put to him. Gin a body was to gain with a mermaid, who they say has no soul to be saved, would that be the loss of his soul as well as of the bodily life of him? End of chapter 5《Chapter 6 of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen. Chapter 6 Duncan MacPhail. The sea town of Port Lossie was as irregular a gathering of small cottages as could be found on the surface of the globe. They faced every way, turned their backs and gables every way. Only of the roofs could you predict the position. Were divided from each other by every sort of small, irregular space and passage, and looked like a national assembly debating a constitution. Close beside the Seton, as it was called, ran a highway climbing far above the chimneys of the village to the level of the town above. Behind this road, and separated from it by a high wall of stone, lay a succession of heights and hollows covered with grass. In front of the cottages lay sand and sea. The place was cleaner than most fishing villages, but so closely built, so thickly inhabited, and so pervaded with a very ancient and fish-like smell, that but for the besom of the salt north wind it must have been unhealthy. Eastward the houses could extend no further for the harbour, and westward no further for a small river that crossed the sands to find the sea, discursively and merrily at low water, but with sullen submissive mingling when banked back by the tide. Avoiding the many nets extended long and wide on the grassy sands, the youth walked through the tide-swollen mouth of the river, and passed along the front of the village until he arrived at a house, the small window in the seaward gable of which was filled with a curious collection of things for sale, dusty-looking sweets in a glass bottle, gingerbread cakes in the shape of large hearts, thickly studded with sugar-plums of rainbow colors, invitingly poisonous, strings of tin covers for tobacco pipes, overlapping each other like fish scales, toys and tapes and needles, and twenty other kinds of things all huddled together. Turning the corner of this house, he went down the narrow passage between it and the next, and in at its open door. But the moment it was entered it lost all appearance of the shop, and the room with the tempting window showed itself only as a poor kitchen with an earthen floor. "'Well, how did the pipes behave themselves the day, Daddy?' said the youth as he strode in. "'Och, she'll be being a good boy to-day,' returned the tremulous voice of a grey-headed old man, who was leaning over a small peat-fire on the hearth, sifting oatmeal through the fingers of his left hand into a pot, while he stirred the boiling mess with a short stick held in his right. It had grown to be understood between them, that the pulmonary conditions of the old piper should be attributed not to his internal but to his external lungs, namely, the bag of his pipes. Both sets had of late years manifested strong symptoms of decay, and decided measures had had to be again and again resorted to in the case of the latter to put off its evil day, and keep within it the breath of its musical existence. The youth's question, then, as to the behavior of the pipes, was in reality an inquiry after the condition of his grandfather's lungs, which for their part grew yearly more and more asthmatic, notwithstanding which Duncan MacPhail would not hear of resigning the dignity of Town Piper. 
"'That's fine, Daddy,' returned the youth. "'Will I make out the porridge? "'I'm thinking you've had enough of hanging o'er the fire this hot morning.' "'No, sir,' answered Duncan. "'She'll be perfectly able to make the porridge herself, my boy Malcolm. "'The day will dawn when her boy must make his own porridge, "'and she'll be wanting no more porridge, "'but have to drink the rain-water, "'and no drop of the ishkabeha to put into it, my boy Malcolm.' His grandson was quite accustomed to the old man's heathenish mode of regarding his immediate existence after death as a long confinement in the grave, and generally had a word or two ready wherewith to combat the frightful notion. But as he spoke, Duncan lifted the pot from the fire, and set it on its three legs on the deal table in the middle of the room, adding, "'Dare, my man, dare's the perich. And was it to butter or to treacle or to pottle of beer she would be having for kitchy this fine morning?' This point settled, the two sat down to eat their breakfast, and no one would have discovered, from the manner in which the old man helped himself, nor yet from the look of his eyes, that he was stone blind. It came neither of old age nor disease. He had been born blind. His eyes, although large and wide, looked like those of a sleepwalker, open with shut sense. The shine in them was all reflected light. Glitter, no glow and their colour was so pale that they suggested some horrible sight as having driven from them hue and vision together. "'Have you eaten enough, my son?' he said, when he heard Malcolm lay down his spoon. "'Ay, plenty, thank you, Daddy, and they were right well made,' replied the lad, whose mode of speech was entirely different from his grandfather's. The latter had learned English as a foreign language, but could not speak Scotch, his mother tongue being Gaelic. As they rose from the table, a small girl— with hair wildly suggestive of insurrection and conflagration, entered, and said in a loud screech, "'Maister MacPhail, my mither wants a pot of blecken, and you're to be sure and give her it good,' she says. "'Very good, my child, Jeanie. But young Malcolm and old Duncan hasn't made their prayers yet, and you know very well that she won't sail before she's made her prayers. Tell your mother that she'll be bringing the blecken when she comes to look to the lamp.' The child ran off without response. Malcolm lifted the pot from the table and set it on the hearth, put the plates together and the spoons and set them on a chair, for there was no dresser, tilted the table and wiped it hearthward, then from a shelf took down and laid upon it a Bible, before which he seated himself with an air of reverence. The old man sat down on a low chair by the chimney corner, took off his bonnet, closed his eyes and murmured some almost inaudible words, then repeated in Gaelic the first line of the hundred and third psalm. O manum banach hus an yish, and raised a tune of marvellous wail. Arrived at the end of the line, he repeated the process with the next, and so went on, giving every line first in the voice of speech and then in the voice of song, through three stanzas of eight lines each. And no less strange was the singing than the tune, wild and wailful as the wind of his native desolations, or as the sound of his own pipes borne thereon, and apparently all but lawless, for the multitude of so-called grace notes, hovering and fluttering endlessly around the centre tone like the comments on a text, rendered it nearly impossible to unravel from them the air even of a known tune. It had in its kind the same liquid uncertainty of confluent sound which had hitherto rendered it impossible for Malcolm to learn more than a few of the common phrases of his grandfather's mother tongue. The psalm over, during which the sightless eyeballs of the singer had been turned up towards the rafters of the cottage, a sign surely that the germ of light, the sunny seed, as Henry Vaughan calls it, must be in him, else why should he lift his eyes when he thought upward? Malcolm read a chapter of the Bible, plainly the next in an ordered succession, for it could never have been chosen or culled, after which they kneeled together, and the old man poured out a prayer, beginning in a low, scarcely audible voice, which rose at length to a loud, modulated chant. Not a sentence— hardly a phrase of the utterance did his grandson lay hold of. But there were a few inhabitants of the place who could have interpreted it, and it was commonly believed that one part of his devotions was invariably a prolonged petition for vengeance on Campbell of Glenlyon, the main instrument in the massacre of Glencoe. He could have prayed in English, and then his grandson might have joined in his petitions, but the thought of such a thing would never have presented itself to him. Nay, although, understanding both languages— he used that which was unintelligible to the lad, he yet regarded himself as the party who had the right to resent the consequent schism. Such a conversation as now followed was no new thing after prayers. "'I could very well wish, Malcolm, my son, 
said the old man, "'dat you would be learning to speak your own language. "'It is all very well for to Sassenach, "'Saxon, that is, non-Celtic, "'potties to read the Bible in English, "'for it will be pleasing to make or not to make them "'capable of the Gaelic, no more than monkeys. "'But for all dat it is not the word of God. "'The Gaelic is the language of the Garden of Aden, "'and no doubt but it be the language "'in which the shepherd calls his sheep "'unto everlasting hills. "'You see, Malcolm, it must be so.' "'for how can a mortal man speak to his god in anything but Gaelic? "'When Mr. Cram, no, not Mr. Cram, the good man, it was the new minister, "'he speak and say to her, "'Mr. MacPhail, you ought to make your prayers in English. "'I was very wrathful, and I answered and said, "'Mr. Downey, do you dare to suppose that God doesn't prefer to Gaelic to the Sassenach tongue?' "'Mr. MacPhail, says he, "'it'll be for your boy, I mean it, "'Who's the lad to learn the way of salvation "'if you speak to your God in his presence in a strange tongue? "'So I was obedient to his word, "'and the next evening I did kneel down in the Sassenach, "'and I did make begin. "'But, oh, no, she wouldn't go. "'Her tongue would be cleaving to the roof of her mouth. "'The claymore would be sticking rusty into scabbard. "'For her heart she was ashamed to speak to the Highlandman's maker "'in the Sassenach tongue. "'You must be learning the Gaelic.' "'or you'll not be being worthy to be her name's son, Malcolm.' "'But, Daddy, who's to learn me?' asked his grandson gaily. "'Learn you, Malcolm. "'The Gaelic is the language of nature and wants no learning. "'I never did be learning it, yet I never have to say to myself, "'What is it she would be saying when I speak to Gaelic? "'But she always has to set the dead men, that is, the verds, on their feet "'and put them in battle array when she would be speaking to dull mechanic English.' When she opens her mouth to it, the Gaelic comes like a spring of pure water, Malcolm. To plenty of it must run out. Try it now, Malcolm. Just open your mouth in the Gaelic shape and see if the Gaelic will not be fallen from it. Seized with a merry fit, Malcolm did open his mouth in the Gaelic shape and sent from it a strange gabble, imitative of the most frequently recurring sounds of his grandfather's speech. Who will that do, Daddy? he asked, after jabbering gibberish for the space of a minute. "'It will not be bad for a beginning, Malcolm. "'She cannot say it just be words, "'or that there be much of the sense in it, "'but it be very like what the babes will say "'before they begin to speak it properly. "'So it's all very well, "'and if you will only be putting your mouth "'in the Gaelic shape often enough, "'the sounds will soon be taken to shape of it, "'and the words will be coming through the mists, "'and before you know, "'you'll be being a great credit to your grandfather, "'my boy Malcolm.' A silence followed, for Malcolm's attempt had not had the result he anticipated. He had only thought to make his grandfather laugh. Presently the old man resumed, in the kindest voice, "'And there's another thing, Malcolm, that's much wanting to you. You'll never be a man, not to speak of a bard like your grandfather, if you'll not be learning to play on the bagpipes.' Malcolm, who had been leaning against the chimney lug while his grandfather spoke, moved gently round behind his chair reached out for the pipes where they lay in a corner at the old man's side, and catching them up softly, put the mouthpiece to his lips. With a few vigorous blasts he filled the bag, and out burst the double droning bass, while the youth's fingers, clutching the chanter as by the throat, at once compelled its screeches into shape far better at least than his lips had been able to give to the crude material of Gaelic. He played the only reel he knew, but that with vigor and effect. At the first sound of its notes, the old man sprung to his feet and began capering to the reel, partly in delight with the music, but far more in delight with the musician, while ever and anon, with feeble yell, he uttered the unspellable hoo of the Highlander, and jumped, as he thought, high in the air, though his failing limbs, alas, lifted his feet scarce an inch from the floor. Ay, ay, he sighed at length, yielding the contest between his legs and the lungs of the lad. Ay, Ay, she'll die happy. She'll die happy. Here till her boy, how he makes the pipe sing the true Gaelic, the best of Gaelic dat. Old Tonkin's pipes'll not know how to be talking Sassenach. See to it. See to it. He had but to blow in at the one end, and out came the reel at the other. Hoo! Hoo! Playeth the reel hulachan, Malcolm, my chief. I cannot reel Strathspey nor lilt, but just that bird alone, daddy. "'Give tem to me, my boy,' cried the old piper, 
reaching out a hand as eager to clutch the uncouth instrument as the miser's to finger his goal. "'Hear well to me as I play, and you'll soon be able to play Pibrach or Coronach with the best piper between Cape Rath and Mola Cantair. He played tune after tune until his breath failed him, and an exhausted grunt of the drone, in the middle of a Coronach, followed by an abrupt pause, revealed the emptiness of both lungs and bag. Then first he remembered his object, forgotten the moment he had filled his bag. "'Now, Malcolm,' he said, offering the pipes to his grandson, "'you play dat after.' He had himself, of course, learned all by the ear, but could hardly have been serious in requesting Malcolm to follow him through such a succession of tortuous mazes. "'I hadn't a memory up to that, Daddy, but I should get a hold of Mr. Graham's flute music, and maybe that'll help me a bit. Wouldn't you be taking her Meg Parton's blacking at you promised her?' "'Surely, my son, she should always be keeping her promises.' He rose, and getting a small stone bottle and his stick from the corner between the projecting ingle-cheek and the window, left the house, to walk with unerring steps through the labyrinth of the village, threading his way from passage to passage, and avoiding pools and projecting stones, not to say houses and human beings. His eyes, or indeed perhaps rather his whole face, appeared to possess an ethereal sense as of touch, for without the slightest contact in the ordinary sense of the word, he was aware of the neighborhood of material objects, as if through the pulsations of some medium to others imperceptible. He could with perfect accuracy tell the height of any wall or fence within a few feet of him, could perceive at once whether it was high or low or half-tied, and that merely by going out in front of the houses and turning his face with its sightless eyeballs towards the sea, knew whether a woman who spoke to him had a child in her arms or not, and indeed was believed to know sooner than ordinary mortals that one was about to become a mother. He was a strange figure to look upon in that lowland village, for he invariably wore the highland dress. In truth, he had never had a pair of trousers on his legs, and was far from pleased that his grandson clothed himself in such contemptible garments. But contrasted with the showy style of his costume, there was something most pathetic in the blended pallor of hue into which the originally gorgeous colors of his kilt had faded noticeable chiefly on weekdays when he wore no sporin, For the kilt, encountering from its loose construction comparatively little strain or friction, may reach an antiquity unknown to the garments of the low country, and while perfectly decent, yet look ancient exceedingly. On Sundays, however, he made the best of himself, and came out like a belated and aged butterfly, with his father's sporin, or tasseled goatskin purse, in front of him, his grandfather's dirk at his side, his great-grandfather's skein do, or little black-hafted knife, stuck in the stocking of his right leg, and a huge round brooch of brass, nearly half a foot in diameter, and Mr. Graham said, as old as the Battle of Harlaw, on his left shoulder. In these adornments he would walk proudly to church, leaning on the arm of his grandson. "'The piper's gay broken like the day,' said one of the fishermen's wives to a neighbor as he passed them the fact being that he had not yet recovered from his second revel in the pipes so soon after the exhaustion of his morning's duty, and was in consequence more asthmatic than usual. "'I doubt he'll be slipping away some cold night,' said the other. "'His living breath's ill to get. Ay, he has to wrestle for it, poor man. Well, he'll be missed, the blind body. It's extraordinary how he's managed to live, and bring up such a fine lad as that Malcolm of his. Well, you see, Providence has been kind to him, as well as other blind creatures. The tone's piping is not to be despised, and there's the crying and the chop and the lamps. Deed, he's been an ident creature, and for a blind man, as you say, it's just extraordinary. Did you mind when first he came to the town, lass? Aye, what would Henry me mind in that? It's not so long. Malcolm, it's like a fine lad, no. They tell me wasn't a muckle bigger nor a gay haddie. Tolerable haddock. But the old man was an old man then, though no doubt he's uncle failed since sign. A daughter's bairn, they say, the lad. Ay, they say, but who kens? Duncan could never be gotten to open his mouth as to the father and mother of him, and so it well may be, as they say. It's nigh twenty year now, I'm thinking, since he made his appearance. Ye wasn't a come fra Skarnos ere then. Some folk says the old man's name's no but fail, and he mun a come here and hiding for some rough job or other that he's been mixed up with. I to believe not ill as such a poor, harmless body. Folk it makes their own living, wantin' the ain to guide them, canna be that far off the straight. God guide us. We have enough to answer for our own selves, on past judgment upon one another. I was but telling you what folk telled me, returned the younger woman. 
Aye, aye, lass, I ken that, for I ken there was folk to tell ye. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen. Chapter Seven, Alexander Graham. As soon as his grandfather left the house, Malcolm went out also, closing the door behind him and turning the key, but leaving it in the lock. He ascended to the upper town, only, however, to pass through its main street at the top of which he turned and looked back for a few moments, apparently in contemplation. The descent to the shore was so sudden that he could see nothing of the harbour or of the village he had left. Nothing but the blue bay and the filmy mountains of Sutherlandshire, molten by distance into cloudy questions, and looking betwixt blue sea and blue sky, less substantial than either. After gazing for a moment, he turned again and held on his way, through fields which no fence parted from the road. The morning was still glorious, the larks right jubilant, and the air filled with the sweet scents of cottage flowers. Across the fields came the occasional low of an ox, and the distant sounds of children at play. But Malcolm saw without noting, and heard without heeding, for his mind was full of speculation concerning the lovely girl, whose vision appeared already far off. Who might she be? Whence had she come? Whither could she have vanished? That she did not belong to the neighborhood was certain, he thought, but there was a farmhouse near the sea town where they let lodgings, and although it was early in the season, she might belong to some family which had come to spend a few of the summer weeks there. Possibly his appearance had prevented her from having her bath that morning. If he should have the good fortune to see her again, he would show her a place far fitter for the purpose, a perfect arbor of rocks, utterly secluded, with a floor of deep sand, and without a hole for crab or lobster. His road led him in the direction of a few cottages lying in a hollow. Beside them rose a vision of trees, bordered by an ivy-grown wall, from amidst whose summit shot the spire of the church, and from beyond the spire, through the trees, came golden glimmers as of vein and crescent and pinnacled ball that hinted at some shadowy abode of enchantment within. But as he descended the slope towards the cottages, the trees gradually rose and shut in everything. These cottages were far more ancient than the houses of the town, were covered with green thatch, were buried in ivy, and would soon be radiant with roses and honeysuckles. They were gathered irregularly about a gate of curious old ironwork, opening on the churchyard, but more like an entrance to the grounds behind the church, for it told of ancient state, bearing on each of its pillars a great stone heron with a fish in its beak. This was the quarter whence had come the noises of children, but they had now ceased, or rather sunk into a gentle murmur, which oozed, like the sound of bees from a straw-covered beehive, out of a cottage rather larger than the rest, which stood close by the churchyard gate. It was the parish school, and these cottages were all that remained of the old town of Port Lossie, which had at one time stretched in a long, irregular street almost to the shore. The town cross yet stood, but away solitary on a green hill that overlooked the sands. During the summer, the long walk from the new town to the school and to the church was anything but a hardship. In winter it was otherwise, for then there were days in which few would venture the single mile that separated them. The door of the school, bisected longitudinally, had one of its halves open, and by it outflowed the gentle hum of the honeybees of learning. Malcolm walked in and had the whole of the busy scene at once before him. The place was like a barn, open from wall to wall, and from floor to rafters and thatch, browned with the peat smoke of vanished winters. Two-thirds of the space were filled with long desks and forms. The other had only the master's desk, and thus afforded room for standing classes. At the present moment it was vacant, for the prayer was but just over, and the Bible class had not been called up. There Alexander Graham, the schoolmaster, descending from his desk, met and welcomed Malcolm with a kind shake of the hand. He was a man of middle height, but very thin, and about five and forty years of age, but looked older because of his thin gray hair and a stoop in the shoulders. He was dressed in a shabby black tailcoat and clean white neckcloth. The rest of his clothes were of parson gray, noticeably shabby also. The quiet sweetness of his smile and a composed look of submission were suggestive of the purification of sorrow, but were attributed by the townsfolk to disappointment, 
for he was still but a schoolmaster, whose aim they thought must be a pulpit and a parish. But Mr. Graham had been early released from such an ambition, if it had ever possessed him, and had for many years been more than content to give himself to the hopefuler work of training children for the true ends of life. He lived the quietest of studious lives with an old housekeeper. Malcolm had been a favorite pupil, and the relation of master and scholar did not cease when the latter saw that he ought to do something to lighten the burden of his grandfather, and so left the school and betook himself to the life of a fisherman. With the slow leave of Duncan, who had set his heart on making a scholar of him, and would never, indeed, had Gaelic been amongst his studies, have been won by the most laborsome petition. He asserted himself perfectly able to provide for both for ten years to come at least, in proof of which he roused the inhabitants of Port Lossie, during the space of a whole month, a full hour earlier than usual, with the most terrific blasts of the bagpipes, and this notwithstanding complaint and expostulation on all sides, so that at length the provost had to interfere, after which outburst of defiance to time, however, his energy had begun to decay so visibly that Malcolm gave himself to the pipes in secret, that he might be ready, in case of sudden emergency, to take his grandfather's place. For Duncan lived in constant dread of the hour when his office might be taken from him and conferred on a mere drummer, or still worse, on a certain ne'er-do-well cousin of the provost, so devoid of music as to be capable only of ringing a bell. "'I've had an invitation to Miss Campbell's funeral, Miss Horne's cousin, you know.' said Mr. Graham, in a hesitating and subdued voice. "'Could you manage to take the school for me, Malcolm?' "'Yes, sir. There's nothing to hinder me. What day is it upon?' "'Saturday.' "'Very well, sir. I shall be here in good time.' This matter settled, the business of the school, in which, as he did often, Malcolm had come to assist, began. Only a pupil of his own could have worked with Mr. Graham, for his mode was very peculiar— but the strangest fact in it would have been the last to reveal itself to an ordinary observer. This was that he rarely contradicted anything. He would call up the opposing truth, set it face to face with the error, and leave the two to fight it out. The human mind and conscience were, he said, the plains of Armageddon, where the battle of good and evil was forever raging, and the one business of a teacher was to rouse and urge this battle by leading fresh forces of the truth into the field forces composed as little as might be of the hireling troops of the intellect, and as much as possible of the native energies of the heart, imagination, and conscience. In a word, he would oppose error only by teaching the truth. In early life he had come under the influence of the writings of William Law, which he read as one who pondered every doctrine in that light which only obedience to the truth can open upon it. With a keen eye for the discovery of universal law in the individual fact, he read even the marvels of the New Testament practically. Hence, in training his soldiers, every lesson he gave them was a missile. Every admonishment of youth or maiden was as the mounting of an armed champion, and the launching of him with a god's speed into the thick of the fight. He now called up the Bible class, and Malcolm sat beside and listened. That morning they had to read one of the chapters in the history of Jacob. "'Was Jacob a good man?' he asked, as soon as the reading, each of the scholars in turn taking a verse, was over. An apparently universal expression of assent followed. Halting its wake, however, came the voice of a boy near the bottom of the class. "'Wasna he some double, sir?' "'You are right, Shelty,' said the master. "'He was double. "'I must, I find, put the question in another shape. "'Was Jacob a bad man?' Again came such a burst of yeses that it might have been taken for a general hiss." but limping in the rear came again the half-dissentient voice of Jamie Joss, whom the master had just addressed as Shelty. "'Partly, sir.' "'You think, then, Shelty, that a man may be both bad and good?' "'I dinna ken, sir. I think he may be Wiles one, and Wiles the other, and Wiles maybe it would be ill to say Wilk. Or Collie's Wiles in two minds whether he'll do what he's telled or no.' "'That's the Battle of Armageddon, Shelty, my man.' "'It's I ragin', on gun roared or bayonet clashed. "'Ye mun up and do your best in it, my man. "'Gin ye die fightin' like a man, "'ye'll flee up wi' a quiet face and a wide open ain, "'and there's a great one it'll say to ye, "'Well done, laddie. "'But gin ye gee in to the enemy, "'he'll turn ye into a creepin' thing at eats dirt, "'and there'll no be a hole in all the crystal wall "'of the New Jerusalem near enough to the ground "'to let ye creep through.' "'As soon as ever Alexander Graham, "'the polished thinker and sweet-mannered gentleman, opened his mouth concerning the things he loved best. That moment the most poetic forms came pouring out in the most rugged speech. 
I reckon, sir, said Shelty, Jacob had not fought in all his battle. That's just it, my boy, and because he wouldn't get up and fight manfully, God had to take him in hand. You've heard tale of generals, when their troops were running away, having to cut this man down, shoot that one, and lick another, till he turned them all right face about, and drave them on to the foe like a spate. And the trouble God took with Jacob wasn't lost upon him at last. And what came at Esau, sir? asked a pale-faced maiden with blue eyes. He was not an ill kind of a child, was he, sir? No, Mappy, answered the master. He was a fine child, as you say, but he not mere time and gentler treatment to make anything of him. You see, he had a good heart, but was a duller kind of a creature altogether, and cared for nothing he couldn't see or handle. He never thought muckle about God at all. Jacob was another sort, a poet kind of a man, but a snake-drawn creature for all that. It was easier, however, to get the slyness out of Jacob than the dullness out of Esau. Punishment telt upon Jacob like upon a thin-skinned horse, whereas Esau was mere like the minister's pony, that can hardly be made to understand that you want him to gang on. But on the other hand, dullness is a thing that can be born with. There's nae hurry about that, but the deceitful tricks of Jacob were not to be endured, and so the toss came down upon him. "'And what for did not God make Esau as clever as Jacob?' asked a wizened-faced boy near the top of the class. "'Ah, my peery,' said Mr. Graham, "'I cannot tell you that. All that I can tell is that God had not done making at him, and some kind of folk take longer to make out than others, and you cannot tell what they're to be till they're made out. But whether what I tell you be right or no, God mun have the very best reasons for it, or good, maybe, for us to understand. The best reasons for Esau himself, I mean, for the Creator looks after his creature first of all. "'And now,' concluded Mr. Graham, resuming his English, "'go to your lessons, and be diligent, that God may think it worth while to get on faster with the making of you.' In a moment the class was dispersed and all were seated. In another the sound of scuffling arose, and fists were seen storming across a desk. "'Andrew Jameson and Pucci, come up here,' said the master in a loud voice. "'He hit at me first, cried Andrew, the moment they were within a respectful distance of the master." whereupon Mr. Graham turned to the other with inquiry in his eyes. "'He had no business to call me Pucci. "'No more he had, but you had just as little right to punish him for it. "'The offence was against me. "'He had no right to use my name for you, and the quarrel was mine. "'For the present you are Pucci no more. "'Go to your place, William Wilson.' "'The boy burst out sobbing, and crept back to his seat with his knuckles in his eyes. "'Andrew Jameson,' the master went on, "'I had almost got a name for you.' but you have sent it away. You are not ready for it yet, I see. Go to your place. With downcast looks, Andrew followed William, and the watchful eyes of the masters saw that, instead of quarreling any more during the day, they seemed to catch at every opportunity of showing each other a kindness. Mr. Graham never used bodily punishment. He ruled chiefly by the aid of a system of individual titles, of the mingled characters of pet name and nickname. As soon as the individuality of a boy had attained to signs of blossoming, that is, had become such that he could predict not only an upright but a characteristic behavior in given circumstances, he would take him aside and whisper in his ear that henceforth, so long as he deserved it, he would call him by a certain name, one generally derived from some object in the animal or vegetable world, and pointing to a resemblance which was not often patent to any eye but the master's own. He had given the name of Pucci, for instance, to William Wilson, because, like the kangaroo, he sought his object in a succession of awkward, yet not the less availing, leaps, gulping his knowledge and pocketing his conquered marble after a like fashion. Mappy, the name which thus belonged to a certain flaxen-haired, soft-eyed girl, corresponds to the English bunny. Shelty is the small Scotch mountain pony, active and strong. Peary means pegtop. But not above a quarter of the children had pet names. To gain one was to reach the highest honor of the school. The withdrawal of it was the severest of punishments, and the restoring of it the sign of perfect reconciliation. The master permitted no one else to use it, and was seldom known to forget himself so far as to utter it while its owner was in disgrace. The hope of gaining such a name, or the fear of losing it, was in the pupil the strongest ally of the master, the most powerful enforcement of his influences. It was a scheme of government by aspiration but it owed all its operative power to the character of the man who had adopted rather than invented it, for the scheme had been suggested by a certain passage in the book of the Revelation. Without having read a word of Swedenborg, he was a believer in the absolute correspondence of the inward and outward. 
and thus, long before the younger Darwin arose, had suspected a close relationship, remote identity indeed, in nature and history, between the animal and human worlds. But photographs from a good many different points would be necessary to afford anything like a complete notion of the character of this country schoolmaster. Towards noon, while he was busy with an astronomical class, explaining, by means partly of the blackboard, partly of two boys representing the relation of the earth and the moon, how it comes that we see but one half of the latter. The door gently opened, and the troubled face of the mad laird peeped slowly in. His body followed as gently, and at last, sad symbol of his weight of care, his hump appeared, with a slow half-revolution as he turned to shut the door behind him. Taking off his hat, he walked up to Mr. Graham, who, busy with his astronomy, had not perceived his entrance, touched him on the arm, and standing on tiptoe, whispered softly in his ear, as if it were a painful secret that must be respected. "'I dinna ken what I come frae. I want to come to the school.' Mr. Graham turned and shook hands with him, respectfully addressing him as Mr. Stewart, and got down for him the armchair which stood behind his desk. But with the politest bow, the laird declined it, and mournfully repeating the words, "'I dinna ken what I come frae,' took a place readily yielded him in the astronomical circle surrounding the symbolic boys. This was not by any means his first appearance there, for every now and then he was seized with a desire to go to school, plainly with the object of finding out where he came from. This always fell in his quieter times, and for days together he would attend regularly. In one instance, he was not absent an hour for a whole month. He spoke so little, however, that it was impossible to tell how much he understood, although he seemed to enjoy all that went on. He was so quiet, so sadly gentle, that he gave no trouble of any sort, and after the first few minutes of a fresh appearance, the attention of the scholars was rarely distracted by his presence. The way in which the master treated him awoke like respect in his pupils. Boys and girls were equally ready to make room for him on their forms, and any one of the latter who had by some kind attention awakened the watery glint of a smile on the melancholy features of the troubled man would boast of her success. Hence it came that the neighborhood of Port Lossie was the one spot in the county where a person of weak intellect or peculiar appearance might go about free of insult. The peculiar sentence the laird so often uttered was the only one he invariably spoke with definite clearness. In every other attempt at speech, he was liable to be assailed by an often recurring impediment, during the continuance of which he could compass but a word here and there, often betaking himself in the agony of suppressed utterance to the most extravagant gestures with which he would sometimes succeed in so supplementing his words as to render his meaning intelligible. The two boys representing the earth and the moon had returned to their places in the class, and Mr. Graham had gone on to give a description of the moon, in which he had necessarily mentioned the enormous height of her mountains as compared with those of the earth. But in the course of asking some questions, he found a need of further explanation, and therefore once more required the services of the boy earth and boy moon. The moment the latter, however, began to describe his circle around the former, Mr. Stewart stepped gravely up to him, and laying hold of his hand, led him back to his station in the class. Then, turning first one shoulder, then the other to the company, so as to attract attention to his hump, uttered the single word, Mountain, and took on himself the part of the moon, proceeding to revolve in the circle which represented her orbit. Several of the boys and girls smiled, but no one laughed for Mr. Graham's gravity maintained theirs. Without remark, he used the mad laird for a moon to the end of his explanation. Mr. Stewart remained in the school all the morning, stood up with every class Mr. Graham taught, and in the intervals sat, with book or slate before him, still as a Brahmin on the fancied verge of his reabsorption, save that he murmured to himself now and then, I dinna ken what I came frae. When his pupils dispersed for dinner, Mr. Graham invited him to go to his house and share his homely meal, but with polished gesture and broken speech, Mr. Stewart declined, walking away towards the town, and was seen no more that afternoon. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Malcolm by George MacDonald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen Chapter 8. The Swivel Mrs. Courthope, the housekeeper at Lossie House, was a good woman, who did not stand upon her dignities, as small rulers are apt to do, 
but cultivated friendly relations with the people of the sea town. Some of the rougher of the women despised the sweet outlandish speech she had brought with her from her native England, and accused her of mim-moudness, or an affected modesty in the use of words. But not the less was she in their eyes a great lady, whence indeed came the special pleasure in finding flaws in her. For to them she was the representative of the noble family on whose skirts they and their ancestors had been settled for ages, the last Marquis not having visited the place for many years, and the present having but lately succeeded. Duncan MacPhail was a favourite with her, for the Englishwoman will generally prefer the Highland to the lowland Scotsman, and she seldom visited the Seton without looking in upon him, so that when Malcolm returned from the Alton, or Old Town, where the school was, it did not in the least surprise him to find her seated with his grandfather. Apparently, however, there had been some dissension between them, for the old man sat in his corner strangely wrathful, his face in a glow, his head thrown back, his nostrils distended, and his eyelids working, as if his eyes were poor dumb mouths, like Caesar's wounds, trying to speak. "'We are told in the New Testament to forgive our enemies, you know,' said Mrs. Courthope, heedless of his entrance, but in a voice that seemed rather to plead than oppose. "'Indeed, she will not be false to her chief and her clan,' retorted Duncan persistently. "'She will not forgive Carmel of Glenlyon.' "'But he's dead long since, and we may at least hope he repented and was forgiven.' "'She'll be hoping nothing of the kind, Mistress Curtope, replied Duncan. "'But if, as you say, God will be forgiving him, which I do not believe, let that be enough for the greedy blackguard. Sure it matters but small whether poor Duncan MacPhail will be forgiving him or not. Anyhow, he must do without it, for he shall not have it. He is a damn villain and scoundrel, and so she says with her respects to you, Mistress Curtope. His sightless eyes flashed with indignation, and perceiving it was time to change the subject, the housekeeper turned to Malcolm. "'Could you bring me a nice mackerel or whiting for my lord's breakfast tomorrow morning, Malcolm?' she said. "'Certainly, mem. I shall be with ye in good time with the best the seal give me,' he answered. "'If I have the fish by nine o'clock, that will be early enough,' she returned. "'I would not like to wait so long for my breakfast,' remarked Malcolm. "'You wouldn't mind it much if you waited asleep,' said Mrs. Courthope. "'Can anybody sleep till sick a time of day as that?' exclaimed the youth. "'You must remember my lord doesn't go to bed for hours after you, Malcolm.' "'And what can keep him up all that time? "'It's not as gin he were after the hair and, and had the wind in the water "'and the netfuls of wommeling creatures to hold him waking. "'Oh, he reads and writes, "'and sometimes goes walking about the grounds after everybody else is in bed,' "'said Mrs. Courthope. "'He and his dog.' "'Well, I would rather be up air,' said Malcolm. "'A heap rather. "'I like fine to be out in the quiet of the morning, "'afore the sun's up to set the din gone.' "'when it's all clear but no bright, like the back of a bunny salmon, "'and air and water and all looks as gin they were waiting for something. "'Quiet, very quiet, but not content.' "'Malcolm uttered this long speech, and went on with more like it, "'in the hope of affording time for the stormy waters of Duncan's spirit to assuage. "'Nor was he disappointed, for if there was a sound on the earth Duncan loved to hear, "'it was the voice of his boy, and by degrees the tempest sank to repose.' The gathered glooms melted from his countenance, and the sunlight of a smile broke out. "'Here to him,' he cried. "'Her boy will be a great bard some day, and sing before the Stuart kings when they come back to Holyrood.' Mrs. Courthope had enough of poetry in her to be pleased with Malcolm's quiet enthusiasm, and spoke a kind word of sympathy with the old man's delight as she rose to take her leave. Duncan rose also, and followed her to the door, making her a courtly bow, and that just as she turned away. "'It'll be a good woman, Mistress Curtope,' he said as he came back, "'and it'll no be to blame her for forgiving Glenlyon, "'for he did not kill her great-grandmother. "'But it'll be very bad breeding to request her name self, "'Duncan MacPhail, to be forgiven to rascal. "'Only she'll be but a woman, "'and it'll not be no no better to her. "'You'll be mind and you'll be firing to gun at six o'clock exactly, Malcolm, "'for all she says. "'For my lord being but just come home to his property,' It might be a fix to him if there was any mistake so soon. But, indeed, I wonder he hasn't been sending for old Duncan to be giving him a song or two and a pipes, for he'll be having to oceans of very good Highland blood in his own veins. And his friend, the Prince of Wales, who has no more rights to it than a mackerel fish, will be wearing the kilts at Holyrood. So mind, you be firing the gun at six, my son. For some years, young as he was, Malcolm had hired himself to one or other of the boat proprietors of the Seton or of Scournose for the herring fishing, 
only, however, in the immediate neighborhood, refusing to go to the western islands, or any station whence he could not return to sleep at his grandfather's cottage. He had thus, on every occasion, earned enough to provide for the following winter, so that his grandfather's little income as piper, and other small returns, were accumulating in various concealments about the cottage. For, in his care for the future, Duncan dreaded lest Malcolm should buy things for him, without which, in his own sightless judgment, he could do well enough. Until the herring season should arrive, however, Malcolm made a little money by line-fishing, for he had bargained the year before with the captain of a schooner for an old ship's boat, and had patched and caulked it into a sufficiently serviceable condition. He sold his fish in the town and immediate neighborhood, where a good many housekeepers favored the handsome and cheery young fisherman. He would now be often out in the bay long before it was time to call his grandfather in his turn to rouse the sleepers of Port Lossie. But the old man had as yet always waked about the right time, and the inhabitants had never had any ground of complaint, a few minutes one way or the other being of little consequence. He was the cock which woke the whole yard. Morning after morning, his pipes went crowing through the streets of the upper region, his music ending always with his round. But after the institution of the gun signal, his custom was to go on playing where he stood until he heard it, or to stop short in the midst of his round and his liveliest reveille the moment it reached his ear. Loath as he might be to give over, that sense of good manners which was supreme in every Highlander of the old time interdicted the fingering of a note after the Marquis's gun had called aloud. When Malcolm meant to go fishing, he always loaded the swivel the night before, and about sunset the same evening he set out for that purpose. Not a creature was visible on the border of the curving bay, except a few boys far off on the gleaming sands whence the tide had just receded. They were digging for sand eels, lovely little silvery fishes, which, as every now and then the spade turned one or two up, they threw into a tin pail for bait. But on the summit of the long sand hill, the lonely figure of a man was walking to and fro in the level light of the rosy west, and as Malcolm climbed the near end of the dune, it was turning far off at the other. Halfway between them was the embrasure with the brass swivel, and there they met. Although he had never seen him before, Malcolm perceived at once it must be Lord Lossie, and lifted his bonnet. The Marquis nodded and passed on, but the next moment, hearing the noise of Malcolm's proceedings with the swivel, turned and said, "'What are you about there with that gun, my lad?' "'I'm just going to date her out and load her, my lord,' answered Malcolm. "'And what next? You're not going to fire the thing?' "'Ay, the morn's morning, my lord.' "'What will that be for?' "'Oh, just to wake your lordship.' "'Hm,' said his lordship, with more expression than articulation. "'Will I no load her?' asked Malcolm, throwing down the ramrod, and approaching the swivel as if to turn the muzzle of it again into the embrasure. "'Oh, yes, load her by all means. I don't want to interfere with any of your customs.' "'But if that is your object, the means, I fear, are inadequate.' "'It's a comfort to hear that, my lord, for I cannot I be sure of my old watch, "'and may well be out of five minutes or two whiles. "'So, in future, seem it's a such small consequence to your lordship, "'I suggest just let her off when it's convenient. "'A few minutes win a matter muckle to the bailey bodies.' "'There was something in Malcolm's address that pleased Lord Lossie, "'the mingling of respect and humour, probably, "'the frankness and composure, perhaps.' He was not self-conscious enough to be shy, and was so free from design of any sort that he doubted the good will of no one. "'What's your name?' asked the Marquis abruptly. "'Malcolm MacPhail, my lord.' "'MacPhail. I heard the name this very day. Let me see. My grandfather's a blind piper, my lord.' "'Yes, yes. Tell him I shall want him at the house. I left my own piper at Kianglas. "'I'll fess him with me in the morn, gin ye like, my lord, for I'll be o'er with some fine trout or other, "'Gin I hae not the war luck the morn's morning. "'Mistress Courthope says she'll be aye ready for one "'to fry to your lordship's breakfast. "'But I'm thinking that'll be o'er air for you to see him. "'I'll send for him when I want him. "'Go on with your brazen serpent there. "'Only mind you don't give her too much supper. "'Just look at her ribs, my lord. "'She went at rive,' was the youth's response, "'and the Marquis was moving off with a smile "'when Malcolm called after him. "'Gin your lordship likes to see your end fairlies, "'I ken where some of them lie,' he said. "'What do you mean by furlies?' asked the Marquis. "'Oh, curiosities ye ken. "'For instance, there's some queer caves along the coast, two or three of them afore ye come to the Skarnos. "'They say the water booed to lahouk at them once upon a time, "'and they mon have been full of partons and lobsters "'and their friends and neighbours. "'But they're high and dry, no, as the fool said to his minister, "'and nothing into them but fomarts and otters and sick-like. "'Well, well, my lad, we'll see.' 
said his lordship kindly, and turning once more he resumed his walk. "'At your lordship's wool,' answered Malcolm in a low voice as he lifted his bonnet and again bent to the swivel. The next morning he was rowing slowly along in the bay when he was startled by the sound of his grandfather's pipes, wafted clear and shrill on a breath of southern wind from the top of the town. He looked at his watch. It was not yet five o'clock. The expectation of a summons to play at Lossie House had so excited the old man's brain that he had waked long before his usual time, and Port Lossie must wake also. The worst of it was that he had already, as Malcolm knew from the direction of the sound, almost reached the end of his beat, and must even now be expecting the report of the swivel, until he heard which he would not cease playing so long as there was a breath in his body. Pulling, therefore, with all his might, Malcolm soon ran his boat ashore, and in another instant the sharp yell of the swivel rang among the rocks of the promontory. He was still standing, lapped in a light reverie as he watched the smoke flying seaward, when a voice, already well known to him, said, close at his side, "'What are you about with that horrid cannon?' Malcolm started. "'You guard me look, my lady,' he returned with a smile and an obeisance. "'You told me,' the girl went on emphatically, and as she spoke she disengaged her watch from her girdle that you fired it at six o'clock. It is not nearly six. Didn't ye hear the pipes, my lady? he rejoined. Yes, well enough, but a whole regiment of pipes can't make it six o'clock when my watch says ten minutes past five. Eh, sick a bra watch, exclaimed Malcolm. What's all the bonny white knots about the face of it? Pearls, she answered, in a tone that implied pity of his ignorance. Just look at it aside mine he exclaimed in admiration, pulling out his great old turnip. "'There!' cried the girl. "'Your own watch says only a quarter past five. "'Oh, aye, my lady. "'I set it by the town clock it hangs in the window of the lossy arms last night. "'But I'm on away and look after my lines, "'or between the dale and the dogfish my lord'll fare ill.' "'You haven't told me why you fired the gun,' she persisted. "'Thus compelled, Malcolm had to explain "'that the motive lay in his anxiety "'lest his grandfather should overexert himself.' seeing he was subject to severe attacks of asthma. "'He could stop when he was tired,' she objected. "'Aye, Guinness pride would let him,' answered Malcolm, and turned away again, eager to draw his line. "'Have you a boat of your own?' asked the lady. "'Aye, yon's her, down on the shore yonner. "'Would you like a row? She's fine and quiet. "'Who, the boat?' "'The sea, my lady. "'Is your boat clean? "'Of all thing but fish. "'But, nah, it's not fit for sick a bonny gone as that.' I wouldn't let you gang the day, my lady, but gin you like to be here the morn's morning, I shall be here at the same hour, and have my boat as clean as a Sunday sark. You think more of my gown than of myself, she returned. There's no fear of yourself, my lady. You're o'er well made to blood. But woe's me for the gown, or it had been an hour in the boat the day. Not to mention the fish come and wallopin' o'er the gunnel, one after the other. But deed, I mun say good morning, mim. By all means, I don't want to keep you a moment from your precious fish. Feeling rebuked, without well knowing why, Malcolm accepted the dismissal and ran to his boat. By the time he had taken his oars, the girl had vanished. His line was a short one, but twice the number of fish he wanted were already hanging from the hooks. It was still very early when he reached the harbour. At home he found his grandfather waiting for him, and his breakfast ready. It was hard to convince Duncan that he had waked the royal borough an hour too soon, he insisted that, as he had never made such a blunder before, he could not have made it now. "'It's the watch it'll be telling to lies, Malcolm, my boy,' he said thoughtfully. "'She was once before.' "'But the sun says the same as the watch, Daddy,' persisted Malcolm. Duncan understood the position of the sun and what it signified as well as the clearest-eyed man in Port Lossie, but he could not afford to yield. "'It was being some conspiracy at a curse at Camels to make her lose her poor pension,' he said." "'But never you mind, Malcolm. "'I'll be making up for to plunder to-morrow morning. "'To good people shall have their sleeps a whole hour "'after they ought to be at their works.'" End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Malcolm by George MacDonald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devora Allen Chapter 9 The Salmon Trout Malcolm walked up through the town with his fish, hoping to part with some of the less desirable of them, and so lighten his basket before entering the grounds of Lossie House. But he had met with little success, 
and was now approaching the town gate, as they called it, which closed a short street at right angles to the principal one, when he came upon Mrs. Cottonaw, on her knees, cleaning her doorstep. "'Well, Malcolm, what fish have ye?' she said, without looking up. "'Who kent ye it was me, Mistress Cottonaw? asked the lad. "'Kent it was you,' she repeated. "'Gin there be but two feet at once in any street of Port Lossie, "'I'll tell ye whose head's abon them, and my een sticked. "'Eyes closed. "'Hoot, ye're a witch, Mistress Cattenah,' said Malcolm merrily. "'That's as may be,' she returned, rising, and nodding mysteriously. "'I ha' told ye na mair nor the truth. "'But what guard ye whoop us all out of our naked beds "'by five o'clock in the morning this morning, man? "'That's not what ye're paid for. "'Deed, mim, it was just a mistake of my poor daddy's. He had been feared to sleep in or long, you see, and so it waked o'er soon. I was out after the fish myself. But ye fired the gun gin the chap a five. Oh, ay, I fired the gun. The poor man would have burst in himself gin I had not. Deal gin he had burst in himself, the old Highland schult, exclaimed Mrs. Cattenaugh spitefully. Ye saw not even sick words to my grandfather, Mrs. Cattenaugh, said Malcolm with rebuke. She laughed a strange laugh. Sonna she repeated contemptuously. And who's your grandfather that I should take tent who I wag my tongue or his righteousness? Then, with a sudden change of her tone to one of would-be friendliness, But what'll you be seeking for that bit of salmon trouty man? she said. As she spoke, she approached his basket, and would have taken the fish in her hands, but Malcolm involuntarily drew back. It's going to the host to my lord's breakfast, he said. Hoots, you'll just leave the trout with me. "'You'll be seeking a sexpence for it, I reckon,' she persisted, again approaching the basket. "'I tell you, Mistress Cattenaugh,' said Malcolm, drawing back now in the fear that if once she had it she would not yield it again. "'It's gone up to the house. Hoots, there's nobody there seen it yet. It's new out of the water. "'But Mistress Courthope was down last night, and wanted the best I could hook. "'Mistress Courthope, who cares for her? A mim catton old body. Give me that trouty, Malcolm.' "'Ye're a bonny lad, and it's to be the better for ye. "'Deed, I could not do it, Mistress Katana, "'though I'm sorry to disoblige ye. "'It's bespoken, ye see. "'But there's a fine haddie, "'and a bonny small coddy and a gook me. "'Go away with your haddies and your gook me's. "'Ye sinna gook me with them.' "'Well, I wouldna wonder,' said Malcolm. "'Gin Mrs. Courthope would like the haddie too, "'and maybe the lave of them as well. "'Hers is a muckle family to hold eaten. "'I'll just gang to the hose first "'afore I make any mere offers for my creel.' "'Ye leave the trout with me,' said Mrs. Cadena imperiously. "'Na, I canna do that. "'Ye mun see or sell it, I canna.' "'The woman's face grew dark with anger. "'It's will be the war for ye,' she cried. "'I'm not going to be flayed at ye. "'You're no sick a witch as that comes till, "'though ye div ken a body's foot upon the flags. "'My blind lucky daddy can do mare nor that,' said Malcolm, "'irritated by her persistency, threats, and evil looks. "'Dare ye me?' she returned, her pasty cheeks now red as fire, and her wicked eyes flashing as she shook her clenched fist at him. "'What for no?' he answered coolly, turning his head back over his shoulder, for he was already on his way to the gate. "'Ye se ken that, ye misbegotten phonelin screeched the woman, and waddled hastily into the house. "'What ails her?' said Malcolm to himself. "'She might have seen it I bud to give Mrs. Courthope the first offer.' By a winding carriage drive, through trees whose growth was stunted by the sea winds, which had cut off their tops as with a keen razor, Malcolm made a slow descent, yet was soon shadowed by timber of a more prosperous growth, rising as from a lake of the loveliest green, spangled with starry daisies. The air was full of sweet odors, uplifted with the ascending dew, and trembled with a hundred songs at once, for here was a very paradise for birds. At length he came in sight of a long, low wing of the house, and went to the door that led to the kitchen. There a maid informed him that Mrs. Courthope was in the hall, and he had better take his basket there, for she wanted to see him. He obeyed, and sought the main entrance. The house was an ancient pile, mainly of two sides at right angles, but with many gables, mostly having corbel steps, a genuine old Scottish dwelling, small-windowed and grey, with steep slated roofs and many turrets, each with a conical top. Some of these turrets rose from the ground, encasing spiral stone stairs. Others were but bartizans, their interiors forming recesses and rooms. They gave the house something of the air of a French chateau, only it looked stronger and far grimmer. 
carved around some of the windows in ancient characters, were scripture texts and antique proverbs. Two time-worn specimens of heraldic zoology, in a state of fearful and everlasting excitement, stood rampant and gaping, one on each side of the hall door, contrasting strangely with the repose of the ancient house, which looked very like what the oldest part of it was said to have been, a monastery. It had at the same time, however, a somewhat warlike expression, wherein consisting it would have been difficult to say, nor could it ever have been capable of much defense, although its position in that regard was splendid. In front was a great gravel space, in the center of which lay a huge block of serpentine from a quarry on the estate, filling the office of goal, being the pivot, as it were, around which all carriages turned. On one side of the house was a great stone bridge of lofty span, stretching across a little glen, in which ran a brown stream spotted with foam, the same that entered the frith beside the seaton. Not muddy, however, for though dark, it was clear, its brown being a rich transparent hue, almost red, gathered from the peat bogs of the great moorland hill behind. Only a very narrow terrace walk, with battlemented parapet, lay between the back of the house and a precipitous descent of a hundred feet to this rivulet. Up its banks, lovely with flowers and rich with shrubs and trees below, you might ascend until by slow gradations you left the woods and all culture behind, and found yourself, though still within the precincts of Lossy House, on the lonely side of the waste hill, a thousand feet above the sea. The hall door stood open, and just within hovered Mrs. Courthope, dusting certain precious things not to be handled by a housemaid. This portion of the building was so narrow that the hall occupied its entire width, and on the opposite side of it, another door, standing also open, gave a glimpse of the glen. "'Good morning, Malcolm,' said Mrs. Courthope, when she turned and saw whose shadow fell on the marble floor. "'What have you brought me?' "'A fine salmon trout, ma'am. But gin ye had heard how Mistress Cutterna flighted at me cause I wouldna give to her. Ye would have thought, ma'am, she was something no canny. The way at first she begged, and sign fleeked, and sign all but banned and swore. She's a peculiar person, that, Malcolm. Those are nice whitings. I don't care about the trout. Just take it to her as you go back. I don't think she'll take it, ma'am. She's an awful vengeful creature, folk says. You remind me, Malcolm, returned Mrs. Courthope, that I'm not at ease about your grandfather. He is not in a Christian frame of mind at all, and he is an old man, too. If we don't forgive our enemies, you know, the Bible plainly tells us we shall not be forgiven ourselves. I'm thinking it was a greater no the Bible said that, ma'am, returned Malcolm, who was an apt pupil of Mr. Graham. But ye'll be mean and Carmel a Glen Lyon, he went on with a smile. It cannot make her muckle to him whether my grandfather forgie him or no, seeing he's been dead this hundred year. It's not Campbell of Glen Lyon, it's your grandfather I am anxious about, said Mrs. Courthope. Nor is it only Campbell of Glenlyon he's so fierce against, but all his posterity as well. They dinna exist, ma'am. There's no sick being on the face of the earth as a descendant of that Glenlyon. It makes little difference, I fear, said Mrs. Courthope, who was no bad logician. The question isn't whether or not there's anybody to forgive, but whether Duncan MacPhail is willing to forgive. That I do believe he is, ma'am, though he would be as sair astonished to hear it as ye are yourself. I don't know what you mean by that, Malcolm. I mean, ma'am, at a blind man like my grandfather cannot ken himsel right, seeing he cannot ken ither folk right. It's by kenning ither folk that you come to ken yourself, ma'am. Isn't it, no? Blindness surely doesn't prevent a man from knowing other people. He hears them and he feels them, and indeed has generally more kindness from them because of his affliction. Frae some of them, ma'am, but it's little kindness my grandfather has experienced frae Kamala Glenlyon, ma'am. "'And just as little injury, I should suppose,' said Mrs. Courthope. "'You're wrong there, ma'am. "'A murdered mither mun be an uncle scath to Oye's Oye. "'Grandson's grandson. "'But supposing ye to be right, what I say is to the point for all that. "'I mun just explain a wee. "'When I was a laddie at the school, "'I was once tilt that one of the loons was in the way of mocking my grandfather. "'When I heard it, I thought I could just rave the heart of him "'and set my teeth in it as the Dutch soldier did to the Spaniard.' But when I got a grip o' him, and the rascal turned up a frighted, kind of dog-like face to me, I just couldn't have drive my sticked knave into it. Clenched fist. Mim, a face is an awful thing. There's aye something looking out o' it that you cannot do as you like with. But my grandfather never saw a face in his life, 
let alone glen lions it's been dirt for so many a year gen he were looking into the face of that glen lion even i do believe he would no more drive his dirk into him drive his dirk into him echoed mrs courthope in horror at the very disclaimer no i'm sure he would not persisted malcolm innocently he might not take him out of a pot hole in a river bed but he would neither dirk him nor fling him in i'm no that sure he wouldn't even rax him a hand one thing i am certain of that by the time he meets glen lion in heaven he'll be not that far frae letting bygans be bygans meets glen lion in heaven again echoed mrs courthope who knew enough of the story to be startled at the taken for granted way in which malcolm spoke is it probable that a wretch such as your legends describe him should ever get there you dinna think god's forgin him then mem i have no right to judge glen lion or any other man but as you ask me i must say i see no likelihood of it how can you complain of my poor blind grandfather for no forgin him then i ha you there mem he may have repented you know said mrs courthope feebly finding herself in less room than was comfortable in sick case returned malcolm the old man'll hear about it the minute he wends there and i make no doubt he'll do his best to persuade himself but what if he shouldn't get there persisted mrs courthope in pure benevolence hoot toot mem i wonder to hear ye a comma lettin in and my grandfather hold note that would be just yellow-faced willie o'er again lord stair the prime mover in the massacre of glencoe na na things gang another gay up there my grandfather's a rale good man for all he has a way of looking at things it's mere after the law nor the gospel apparently mrs courthope had come at length to the conclusion that malcolm was as much of a heathen as his grandfather for in silence she chose her fish in silence paid him his price and then with only a sad good day turned and left him he would have gone back by the riverside to the sea gate but mrs courthope having waived her right to the fish in favour of mrs catena he felt bound to give her another chance and so returned the way he had come here's your trout mrs catena he called aloud at her door which generally stood a little ajar you shall have it for the sixpence and a good bargain too for one of sick dimensions as he spoke he held the fish in at the door but his eyes were turned to the main street whence the factor's gig was at the moment rounding the corner into that in which he stood when suddenly the salmon trout was snatched from his hand and flung so violently in his face that he staggered back into the road the factor had to pull sharply up to avoid driving over him his rout rather than retreat was followed by a burst of insulting laughter and at the same moment out of the house rushed a large vile-looking mongrel with hair like an ill-used doormat and an abbreviated nose fresh from the ash pit caught up the trout and rushed with it towards the gate that's right my bairn shouted mrs catena to the brute as he ran take it to mrs courthope take it back with my compliments amidst a burst of malign laughter she slammed her door and from a window sideways watched the young fisherman as he stood looking after the dog in wrath and bewilderment the factor having recovered from the fit of merriment into which the sudden explosion of events had cast him and succeeded in quieting his scared horse said slackening his reins to move on you sell your fish too cheap malcolm the devil's in the tyke rejoined malcolm and seized at last by a sense of the ludicrousness of the whole affair burst out laughing and turned for the high street na na laddie the devil's no away in sic a hurry he bade said a voice behind him malcolm turned again and lifted his bonnet it was miss horn who had come up from the seaton did you see yon mem he asked i will that as i came up the brae dinna stand there laddie the jerd'll be watching you like a cat watching a mouse i ken her she's a cat woman and i can abide her she's no mouse she's in secrets mair nor good i should wad come away wi me i want a bit fish i can ill eat and her lying dead in the house it winna gang o'er but i maun get some strength pitten in till me afore the burial it's a god's mercy i wasna made wi feelings or what would a come o me where is the good o greetin it's not worth the salt in the water of it malcolm it's an ill world and might be a bonny one gin it were na for ill men deed mem i'm thinkin mair about ill women at this present said malcolm maybe there's no sic a thing but yon's unco like one as bonny a salmon trout as ever ye saw mem it's all i'm capable of to hold on curse that foul tyke o hers hoot laddie hold your tongue ay will i i'm not goin to do it ye ken but sic a fine trout as that the very one ye would a liked mem 
"'Never ye mind the trout. "'There's mair where that came frae. "'What angered her at ye? "'Nothing mair nor that I bode to give Mistress Courthope "'the first whale o' my fish. "'The woman's no worth your notice, "'cept to hold out to her gate, laddie, "'and that ye had better look till, for she's no canny. "'Dinna ye anger her again, gin ye can help it. "'She has an ill look, and I cannot bide her. "'Here, there's your siller. "'Jean, take in this fish.' During the latter part of the conversation, they had been standing at the door, while Miss Horne ferreted the needful pence from a pocket under her gown. She now entered, but as Malcolm waited for Jean to take the fish, she turned on the threshold and said, "'What do you no know like to see her, Malcolm? A good friend she was to you, so long as she was here,' she added after a short pause. The youth hesitated. "'I never saw a corp in my life, ma'am, and I'm just some feared,' he said, after another brief silence. "'Hoot, laddie,' returned Miss Horne, in a somewhat offended tone. "'That'll be what comes o' having feelings. "'A bonny corpse the bonniest thing in creation. "'And that quiet. "'Eh, sick a heap o' them as there has been sin Abel,' she went on, "'and ilk one o' them looking as gin there had never been another but itsel. "'Ye ought to see a corp, Malcolm. "'You'll have it to do afore ye one yoursel, "'and you'll never see a bonnier no my grisel. "'Be it to your will, mem, said Malcolm resignedly. At once she led the way, and he followed her in silence up the stair and into the dead chamber. There on the white bed lay the long, black, misshapen thing she had called the bit boxy, and with a strange sinking at the heart, Malcolm approached it. Miss Horne's hand came from behind him and withdrew a covering. There lay a vision, lovely indeed to behold, a fixed evanescence, a listening stillness, awful, yet with a look of entreaty, at once resigned and unyielding, that strangely drew the heart of Malcolm. He saw a low white forehead, large eyeballs upheaving closed lids, finely modelled features of which the tightened skin showed all the delicacy, and a mouth of suffering whereon the vanishing psyche had left the shadow of the smile with which she awoke. The tears gathered in his eyes, and Miss Horne saw them. "'Ye mun lay your hand upon her, Malcolm,' she said. "'You said I touch the dead.' "'to hold you own dreamed about them.' "'I would be love, answered Malcolm. "'She would be or bonny a dream to miss. "'Are they all like that?' he added, speaking under his breath. "'Na, deed no,' replied Miss Horne, with mild indignation. "'What do you expect Bobby Cottonaw to look like that now? "'I beg your pardon for mentioning the woman, my dear,' "'she added with sudden divergence, "'bending towards the still face "'and speaking in a tenderly apologetic tone.' I can weel ye can abide the very name o' her, but it's to be the last use to hear it to all eternity, my doe. Then turning again to Malcolm, lay your hand upon her brow, I tell ye, she said. I dare na, replied the youth, still under his breath. My hands are no clean. I wouldna for the world touch her with fishy hands. The same moment, moved by a sudden impulse, whose irresistibleness was veiled in his unconsciousness, he bent down and put his lips to the forehead. As suddenly he started back erect, with dismay on every feature. "'Eh, ma'am,' he cried in an agonized whisper, "'she's dooms cold.' "'What should she be?' retorted Miss Horne. "'Would ye hate her buried warm?' He followed her from the room in silence, with the sense of a faint sting on his lips. She led him into her parlour and gave him a glass of wine. "'You'll come to the burial upon Saturday?' she asked, half inviting, half inquiring. "'I'm sorry to say, ma'am, that I canna,' he answered. "'I promised Mr. Graham to take the school for him, and let him gang. "'Well, well, Mr. Graham's obliged to you, no doubt, and we canna help it. "'Give my compliments to your grandfather.' "'I'll do that, ma'am. He'll be sair pleased, for he's uncle grateful for any sick attention,' said Malcolm, and with the words took his leave. End of chapter 9《ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバースデーとは、ハッピーバー The waves kept roaring on the sands, persistent and fateful. The scarnose was one mass of foaming white, 
and in the cave still haunted by the tide, the bellowing was like that of thunder. Through the drizzle-shot wind and the fog blown in shreds from the sea, a large number of the most respectable of the male population of the borough, clothed in Sunday gloom deepened by the crepe on their hats, made their way to Miss Horne's, for despite her rough manners she was held in high repute. It was only such as had reason to dread the secret communication between closet and housetop that feared her tongue. If she spoke loud, she never spoke false, or backbit in the dark. What chiefly conduced, however, to the respect in which she was held, was that she was one of their own people, her father having died minister of the parish some twenty years before. Comparatively little was known of her deceased cousin, who had been much of an invalid, and had mostly kept to the house, but all had understood that Miss Horne was greatly attached to her, and it was for the sake of the living, mainly, that the dead was thus honoured. As the prayer drew to a close, the sounds of trampling and scuffling feet bore witness that Waddy Witherspale and his assistants were carrying the coffin down the stair. Soon the company rose to follow it, and trooping out, arranged themselves behind the hearse, which, horrid with nodding plumes and gold and black panelling, drew away from the door to make room for them. Just as they were about to move off, to the amazement of the company and the few onlookers who, notwithstanding the weather, stood around to represent the commonalty, Miss Horne herself, solitary, in a long black coat and somewhat awful bonnet, issued, and made her way through the mourners until she stood immediately behind the hearse, by the side of Mr. Cairns, the parish minister. The next moment, Waddy Witherspale, who had his station at the further side of the hearse, arriving somehow at a knowledge of the apparition, came round by the horses' heads, and with a look of positive alarm at the glaring infringement of time-honoured customs, addressed her in half-whispered tones expostulatory. "'You'll never be thinking of going yourself, ma'am,' he said. "'What for no, Watty, I would like to ken,' growled Miss Horn from the vaulted depths of her bonnet. "'The like was never heard tell of,' returned Watty, with the dismay of an orthodox undertaker, righteously jealous of all innovation. "'It'll be to tell a henceforth,' rejoined Miss Horn, who in her risen anger spoke aloud, caring nothing who heard her. "'Dar ye presume, Watty Witherspale,' she went on, "'for no reason but that I gave ye the job "'and undertook to pay ye for it, "'and that far abone its market value. "'Dar ye presume, I say, to dictate to me "'what to do and what not to do anent the mater in hand? "'Think ye I have been a mither to the poor young thing "'for so many a year to let her gang away her loan "'at the last with the likes of you for company? "'Hoot, ma'am, there is a minister at your elbook. "'I tell ye, but ye're a ween rough men folk. "'There's not a woman among ye to hold things decent "'sep I gang myself. "'I'm not begging the minister's pardon either.' "'I'll gang. I maun see my poor Grizel till her last bid.' "'I dread it may be too much for your feelings, Miss Horne,' said the minister, who, being an ambitious young man of lowly origin, and very shy of the ridiculous, did not in the least wish her company. "'Feelings!' exclaimed Miss Horne, in a tone of indignant repudiation. "'I'm going to do what's right. I say gang, and gin ye dinna like my company, Mr. Cairns, you can gang home, and I say gang without ye. "'Gin she should happen to be looking down, she sun at see me wantin' at the last o' her. "'But I say make no work about it. I say no put myself o'er for it.' And ere the minister could utter another syllable, she had left her place to go to the rear. The same instant the procession began to move, corpse marshalled towards the grave. And stepping aside, she stood erect, sternly eyeing the irregular ranks of two and three and four as they passed her, intending to bring up the rear alone. But already there was one in that solitary position. With bowed head, Alexander Graham walked last and single. The moment he caught sight of Miss Horne he perceived her design, and lifting his hat, offered his arm. She took it almost eagerly, and together they followed in silence, through the gusty wind and monotonous drizzle. The schoolhouse was close to the churchyard. An instant hush fell upon the scholars when the hearse darkened the windows, lasting while the horrible thing slowly turned to enter the iron gates. A deep hush, as if a wave of the eternal silence which rounds all our noises, had broken across its barriers. The mad laird, who had been present all the morning, trembled from head to foot, yet rose and went to the door with a look of strange, subdued eagerness. When Miss Horne and Mr. Graham had passed into the churchyard, he followed. With the bending of uncovered heads, in a final gaze of leave-taking, over the coffin at rest in the bottom of the grave, all that belonged to the ceremony of burial was fulfilled. But the two facts that no one left the churchyard, although the wind blew and the rain fell, 
until the mound of sheltering earth was heaped high over the dead, and that the hands of many friends assisted with spade and shovel, did much to compensate for the lack of a service. As soon as this labor was ended, Mr. Graham again offered his arm to Miss Horne, who had stood in perfect calmness watching the hole with her eagle's eyes. But although she accepted his offer, instead of moving towards the gate, she kept her position in the attitude of a hostess who will follow her friends. They were the last to go from the churchyard. When they reached the schoolhouse, she would have had Mr. Graham leave her, but he insisted on seeing her home. Contrary to her habit, she yielded, and they slowly followed the retiring company. "'Safe at last!' half sighed Miss Horne, as they entered the town, her sole remark on the way. Rounding a corner, they came upon Mrs. Catana, standing at a neighbor's door, gazing out upon nothing, as was her wont at times, but talking to someone in the house behind her. Miss Horne turned her head aside as she passed. A look of low, malicious, half-triumphant cunning lightened across the puffy face of the howdy. She cocked one bushy eyebrow, setting one eye wide open, drew down the other eyebrow, nearly closing the eye under it, and stood looking after them until they were out of sight. Then, turning her head over her shoulder, she burst into a laugh, softly husky with the general flabbiness of her corporeal conditions. "'What ails you, Mistress Katana? cried a voice from within. "'Sick a couple as yon tursome would make,' she replied, again bursting into gelatinous laughter. "'Who, oh, then? I cannot leave my milk porridge to come and look.' "'Oh, just Mig Horn the old kale runt, and Sunny Graham the sticket minister. "'I would like Whale to be at the bidden of them. "'Eh, the two heads of them upon one bolster.' "'And chuckling a low chuckle, Mrs. Cattenau moved for her own door. "'As soon as the churchyard was clear of the funeral train, "'the mad laird peeped from behind a tall stone, "'gazed cautiously around him, "'and then with slow steps came and stood over the new-made grave, "'where the sexton was now laying the turf.' to make a snot for the Sabbath. "'What is she gone till?' he murmured to himself. He could generally speak better when merely uttering his thoughts without attempt at communication. "'I dinna ken where I come frae, and I dinna ken where she's gone till. But when I gang myself, maybe I'll ken both. I dinna ken, I dinna ken, I dinna ken where I come frae.' Thus muttering, so lost in the thoughts that originated them that he spoke the words mechanically, he left the churchyard and returned to the school, where under the superintendence of Malcolm everything had been going on in the usual Saturday fashion. The work of the day which closed the week's labors being to repeat a certain number of questions of the shorter catechism, which term, alas, included the answers, and next to buttress them with a number of suffering caryatids, as it were, texts of scripture, I mean, first petrified, and then dragged into the service. Before Mr. Graham returned, everyone had done his part except Shelty, who, excellent at asking questions for himself, had a very poor memory for the answers to those of other people, and was in consequence often a keepy in. He did not generally heed it much, however, for the master was not angry with him on such occasions, and they gave him an opportunity of asking in his turn a multitude of questions of his own. When he entered, he found Malcolm reading The Tempest, and Shelty sitting in the middle of the waste schoolroom, with his elbows on the desk before him, and his head and the shorter catechism between them, while in the farthest corner sat Mr. Stewart, with his eyes fixed on the ground, murmuring his answerless questions to himself. "'Come up, Shelty,' said Mr. Graham, anxious to let the boy go. "'Which of the questions did you break down in today?' "'Please, sir, I could not rest in my grave till the resurrection,' answered Shelty, but with a dim sense of the humor involved in the reply. "'What benefits do believers receive from Christ at death?' said Mr. Graham, putting the question with a smile. "'The souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness, and do immediately pass into glory, and their bodies being still united to Christ do rest in their graves till the resurrection,' replied Shelty, now with perfect accuracy. Whereupon the master, fearing the outbreak of a torrent of counter-questions, made haste to dismiss him. "'That'll do, Shelty,' he said. "'Run home to your dinner.' Shelty shot from the room like a shell from a mortar. He had barely vanished when Mr. Stewart rose and came slowly from his corner, his legs appearing to tremble under the weight of his hump, which moved fitfully up and down in his futile attempts to utter the word resurrection. As he advanced, he kept heaving one shoulder forward 
as if he would fain bring his huge burden to the front, and hold it out in mute appeal to his instructor. But before reaching him he suddenly stopped, lay down on the floor on his back, and commenced rolling from side to side, with moans and complaints. Mr. Graham interpreted the action into the question, how was such a body as his to rest in its grave till the resurrection, perched thus on its own back in the coffin? All the answer he could think of was to lay hold of his hand, lift him, and point upwards. The poor fellow shook his head, glanced over his shoulder at his hump, and murmured, Heavy, heavy, seeming to imply that it would be hard for him to rise and ascend at the last day. He had doubtless a dim notion that all his trouble had to do with his hump. End of chapter 10《ハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピー while the earth shone with that peculiar luster which follows the weeping which has endured its appointed night. The larks were at it again, singing as if their hearts would break for joy as they hovered in brooding exultation over the song of the future. For their nests beneath hoarded a wealth of larks for summers to come. Especially about the old church, half buried in the ancient trees of Lossy House, the birds that day were jubilant. Their throats seemed too narrow to let out the joyful air that filled all their hollow bones and quills. They sang as if they must sing, or choke with too much gladness. Beyond the short spire and its shining cock rose the balls and stars and arrowy veins of the house, glittering in gold and sunshine. The inward hush of the resurrection, broken only by the prophetic birds, the poets of the groaning and travailing creation, held time and space as in a trance, and the center from which radiated both the hush and the caroling expectation seemed to Alexander Graham to be the churchyard in which he was now walking in the cool of the morning. It was more carefully kept than most Scottish churchyards, and yet was not too trim. Nature had a word in the affair, was allowed her part of mourning, in long grass and moss and the crumbling away of stone. The wholesomeness of decay which both in nature and in humanity is but the miry road back to life, was not unrecognized here. There was nothing of the hideous attempt to hide death in the garments of life. The master walked about gently, now stopping to read some well-known inscription and ponder for a moment over the words, and now wandering across the stoneless mounds, content to be forgotten by all but those who love the departed. At length he seated himself on a slab by the side of the mound that rose but yesterday. It was sculptured with symbols of decay, needless surely where the originals lay about the mouth of every newly opened grave, and as surely ill-befitting the precincts of a church whose indwelling gospel is of life victorious over death. What are these stones, he said to himself, but monuments to oblivion? They are not memorials of the dead, but memorials of the forgetfulness of the living. How vain it is to send a poor forsaken name, like the title page of a lost book, down the careless stream of time. Let me serve my generation, and let God remember me. The morning wore on. The sun rose higher and higher. He drew from his pocket the Nosce Te Ipsum of Sir John Davies, and was still reading, in quiet enjoyment of the fine logic of the lawyer poet, when he heard the church key in the trembling hand of Jonathan Old, the sexton jar feebly battling with the reluctant lock. Soon the people began to gather, mostly in groups and couples. At length came solitary Miss Horne, whom the neighbors, from respect to her sorrow, had left to walk alone. But Mr. Graham went to meet her, and accompanied her into the church. It was a cruciform building, as old as the vanished monastery, and the burial place of generations of noble blood. The dust of royalty, even, lay under its floor. A knight of stone reclined cross-legged in a niche with an arched Norman canopy in one of the walls, the rest of which was nearly encased in large tablets of white marble, for at his foot lay the ashes of barons and earls whose title was extinct, 
and whose lands had been inherited by the family of Lossie. Inside, as well as outside of the church, the ground had risen with the dust of generations, so that the walls were low, and heavy galleries having been erected in parts, the place was filled with shadowy recesses and haunted with glooms. From a window in the square pew where he sat, so small and low that he had to bend his head to look out of it, the schoolmaster could see a rivulet of sunshine, streaming through between two upright gravestones, and glorifying the long grass of a neglected mound that lay close to the wall under the wintry drip from the eaves. When he raised his head, the church looked very dark. The best way there to preach the resurrection, he thought, would be to contrast the sepulchral gloom of the church, its dreary psalms and drearier sermons, with the sunlight on the graves, the lark-filled sky, and the wind blowing where it listed. But although the minister was a young man of the commonest order, educated to the church that he might eat bread, hence a mere willing slave to the beck of his lord and master, the patron, and but a parrot in the pulpit, the schoolmaster not only endeavoured to pour his feelings and desires into the mould of his prayers, but listened to the sermon with a countenance that revealed no distaste for the weak and unsavoury broth ladled out him to nourish his soul withal. When, however, the service, though whose purposes the affair could be supposed to serve except those of Mr. Cairns himself, would have been a curious question, was over, he did breathe a sigh of relief, and when he stepped out into the sun and wind which had been shining and blowing all the time of the dreary ceremony, he wondered whether the larks might not have had the best of it in the God-praising that had been going on for two slow-paced hours. Yet having been so long used to the sort of thing, he did not mind it half so much as his friend Malcolm, who found the Sunday observances an unspeakable weariness to both flesh and spirit. On the present occasion, however, Malcolm did not find the said observances dreary, for he observed nothing but the vision which radiated from the dusk of the small gallery forming Lossy Pew, directly opposite the Norman canopy and stone crusader. Unconventional, careless girl as Lady Florimel had hitherto shown herself to him, he saw her sit that morning like the proudest of her race, alone, and to all appearance unaware of a single other person's being in the church besides herself. She manifested no interest in what was going on, nor indeed felt any. How could she? Never parted her lips to sing, sat during the prayer, and throughout the sermon seemed to Malcolm not once to move her eyes from the carved crusader. When all was over, she still sat motionless, sat until the last old woman had hobbled out. Then she rose, walked slowly from the gloom of the church, flashed into the glow of the courtyard, gleamed across it to a private door in the wall, which a servant held for her, and vanished. If a moment after, the notes of a merry song invaded the ears of those who yet lingered, who could dare suspect that proudly sedate damsel thus suddenly breaking the ice of her public behavior? For a mere schoolgirl, she had certainly done the lady's part well. What she wore I do not exactly know, nor would it perhaps be well to describe what might seem grotesque to such prejudiced readers as have no judgment beyond the fashions of the day. But I will not let pass the opportunity of reminding them how sadly old-fashioned we of the present hour also look, in the eyes of those equally infallible judges who have been in dread procession towards us ever since we began to be, our posterity. Judges who perhaps will doubt with a smile whether we even knew what love was, or ever had a dream of the grandeur they are on the point of grasping. But at least bethink yourselves, dear posterity, we have not ceased because you have begun. Out of the church the blind Duncan strode with long, confident strides. He had no staff to aid him, for he never carried one when in his best clothes. But he leaned proudly on Malcolm's arm, if one who walked so erect could be said to lean. He had adorned his bonnet the autumn before with a sprig of the large purple heather, but every bell had fallen from it, leaving only the naked spray, pitiful analogue of the whole withered exterior of which it formed part. His sporin, however, hid the stained front of his kilt, and his Sunday coat had been new within ten years, the gift of certain ladies of Port Lossie, some of whom, to whose lowland eyes the kilt was obnoxious, would have added a pair of trousers, had not Miss Horne stoutly opposed them, confident that Duncan would regard the present as an insult. And she was right, for rather than wear anything instead of the filibeg, Duncan would have plated himself one with his own blind fingers out of an old sack. Indeed, although the trues were never at any time unknown in the Highlands, Duncan had always regarded them as effeminate, 
and especially in his lowland exile would have looked upon the wearing of them as a disgrace to his highland birth. "'That was a very good sermon today, Malcolm,' he said, as they stepped from the churchyard upon the road. Malcolm, knowing well whither conversation on the subject would lead, made no reply. His grandfather, finding him silent, iterated his remark, with the addition— "'But how could it be a bad when you'll be thinking, my boy, "'when he'd be having such a text to keep him straight?' "'Malcolm continued silent, for a good many people were within hearing, "'whom he did not wish to see amused with the remarks certain to follow any he could make. "'But Mr. Graham, who happened to be walking near the old man on the other side, "'out of pure politeness, made a partial response. "'Yes, Mr. Macphail, he said, it was a grand text.' "'Yes, and it was'll be a grand sermon,' persisted Duncan. "'Fengeance is mine. I will repay. "'De Lord loves vengeance. "'It's a fine thing, vengeance, "'to make de wicked know de they'll be being but men. "'Yes, de Lord will slay de wicked. "'De Lord will give de honest man vengeance upon his enemies. "'It was a grand sermon.' "'Don't you think vengeance a very dreadful thing, Mr. Macphail?' "'said the schoolmaster.' "'Yes, for de vant it'll be in de wrong. "'I wish de vengeance was mine,' he added with a loud sigh. "'But the Lord doesn't think any of us fit to be trusted with it, "'and so keeps it to himself, you see. "'Yes, and dat'll be because it be too good to be given to another, "'and some people would be wake of heart and be letting their enemies go.' "'I suspect it's for the opposite reason, Mr. Macphail. "'We would go much too far, making no allowances.' "'causing the innocent to suffer along with the guilty, "'neither giving fair play nor avoiding cruelty. "'And indeed, no fear,' interrupted Duncan eagerly. "'No fear, when de wrong was as large as Morven.' "'In the sermon there had not been one word "'as to St. Paul's design in quoting the text. "'It had been but a theatrical setting forth "'of the vengeance of God upon sin, "'illustrated with several common tales "'of the discovery of murder by strange means.' a sermon after Duncan's own heart, and nothing but the way in which he now snuffed the wind with head thrown back and nostrils dilated could have given an adequate idea of how much he enjoyed the recollection of it. Mr. Graham had for many years believed that he must have had some personal wrongs to brood over, wrongs, probably, to which were to be attributed his loneliness and exile, but of such Duncan had never spoken, uttering no maledictions except against the real or imagined foes of his family. Footnote what added to the likelihood of Mr. Graham's conjecture was the fact, well enough known to him, though to few lowlanders besides, that revenge is not a characteristic of the gale. Whatever instances of it may have appeared, and however strikingly they may have been worked up in fiction, such belong to the individual and not to the race. A remarkable proof of this occurs in the history of the family of Glencoe itself. What remained of it after the massacre in 1689 rose in 1745, and joined the forces of Prince Charles Edward. Arriving in the neighbourhood of the residence of Lord Stair, whose grandfather had been one of the chief instigators of the massacre, the prince took special precautions, lest the people of Glencoe should wreak inherited vengeance on the earl. But they were too indignant at being supposed capable of visiting on the innocent the guilt of their ancestors, that it was with much difficulty they were prevented from forsaking the standard of the prince, and returning at once to their homes." Perhaps a yet stronger proof is the fact, fully asserted by one Gaelic scholar at least, that their literature contains nothing to foster feelings of revenge. End of footnote. The master placed so little value on any possible results of mere argument, and had indeed so little faith in any words except such as came hot from the heart, that he said no more, but with an invitation to Malcolm to visit him in the evening, wished them good day, and turned in at his own door. The two went slowly on towards the sea-town. The road was speckled with home-goers, single and in groups, holding a quiet Sunday pace to their dinners. Suddenly Duncan grasped Malcolm's arm, with the energy of perturbation, almost of fright, and said in a loud whisper, "'There'll be something evil not far from her, Malcolm, my son. Look about, look about, and take care how you'll be leading her.' Malcolm looked about, and replied, pressing Duncan's arm, and speaking in a low voice, far less audible than his whisper. "'There's nobody near, Daddy. Nobody but the howdy wife.' "'What howdy wife do you mean, Malcolm?' "'Hoot, Mistress Catanaw, ye ken. Didn't let her hear ye.' 
I had a vision, Malcolm. One moment no more. The darkness closed around it. I saw a bed, Malcolm, and... Wish, wish, Daddy, pleaded Malcolm importunately. She hears ilk a word you're saying. She's awful gleg, and she's as poisonous as an edder. Hold your tongue, Daddy. For good sake, hold your tongue. The old man yielded, grasping Malcolm's arm and quickening his pace, though his breath came hard, as through the gathering folds of asthma. Mrs. Katana also quickened her pace, and came gliding along the grass by the side of the road, noiseless as the adder to which Malcolm had likened her, and going much faster than she seemed. Her great round body looked a persistent type of her calling, and her arms seemed to rest in front of her as upon a ledge. In one hand she carried a small Bible, round which was folded her pocket handkerchief, and in the other a bunch of southern wood and rosemary. She wore a black silk gown, a white shawl, and a great straw bonnet with yellow ribbons and huge bows, and looked the very pattern of Sunday respectability. But her black eyebrows gloomed ominous, and an evil smile shadowed about the corners of her mouth as she passed without turning her head or taking the least notice of them. Duncan shuddered, and breathed yet harder, but seemed to recover as she increased the distance between them. They walked the rest of the way in silence, however, and even after they reached home, Duncan made no allusion to his late discomposure. "'What was it you thought you saw as we came through the kirk, Daddy?' asked Malcolm, when they were seated at their dinner of broiled mackerel and boiled potatoes. "'In other times she'll be having such visions often, Malcolm, my son,' he returned, avoiding an answer. Like other bards of her race, she would be seeing, in the spirit, where old Duncan can see. And she'll be telling you, Malcolm, beware of dat woman, for de woman was thinking bad thoughts, and dat will be what make her shudder and shake, my son, as she'll be going by. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Malcolm by George MacDonald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devora Allen. Chapter Twelve The Churchyard On Sundays, Malcolm was always more or less annoyed by the obtrusive presence of his arms and legs, accompanied by a vague feeling that, at any moment, and no warning given, they might, with some insane and irrepressible flourish, break the Sabbath on their own account and degrade him in the eyes of his fellow townsmen, who seemed all silently watching how he bore the restraints of the holy day. It must be conceded, however, that the discomfort had quite as much to do with his Sunday clothes as with the Sabbath day, and that it interfered but little with an altogether peculiar calm which appeared to him to belong in its own right to the Sunday, whether its light flowed in the sunny cataracts of June, or oozed through the spongy clouds of November. As he walked again to the Alton, or Old Town, in the evening, the filmy floats of white in the lofty blue, the droop of the long dark grass by the side of the short bright corn, the shadows pointing like all lengthening shadows towards the quarter of hope, the yellow glory filling the air and paling the green below, the unseen larks hanging aloft, like air pitcher plants that overflowed in song, like electric jars emptying themselves of the sweet thunder of bliss in the flashing of wings and the trembling of melodious throats. These were indeed of the summer, but the cup of rest had been poured out upon them. The Sabbath brooded like an embodied peace over the earth, and under its wings they grew sevenfold peaceful, with a peace that might be felt, like the hand of a mother pressed upon the half-sleeping child. The rusted iron cross on the eastern gable of the old church stood glowing lusterless in the westering sun, while the gilded vane, whose business was the wind, creaked radiantly this way and that, in the flaws from the region of the sunset. Its shadow flickered soft on the new grave, where the grass of the wounded sod was drooping. Again seated on a neighbor's stone, Malcolm found his friend. "'See,' said the schoolmaster, as the fisherman sat down beside him, how the shadow from one grave stretches like an arm to embrace another. In this light the churchyard seems the very birthplace of shadows. See them flowing out of the tombs as from fountains to overflow the world. Does the morning or the evening light suit such a place best, Malcolm? The pupil thought for a while. The evening light, sir, he answered at length, for you see the sun's day in lake, 
and death's like a fallen asleep, and the grave's the bed, and the sod's the bedclothes, and there's a long night to the fore. Are you sure of that, Malcolm? It's the way folk thinks and says about it, sir. Or maybe does not think and only says. Maybe, sir. I dinna ken. Come here, Malcolm, said Mr. Graham, and took him by the arm, and led him towards the east end of the church, where a few tombstones were crowded against the wall, as if they would press close to a place they might not enter. Read that, he said, pointing to a flat stone, where every hollow letter was shown in high relief by the growth in it of a lovely moss. The rest of the stone was rich in grey and green and brown lichens, but only in the letters grew the bright moss. The inscription stood, as it were, in the hand of nature herself. He is not here. He is risen. While Malcolm gazed, trying to think what his master would have him think, the latter resumed. If he is risen, if the sun is up, Malcolm, then the morning, and not the evening, is the season for the place of tombs. The morning, when the shadows are shortening and separating, not the evening, when they are growing all into one. I used to love the churchyard best in the evening, when the past was more to me than the future. Now I visit it almost every bright summer morning, and only occasionally at night. But, sir, isn't a death a dreadful thing? said Malcolm. That depends on whether a man regards it as his fate or as the will of a perfect God. Its obscurity is its dread. But if God be light, then death itself must be full of splendor a splendor probably too keen for our eyes to receive. But there's the day in itself. Isn't that fearsome? It's that I would be flayed at. I don't see why it should be. It's the want of a god that makes it dreadful, and you will be greatly to blame, Malcolm, if you haven't found your god by the time you have to die. They were startled by a gruff voice near them. The speaker was hidden by a corner of the church. Aye, she's well happed, it said. "'But a grave never looks right wantin' a stone, "'and her old cousin would hear a nun being laid o'er her. "'I said it might be set up at her head, "'where she would never find the way to it. "'But na, na, none of it for her. "'She's one at mun take her and gate. "'Say the other thing who likes.' "'It was Waddy Witherspale who spoke, "'a thin shaving of a man, "'with a deep, harsh, indeed startling voice. "'And what ailed her at a stone?' "'returned the voice of Jonathan Oldbird, the sexton. "'No doubt it would be the expense.' "'I'm not a-telling you what it was. "'Deal a bit of the expense came into the calculation. "'The old maiden's none so close as folk as did not ken her would make her out. "'I ken her will. "'She wouldn't have a stone laid upon her as gin she wanted to hold her down, poor thing. "'She says, says she, the yard's enough upon the top of her, wantin' that. "'It might be some sair she would be thinking doubtless "'for such a weak-worn creature to lift when the trump was blown,' "'said the sexton, with the feeble laugh of one who doubts the reception of his wit.' "'Well, I did whiles think,' responded Waddy, "'but it was impossible from his tone "'to tell whether or not he spoke in earnest. "'It may be my boxies as a ween or wheel made "'for the use they're put till. "'They shouldna be that ill to rive. "'Gin all be true at the minister says. "'You see, we dinna ken when that day may come, "'and there may not be time for the what and the worm "'to call the boards apart. "'Hoots, man, it's not your long nails "'nor yet your hided screws that'll hold down the redeemed, "'gin the judgment where the morn's morning,' said the sexton. "'and for the lave they would be glad enough to bide where they are. "'But they'll all be hoked out. Fear na ye that.' "'The Lord grant a blessed uprising to you and me, Jonathan, at that day,' said Waddy, "'in the tone of one who felt himself uttering a more than ordinarily religious sentiment, "'and on the word followed the sound of their retreating footsteps. "'How closely together may come the solemn and the grotesque, "'the ludicrous and the majestic,' said the schoolmaster." Here, to us lingering in awe about the doors beyond which lie the gulfs of the unknown, to our very side come the right and the grave-digger with their talk of the strength of coffins and the judgment of the living God. "'I have whiles thought myself, sir,' said Malcolm. "'It was gay strange-like to have a woman of the make of Mistress Katana sitting at the receipt of Bairns, like the gatekeeper of the other world, with a hasboy in her hand. It does not promise or will for them that she lets in. And know ye have putten into my head— "'that there's Watty Witherspale and Jonathan Oldbird "'for the porters to open and let all that's left of us out again. "'Think a sook like having sook a hand in six solemn maters.' "'Indeed, some of us have strange porters,' said Mr. Graham with a smile, "'both to open to us and to close behind us. "'Yet even in them lies the human nature, 
which, itself the embodiment of the unknown, wanders out through the gates of mystery, to wander back, it may be, in a manner not altogether unlike that by which it came. In contemplative moods, the schoolmaster spoke in a calm and loftily sustained style of book English, quite another language from that he used when he sought to rouse the consciences of his pupils, and strangely contrasted with that in which Malcolm kept up his side of the dialogue. "'I hope, sir,' said the latter, "'it'll be no sort of a celestial mistress, Katna, "'at'll be waiting for me at the other side, "'nor yet for my poor daddy, "'who could ill bide being wommel about upon her knee.' "'Mr. Graham laughed outright. "'If there be one to act the nurse,' he answered, "'I presume there will be one to take the mother's part, too.' "'But speaking of the grave, sir,' pursued Malcolm, "'I wish you could drop a word it might be of some comfort to my daddy. "'It's plain to me for a words that he lets fall now and then, "'that instead of leaving the world ahind him when he days, "'he thinks to lie smorin' and smutterin' in the moles, "'clammy and wit, but all there, "'and tremblin' at the thought of the sudden awful roar "'and din of the brazen trumpet of the archangel. "'I wish you would look in and say something till him some night. "'It's not good mentioning it to the minister. "'He would only give a laugh and gang away. "'And gin you could just slide in a word about forgiving his enemies, sir.' I made light of the matter to Mistress Courthope, cause she only makes him wear. She does well with what the minister puts into her, but she has little of her own to mix it up with, and so has but small weight with the likes of my grandfather. Only you will not let him think you cold on purpose. They walked about the churchyard until the sun went down in what Mr. Graham called the grave of his endless resurrection, the clouds on the one side bearing all the pomp of his funeral, the clouds on the other all the glory of his uprising. And when now the twilight trembled filmy on the borders of the dark, the master once more seated himself beside the new grave, and motioned to Malcolm to take his place beside him. There they talked and dreamed together of the life to come, with many wonderings and returns, and little as the boy knew of the ocean depths of sorrowful experience in the bosom of his companion whence floated up the breaking bubbles of rainbow-hued thought, his words fell upon his heart not to be provender for the birds of flitting fancy and airy speculation, but the seed, it might be decades ere it ripened, of a coming harvest of hope. At length the master rose and said, Malcolm, I'm going in. I should like you to stay here half an hour alone, and then go straight home to bed. For the master believed in solitude and silence. Say rather, he believed in God. What the youth might think, feel, or judge he could not tell, but he believed that when the human is still, the divine speaks to it, because it is his own. Malcolm consented willingly. The darkness had deepened, the graves all but vanished. An old setting moon appeared, boat-like over a great cloudy chasm into which it slowly sank. Blocks of cloud with stars between possessed the sky. All nature seemed thinking about death. A listless wind began to blow, and Malcolm began to feel as if he were awake too long, and ought to be asleep, as if he were out in a dream, a dead man that had risen too soon, or lingered too late, so lonely, so forsaken. The wind, soft as it was, seemed to blow through his very soul, yet something held him, and his half-hour was long over when he left the churchyard. As he walked home, the words of a German poem, a version of which Mr. Graham had often repeated to him, and once more that same night, kept ringing in his heart. Uplifted is the stone, and all mankind arisen. We men remain thine own, and vanished is our prison. What bitterest grief can stay before thy golden cup, when earth and life give way, and with our Lord we sup? To the marriage death doth call, the maidens are not slack. The lamps are burning all, of oil there is no lack. Afar I hear the walking of thy great marriage throng, and hark, the stars are talking with human tone and tongue. Courage, for life is hasting, to endless life away. The inner fire unwasting transfigures our dull clay. See the stars melting, sinking, in life wine golden bright. We of the splendor drinking shall grow to stars of light. Lost, lost are all our losses, love set forever free. The full life heaves and tosses, like an eternal sea. One endless living story, one poem spread abroad. And the sun of all our glory is the countenance of God. End of chapter 12
Chapter Thirteen of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devora Allen. Chapter Thirteen, The Marquis of Lossie. The next morning rose as lovely as if the mantle of the departing resurrection day had fallen upon it. Malcolm rose with it, hastened to his boat, and pulled out into the bay for an hour or two's fishing. Nearly opposite the great conglomerate rock at the western end of the dune, called the Board Craig, because of a large hole that went right through it, he began to draw in his line. Glancing shoreward as he leaned over the gunwale, he spied at the foot of the rock, near the opening, a figure in white, seated with bowed head. It was, of course, the mysterious lady, whom he had twice before seen thereabout at this unlikely, if not untimely, hour. But with yesterday fresh in his mind, how could he fail to see in her an angel of the resurrection, waiting at the sepulchre to tell the glad news that the Lord was risen? Many were the glances he cast shoreward, as he rebated his line, and having thrown it again into the water, sat waiting until it should be time to fire the swivel. Still the lady sat on, in her whiteness a creature of the dawn, without even lifting her head. At length, having added a few more fishes to the little heap in the bottom of his boat, and finding his watch bear witness that the hour was at hand, he seated himself on his thwart, and rowed lustily to the shore, his bosom filled with the hope of yet another sight of the lovely face, and another hearing of the sweet English voice and speech. But the very first time he turned his head to look, he saw but the sloping foot of the rock sink bare into the shore. No white-robed angel sat at the gate of the resurrection. No moving thing was visible on the far vacant sands, when he reached the top of the dune, there was no living creature beyond but a few sheep feeding on the thin grass. He fired the gun, rode back to the Seton, ate his breakfast, and set out to carry the best of his fish to the house. The moment he turned the corner of her street, he saw Mrs. Katana standing on her threshold with her arms akimbo. Although she was always tidy, and her house spotlessly trim, she yet seemed forever about the door, on the outlook at least, if not on the watch. "'What have ye in your bit basket the day, Malcolm?' she said, with a peculiar smile, which was not sweet enough to restore vanished confidence. "'Nothing good for dogs,' answered Malcolm, and was walking past. But she made a step forward, and with a laugh meant to indicate friendly amusement, said, "'Let's see what's in till at any gate. The doggies away on us travels the day.' "'Deed, Mistress Catanagh,' persisted Malcolm, "'I cannot say I like to have my own fish flung in my face,' nor yet to see ill-fard tykes run away with it for my very ain. After the warning given him by Miss Horne, and the strange influence her presence had had on his grandfather, Malcolm preferred keeping up a negative quarrel with the woman. "'Dinna call ill names,' she returned. "'My dog would take it were to be called an ill-fard tyke, nor to have fish flung in his face. Let's see what's in your basket, I say.' As she spoke, she laid her hand on the basket, but Malcolm drew back, and turned away towards the gate." "'Lord save us!' she cried with a yelling laugh. "'You're not feared at an old wife like me. "'I dinna kin, maybe I and maybe no, I wouldna say. "'But I dinna want to have anything to do with you, ma'am. "'Malcolm MacPhail,' said Mrs. Cadenagh, "'lowering her voice to a hoarse whisper, "'while every trace of laughter vanished from her countenance. "'Ye ha had mare to do with me, nor ye ken. "'In Ablins ye'll have mare yet, nor ye can weel help. "'So ca canny, my man.' "'Ye may have the layin' of me out,' said Malcolm. "'But it sanna be with my wool. "'And gin I have any life left in me, I should give ye a flag. "'Ye may get a war yourself. "'I have frighted the dead for now. "'So gang your ways to Mistress Courtope, "'with a flake in your lug. "'I wish ye luck, such luck as I would wish ye.' "'Her last words sounded so like a curse "'that to overcome a cold creep, "'Malcolm had to force a laugh. "'The cook at the house bought all his fish,' for they had had none for the last few days because of the storm, and he was turning to go home by the riverside when he heard a tap on a window and saw Mrs. Courthope beckoning him to another door. "'His lordship desired me to send you to him, Malcolm, the next time you called,' she said. "'Well, ma'am, here I am,' answered the youth. "'You'll find him in the flower garden,' she said. "'He's up early today for a wonder.' He left his basket at the top of the stairs that led down the rock to the level of the burn and walked up the valley of the stream. The garden was a curious old-fashioned place, 
with high hedges and close alleys of trees, where two might have wandered long without meeting, and it was some time before he found any hint of the presence of the Marquis. At length, however, he heard voices, and following the sound, walked along one of the alleys till he came to a little arbor, where he discovered the Marquis seated, and to his surprise, the white-robed lady of the sands beside him. A great deer-hound at his master's feet was bristling his mane, and bearing his eye-teeth with a growl, but the girl had a hold of his collar. "'Who are you?' asked the Marquis, rather gruffly, as if he had never seen him before. "'I beg your lordship's pardon,' said Malcolm. "'But they telled me your lordship wanted to see me, and sent me to the flower garden Will I gang, or will I bide?' The Marquis looked at him for a moment, frowningly, and made no reply. But the frown gradually relaxed before Malcolm's modest but unflinching gaze, and the shadow of a smile slowly usurped its place. He still kept silent, however. "'Am I to gang or bide, my lord?' repeated Malcolm. "'Can't you wait for an answer?' "'As long as your lordship likes. Will I gang and walk about, ma'am, my lady, till his lordship's made up his mind? Would that please him, do you think?' he said, in the tone of one who seeks advice. But the girl only smiled, and the Marquis said, "'Go to the devil.' "'I'm on look to your lordship for the necessary directions,' rejoined Malcolm. "'Your tongue's long enough to inquire as you go,' said the Marquis. A reply in the same strain rushed to Malcolm's lips, but he checked himself in time, and stood silent, with his bonnet in his hand, fronting the two. The Marquis sat gazing as if he had nothing to say to him, but after a few moments the lady spoke, not to Malcolm, however. "'Is there any danger in boating here, Papa?' she said. "'Not more, I dare say, than there ought to be.' "'replied the Marquis listlessly. "'Why do you ask?' "'Because I should so like a row. "'I want to see how the shore looks to the mermaids. "'Well, I will take you some day, "'if we can find a proper boat.' "'Is yours a proper boat?' she asked, "'turning to Malcolm with a sparkle of fun in her eyes. "'That depends on my lord's definition of proper.' "'Definition?' repeated the Marquis. "'Is it or long a word, my lord?' asked Malcolm. "'The Marquis only smiled.' "'I ken what you mean. "'It's a strange word in a fisher-lad's mouth, you think. "'But what for should not a fisher-lad have a smattering of logic, my lord? "'For Greek or Latin there's but small opportunity of exercise in our parts. "'But for logic, a fisher-body may I hold his hand in that. "'He can I be trying it upon his wife, or his good mother, "'or upon his boat, or upon the fish when they winnot take. "'Logic would save a heap of cursing and ill words. "'Among the fisher-folk, I mean, my lord. "'Have you been to college?' "'Na, my lord, the more's the pity.' "'but I've been to the school, so never I can mine. "'Do they teach logic there?' "'A kind o' it. "'Mr. Graham sets us to try our hand whiles, "'just to make us a bit gleg, ye ken. "'You don't mean you go to school still? "'I dinna gang regular, "'but I gang as often as Mr. Graham wants me to help him, "'and I aye gather something. "'So it's schoolmaster you are as well as fisherman. Two strings to your bow. "'Who pays you for teaching?' "'Oh, nobody. "'Who would pay me for that?' "'Why, the schoolmaster.' "'No, but that would be an affront, my lord. "'How can you afford the time for nothing? "'The time comes to little, "'compared with what Mr. Graham gives me in the long four nights. "'In the winter time, you can, my lord, "'when the seas wiles or contumacious to be meddled muckle with. "'But you have to support your grandfather.' "'My grandfather would ill be pleased to hear you say it, my lord. "'He's terrible independent, "'and what with his pipes and his lamps and his shop, "'he could keep his berth. "'It's not muckle the likes of us wants.' He would not let me gang far to the fishing, so that I had the mare time to read and gang to Mr. Graham. As the youth spoke, the Marquis eyed him with apparently growing interest. "'But you haven't told me whether your boat is a proper one,' said the lady. "'Proper enough, ma'am, for what's required of her. She takes good fish. But is it a proper boat for me to have a row in?' "'Not with that going on, ma'am, as I tell you for. "'The water won't get in, will it?' "'No more than's easy gotten out again.' "'Do you ever put up a sail? "'Wiles, a wee bit of a lug sail.' "'Nonsense, Flory,' said the Marquis. "'I'll see about it.' "'Then, turning to Malcolm, "'You may go,' he said. "'When I want you, I will send for you.' "'Malcolm thought with himself "'that he had sent for him this time "'before he wanted him, "'but he made his bow and departed, "'not without disappointment, "'for he had expected the Marquis "'to say something about his grandfather "'going to the house with his pipes.' a request he would fain have carried to the old man to gladden his heart withal. Lord Lossie had been one of the boon companions of the Prince of Wales, 
considerably higher in type, it is true, yet low enough to accept usage for law, and measure his obligation by the custom of his peers. Duty merely amounted to what was expected of him, and honor, the flitting shadow of the garment of truth, was his sole divinity. Still, he had a heart, and it would speak, so long at least as the object affecting it was present. But, alas, it had no memory. Like the unjust judge, he might redress a wrong that cried to him, but, out of sight and hearing, it had for him no existence. To a man he would not have told a deliberate lie, except, indeed, a woman was in the case. But to women he had lied enough to sink the whole ship of fools. Nevertheless, had the accusing angel himself called him a liar, he would have instantly offered him his choice of weapons. There was in him by nature, however, a certain generosity which all the vice he had shared in had not quenched. Overbearing, he was not yet too overbearing to appreciate a manly carriage, and had been pleased with what some would have considered the boorishness of Malcolm's behavior, such not perceiving that it had the same source as the true aristocratic bearing, namely, a certain unselfish confidence which is the mother of dignity. He had, of course, been a spendthrift, and so much the better, being otherwise what he was, for a cautious and frugal voluptuary is about the lowest style of man. Hence he had never been out of difficulties, and when, a year or so agone, he succeeded to his brother's marquisate, he was, notwithstanding his enlarged income, far too much involved to hope any immediate rescue from them. His new property, however, would afford him a refuge from troublesome creditors. There he might also avoid expenditure for a season, and perhaps rally the forces of a dissolute life. The place was not new to him, having some twenty years before spent nearly twelve months there, of which time the recollections were not altogether unpleasant. Weighing all these things, he had made up his mind, and here he was at Lossie House. The Marquis was about fifty years of age, more worn than his years would account for, yet younger than his years in expression, for his conscience had never bitten him very deep. He was middle-sized, broad-shouldered but rather thin, with fine features of the aquiline Greek type, light blue hazy eyes, and fair hair, slightly curling and streaked with grey. His manners were those of one polite for his own sake. To his remote inferiors he was kind, would even encourage them to liberties, but might in turn take greater with them than they might find agreeable. He was fond of animals, would sit for an hour stroking the head of demon, his great Irish deerhound, but at other times would tease him to a wrath which touched the verge of dangerous. He was fond of practical jokes, and would not hesitate to indulge himself even in such as were incompatible with any genuine refinement. The sort had been in vogue in his merrier days, and Lord Lossie had ever been one of the most fertile in inventing, and loudest in enjoying them. For the rest, if he was easily enraged, he was readily appeased, could drink a great deal, but was no drunkard, and held as his creed that a god had probably made the world and set it going, but that he did not care a brass farthing, as he phrased it, how it went on, or what such an insignificant being as a man did or left undone in it. Perhaps he might amuse himself with it, he said, but he doubted it. As to men, he believed every man loved himself supremely, and therefore was in natural warfare with every other man. Concerning women, he professed himself unable to give a definite utterance of any sort, and yet, he would add, he had had opportunities. The mother of Florimel had died when she was a mere child, and from that time she had been at school until her father brought her away to share his fresh honours. She knew little, that little was not correct, and had it been, would have yet been of small value. At school she had been under many laws, and had felt their slavery, she was now in the third heaven of delight with her liberty. But the worst of foolish laws is that when the insurgent spirit casts them off, it is but too ready to cast away with them the genial self-restraint which these fretting trammels have smothered beneath them. Her father regarded her as a child, of whom it was enough to require that she should keep out of mischief. He said to himself now and then that he must find a governess for her, but as yet he had not begun to look for one. Meantime, he neither exercised the needful authority over her, nor treated her as a companion. His was a shallow nature, never very pleasantly conscious of itself except in the whirl of excitement and the glitter of crossing lights. 
with a lovely daughter by his side, he neither sought to search into her being, nor to aid its unfolding, but sat brooding over past pleasures, or fancying others yet in store for him, lost in the dull flow of life along the lazy reach to whose mire its once tumultuous torrent had now descended. But indeed, what could such a man have done for the education of a young girl? How many of the qualities he understood and enjoyed in women could he desire to see developed in his daughter? There was yet enough of the father in him to expect those qualities in her, to which in other women he had been an insidious foe. But had he not done what in him lay to destroy his right of claiming such from her? So Lady Florimel was running wild, and enjoying it. As long as she made her appearance at meals, and looked happy, her father would give himself no trouble about her. How he managed to live in those first days without company, what he thought about or speculated upon, it were hard to say. All he could be said to do was to ride here and there over the estate with his steward, Mr. Crathy, knowing little and caring less about farming or crops or cattle. He had by this time, however, invited a few friends to visit him, and expected their arrival before long. "'How do you like this dull life, Flory?' he said, as they walked up the garden to breakfast. "'Dull, Papa,' she returned. "'You never were at a girls' school, or you wouldn't call this dull. It is the merriest life in the world, to go where you like and have miles of room, and such room. It's the loveliest place in the world, Papa.' He smiled a small, satisfied smile, and stooping, stroked his demon. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen. Chapter Fourteen Meg Parton's Lamp. Malcolm went down the riverside, not over pleased with the Marquis, for although unconscious of it as such, he had a strong feeling of personal dignity. As he threaded the tortuous ways of the Seton towards his own door, he met sounds of mingled abuse and apology. Such were not infrequent in that quarter, for one of the women who lived there was a termagant, and the door of her cottage was generally open. She was known as Meg Parton. Her husband's real name was of as little consequence in life as it is in my history, for almost everybody in the fishing villages of that coast was and is known by his toe-name, or nickname, a device for distinction rendered absolutely necessary by the paucity of surnames occasioned by the persistent intermarriage of the fisherfolk. Parton is the Scotch for crab, but the immediate recipient of the name was one of the gentlest creatures in the place, and hence it had been surmised by some that, the grey mare being the better horse, the man was thus designated from the crabbedness of his wife. But the probability is he brought the agnomen with him from school, where many such apparently misfitting names are unaccountably generated. In the present case, however, the apologies were not issuing as usual from the mouth of Davy Parton, but from that of the blind piper. Malcolm stood for a moment at the door to understand the matter of contention, and prepare him to interfere judiciously. "'Gin ye suppose, piper, at ye're paid to drive folk out o' their beds at sick hours at yon, it's time the town council was informed o' your mistake,' said Meg Parton with emphasis on the last syllable. "'The good peoples up into town are not half so hard upon her as you, Mistress Parton,' insinuated poor Duncan, who, knowing himself in fault, was humble. "'And it's dare that she's paid,' he added with a bridling motion, "'and not torn here below. "'Dinna ye glorify yourself to suppose there's a fisher, let alone a fisher's wife, in all the whole seat that would lip until an old haver like you to hay them up in the morning. Haith!' I was out o' my bed or as o'er I heard the skirlin' o' your pipes. Troth, I can wail how muckle o'er air you was. But what folk takes in hand, folks should put out a hand in a proper manner, and no miss it all together like yon. And for what they say in the tone, there's Mistress Catena. Mistress Catena is a bad woman, said Duncan. I would advise you, Piper, to hold a quiet self about her. She's no to be meddled with, Mistress Catena, I can tell ye. Gin ye anger her, it'll be the war for ye. The next time ye have a lion in, she'll be raxin' ye a hairless pup, or deed maybe a stand o' bagpipes as the product. Her nane cell will not be requirin' her services, Mistress Parton. She'll be leaving that to you, if you'll excuse me," said Duncan. "Deed, you're right there, an old spaldin like you." <laughs> Malcolm judged it time to interfere, and stepped into the cottage. Duncan was seated in the darkest corner of the room, with an apron over his knees 
occupied with a tin lamp. He had taken out the wick and laid its flat tube on the hearth, had emptied the oil into a saucer, and was now rubbing the lamp vigorously. Cleanliness rather than brightness must have been what he sought to produce. Malcolm's instinct taught him to side so far with the dame concerning Mrs. Catana, and thereby turn the torrent away from his grandfather. "'Deed, you're right there, Mistress Findlay,' he said. "'She's not to be meddled with. She's no mouse. Malcolm was a favourite with Meg, as with all the women of the place. Hence she did not even start in resentment at his sudden appearance, but turning to Duncan exclaimed victoriously, "'Here till Ron are ye? He's a lad of sense!' "'Aye, here to him,' rejoined the old man with pride. "'My Malcolm will always be speaking that which will be worth the hearing with the ears. Both of you and me will be known to Mistress Catana pretty well, eh, Malcolm, my son? We'll not be trusting her fairy too much, will we, my son?' "'Not a hair, Daddy,' returned Malcolm. "'She's a doom's clever wife, though, and one you may live until in the way of her own calling,' said Meg Parton, whose temper had improved a little under the influence of the handsome youth's presence and cheery speech. "'She'll not be doubting it,' responded Duncan. "'But, ah, the woman'll be having a crim visage and a fearsome eye.' Like all the blind, he spoke as if he saw perfectly. "'Well, I a heard folk say it you bode to have the second sight,' said Mrs. Findlay laughing rudely. But, wow, it stands ye in small service, gin that be all it comes to. She's a good-natured, sonsy-looking wife, as you would see. And for her een, they're just sick likes my own. Hannah ye near done with that lamp yet? To wick of it'll be just a little out of order, answered the old man. To parents has been pulling it up with a pin from the top, and not putting it in at a hole for the purpose. And she'll be thinking you'll be clean enough to burnt part with the pin yourself, ma'am, and not with a pair of scissors she told you of, Mistress Parton. "'Go away with your nonsense!' cried Meg. "'Dar you say I didn't ken how to trim an oily lamp "'with the best blind piper ever came for the bare-legged highlands?' "'A joke's a joke, ma'am,' said Duncan, rising with dignity. "'But for a lady to make a joke of a man's bare legs is not a propriety.' "'Oh, to my house with ye!' screamed the she-parton. "'Would ye thrip upon me anything I said was less nor proper? "'And I should say what would not stand the light as whales the bare hose "'of any highland rascal that ever lap a lolland dyke!' "'Hoot toot, Mistress Finley,' interposed Malcolm, as his grandfather strode from the door. "'Ye mauna forget at he's old and blind, and all Highland folk some kittle about their legs.' "'Deal shuckle them!' exclaimed the partoness. "'What care I for his legs?' Duncan had brought the germ of this ministry of light from his native Highlands, where he had practised it in his own house, no one but himself being permitted to clean, or fill, or indeed trim the lamp. How first this came about, I do not believe the old man himself knew. But he must have had some feeling of a call to the work, for he had not been a month in Port Lossie before he had installed himself in several families as the genius of their lamps, and he gradually extended the relation until it comprehended almost all the houses in the village. It was strange and touching to see the sightless man thus busy about light for others. A marvellous symbol of faith he was, not only believing in sight, but in the mysterious and to him altogether unintelligible means by which others saw. In thus lending his aid to a faculty in which he had no share, he himself followed the trail of the garments of light, stooping ever and anon to lift and bear her skirts. He haunted the steps of the unknown power, and flitted about the walls of her temple as we mortals haunt the borders of the immortal land, knowing nothing of what lies behind the unseen veil, yet believing in an unrevealed grandeur, or shall we say he stood like the forsaken merman, who, having no soul to be saved, yet lingered and listened outside the prayer-echoing church? Only old Duncan had got farther. Though he saw not a glimmer of the glory, he yet asserted his part and lot in it, by the aiding of his fellows, to that of which he lacked the very conception himself. He was a doorkeeper in the house. Yea, by faith the blind man became even a priest in the temple of light." Even when his grandchild was the merest baby, he would never allow the gloaming to deepen into night without kindling for his behoof the brightest and cleanest of train oil lamps. The women who at first looked in to offer their services would marvel at the trio of blind man, babe, and burning lamp, and some would expostulate with him on the needless waste. But neither would he listen to their words nor accept their offered assistance in dressing or undressing the child. The sole manner in which he would consent to avail himself of their willingness to help him was to leave the baby in charge of this or that neighbor while he went his rounds with the bagpipes. When he went lamp-cleaning he always took him along with him. By this change of guardians Malcolm was a great gainer, 
for thus he came to be surreptitiously nursed by a baker's dozen of mothers, who had a fund of not very wicked amusement in the lamentations of the old man over his baby's refusal of nourishment, and his fears that he was pining away. But while they honestly declared that a healthier child had never been seen in Port Lossie, they were compelled to conceal the two satisfactory reasons of the child's fastidiousness, for they were persuaded that the truth would only make Duncan terribly jealous, and set him on contriving how at once to play his pipes and carry his baby. He had certain days for visiting certain houses and cleaning the lamps in them. The housewives had at first granted him as a privilege the indulgence of his whim, and as such alone had Duncan regarded it. But by and by, when they found their lamps burned so much better from being properly attended to, they began to make him some small return, and at length it became the custom with every housewife who accepted his services to pay him a halfpenny a week during the winter months for cleaning her lamp. He never asked for it, if payment was omitted, never even hinted at it, received what was given him thankfully, and was regarded with kindness, and indeed respect, by all. Even Mrs. Parton, as he alone called her, was his true friend. No intensity of friendship could have kept her from scolding. I believe if we could thoroughly dissect the natures of scolding women, we should find them in general not at all so unfriendly as they are unpleasant. A small trade in oil arose from his connection with the lamps, and was added to the list of his general dealings. The fisher folk made their own oil, but sometimes it would run short, and then recourse was had to Duncan's little store, prepared by himself of the best, chiefly now from the livers of fish caught by his grandson. With so many sources of income, no one wondered at his getting on. Indeed, no one would have been surprised to hear, long before Malcolm had begun to earn anything, that the old man had already laid by a trifle. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen. Chapter 15 The Slope of the Dune. Looking at Malcolm's life from the point of his own consciousness, and not from that of the so called world, it was surely pleasant enough. Innocence, devotion to another, health, pleasant labor with an occasional shadow of danger to arouse the energies leisure, love of reading, a lofty-minded friend, and above all a supreme presence, visible to his heart in the meeting of vaulted sky and outspread sea, and felt at moments in any waking wind that cooled his glowing cheek, and breathed into him anew of the breath of life. Lapped in such conditions, bathed in such influences, the youth's heart was swelling like a rosebud, ready to burst into blossom. But he had never yet felt the immediate presence of woman in any of her closer relations. He had never known mother or sister, and although his voice always assumed a different tone, and his manner grew more gentle in the presence of a woman, old or young, he had found little individually attractive amongst the fisher girls. There was not much in their circumstances to bring out the finer influences of womankind in them. They had rough usage, hard work at the curing and carrying of fish and the drying of nets, little education, and but poor religious instruction. At the same time, any failure in what has come to be specially called virtue was all but unknown amongst them, and the profound faith in women, and corresponding worship of everything essential to womanhood which essentially belonged to a nature touched to fine issues, had as yet met with no check. It had never come into Malcolm's thoughts that there were live women capable of impurity. Mrs. Catanaugh was the only woman he had ever looked upon with dislike, and that dislike had generated no more than the vaguest suspicion. Let a woman's faults be all that he had ever known in woman, he yet could look on her with reverence, and the very heart of reverence is love, whence it may be plainly seen that Malcolm's nature was at once prepared for much delight and exposed to much suffering. It followed that all the women of his class loved and trusted him, and hence, in part, it came that, absolutely free of arrogance, he was yet confident in the presence of women. The tradesmen's daughters in the upper town took pains to show him how high above him they were, and women of better position spoke to him with a kind condescension that made him feel the gulf that separated them. But to one and all he spoke with the frankness of manly freedom. But he had now arrived at that season when, in the order of things, a man is compelled to have at least a glimmer of the life which consists in sharing life with another. When once, through the thousand unknown paths of creation, 
The human being is so far divided from God that his individuality is secured, it has become yet more needful that the crust gathered around him in the process should be broken. And the love between man and woman arising from a difference deep in the heart of God and essential to the very being of each, for by no words can I express my scorn of the evil fancy that the distinction between them is solely or even primarily physical, is one of his most powerful forces for blasting the wall of separation, and first step towards the universal harmony of twain making one. That love should be capable of ending in such vermiculate results as too often appear, is no more against the loveliness of the divine idea than that the forms of man and woman, the spirit gone from them, should degenerate to such things as may not be looked upon. There is no plainer sign of the need of a god than the possible fate of love. The celestial cupido may soar aloft on seraph wings that assert his origin, or fall down on the belly of a snake and creep to hell. But Malcolm was not of the stuff of which coxcombs are made, and had not begun to think even of the abyss that separated Lady Florimel and himself, an abyss like that between star and star, across which stretches no mediating air, a blank and blind space. He felt her presence only as that of a being to be worshipped, to be heard with rapture, and yet addressed without fear. Though not greatly prejudiced in favour of books, Lady Florimel had burrowed a little in the old library at Lossie House, and had chanced on the Fairy Queen. She had often come upon the name of the author in books of extracts, and now, turning over its leaves, she found her own. Indeed, where else could her mother have found the name Florimel? Her curiosity was roused, and she resolved, no light undertaking, to read the poem through, and see who and what the Lady Florimel was. Notwithstanding the difficulty she met with at first, she had persevered, and by this time it had become easy enough. The copy she had found was in small volumes, of which she now carried one about with her wherever she wandered, and making her first acquaintance with the sea and the poem together, she soon came to fancy that she could not fix her attention on the book without the sound of the waves for an accompaniment to the verse although the gentler noise of an ever-flowing stream would have better suited the nature of Spencer's rhythm. For, indeed, he had composed the greater part of the poem with such a sound in his ears. And there are indications in the poem itself that he consciously took the river as his chosen analogue after which to model the flow of his verse. It was a sultry afternoon, and Florimel lay on the seaward side of the dune, buried in her book. The sky was foggy with heat, and the sea lay dull, as if oppressed by the superincumbent air, and leaden in hue, as if its color had been destroyed by the sun. The tide was rising slowly, with a muffled and sleepy murmur on the sand, for here were no pebbles to impart a hiss to the wave as it rushed up the bank, or to go softly hurtling down the slope with it as it sank. As she read, Malcolm was walking towards her along the top of the dune, but not until he came above almost where she lay, did she hear his step in the soft, quenching sand? She nodded kindly, and he descended, approaching her. "'Did you want me, my lady?' he asked. "'No,' she answered. "'I wasn't sure whether you nodded because you wanted me or no,' said Malcolm, and turned to reascend the dune. "'Where are you going now?' she asked. "'Oh, no gate in particular. I just came out to see how things were looking.' "'What things?' "'Oh, just the lift and the sea and sick generals.' That Malcolm's delight in the presences of nature, I say presences, as distinguished from forms and colors and all analyzed sources of her influences, should have already become a conscious thing to himself, requires to account for it the fact that his master, Graham, was already under the influences of Wordsworth, whom he had hailed as a crab that had burst his shell and spread the wings of an eagle, and the virtue passed from him to his pupil. "'I won't detain you from such important business.' said Lady Florimel, and dropped her eyes on her book. "'Gin you want my company, my lady, I can look about me just as well here as any other gate,' said Malcolm. And as he spoke, he gently stretched himself on the dune, about three yards aside and lower down. Florimel looked half amused and half annoyed, but she had brought it on herself, and would punish him only by dropping her eyes again on her book and keeping silent. She had come to the Florimel of snow, Malcolm lay and looked at her for a few moments, pondering. Then, fancying he had found the cause of her offence, rose, and, passing to the other side of her, 
again lay down, but at a still more respectful distance. "'Why do you move?' she asked, without looking up. "'Cause there's just a possible air of wind for the nor'east. "'And you want me to shelter you from it?' said Lady Florimel. "'Na, no, na, no, my lady,' returned Malcolm, laughing. "'For as bonny as ye are, ye would be but small skog. "'Shelter.' "'Why did you move, then?' persisted the girl, who understood what he said just about half. "'Well, my lady, you see it's hot, and I'm I among the fish, more or less, and I didn't ken it I was to have the honour of sitting down aside ye. So I thought you was maybe smelling the fish. It's healthy enough, but some folk doesn't like it, and for all that I ken, you grand folk's senses may be more ready to scunner than ours. Deed, my lady, we wouldn't need to be particular wiles, or it would be the war for us.' Simple as it was, the explanation served to restore her equanimity, disturbed by what had seemed his presumption and lying down in her presence. She saw that she had mistaken the action. The fact was that, concluding from her behavior she had something to say to him, but was not yet at leisure for him, he had lain down, as a loving dog might, to await her time. It was devotion, not coolness. To remain standing before her would have seemed a demand on her attention. To lie down was to withdraw and wait. But Florimel, although pleased, was only the more inclined to torment, a peculiarity of disposition which she inherited from her father. She bowed her face once more over her book, and read through three whole stanzas, without, however, understanding a single phrase in them, before she spoke. Then, looking up and regarding for a moment the youth who lay watching her with the eyes of the servants in the psalm, she said, "'Well, what are you waiting for?' "'I thought you wanted me, my lady. I beg your pardon.' "'answered Malcolm, springing to his feet and turning to go. "'Do you ever read?' she asked. "'Often that,' replied Malcolm, turning again and standing stock still. "'And I like best to read just as your ladyship's reading the know, "'lying on the sand-hill with the hell sea afore me, "'and nothing atween me and the icebergs but the water and the stars and a ween islands. "'It's like reading with Thor Eyn, that. "'And what do you read on such occasions?' carelessly drawled his persecutor. Wiles one thing and wiles another, wiles anything I can lay my hands upon. I like travels and sick like well enough, and history, gin it be not o'er dry. I do not like sermons, and there's more of them in Port Lossie than anything other. Mr. Graham, that's the schoolmaster, has a grand library, but it's most Latin and Greek, and though I like the Latin well, it's not what I would read in the face of the sea. When you're in dread of wanting a dictionary, that spoils all. Can you read Latin, then? Aye. "'What for no, my lady? I can read Virgil Midlin, and Horace's Ars Poetica. The wilk Mr. Graham says is not its right name of all, but just Epistola ad Pisones. For gin they bud to give to another, it should have been Ars Dramatica. But ladies didn't care about such things. "'You gentlemen give us no chance. You won't teach us.' "'No, my lady. Dinna begin to make game of me like my lord. I could ill bide it for him, and gin you take till his whale, I mun just hold out to your gate. I'm no gentleman.' and how o'er muckle respect for what becomes a gentleman to be pleased at being called one. But as for the Latin, I'll be proud to instruct your ladyship when you please. I'm afraid I've no great wish to learn, said Florimel. I dare say no, said Malcolm quietly, and again addressed himself to go. Do you like novels? asked the girl. I never saw a novel. There's not one among all Mr. Graham's books, and I shall warrant there's full two hundred of them. I do not believe there's a single novel in all Port Lossie. "'Don't be too sure. There are a good many in our library.' "'I had not the presumption, my lady, to count the house in Port Lassie. "'You'll have a sight of books up there, no? "'Have you never been in the library?' "'I never set foot in the house, sup in the kitchen, "'and once or twice stepping across the hall for the one door to the tither. "'I would fain see what kind of a place great folk like you bides in, "'and what kind of things, books and all, ye have about you. "'It's not easy for the like a house that has but a butt and a ben, "'outer and inner room.' "'to understand how ye fill such a muckle place as yon. "'I would be I in the library, I think. "'But,' he went on, glancing involuntarily at the dainty little foot "'that peered from under her dress, "'your ladyship's so light-footed, ye'll be o'er the hall dwellin', "'like a wee bird in a muckle cage. "'When I want room, I like it wantin' walls.' "'Once more he was on the point of going, "'but once more a word detained him. "'Do you ever read poetry?' "'Ay, sometimes, when it's old.' "'One would think you were talking about wine. "'Does age improve poetry as well? "'I ken nothing about wine, my lady. "'Miss Horne gave me a glass the other day, "'and it tasted well, 
but whether it was merum or mixtum, I could not tell mer nor a haddock. Doubtless age does gar poetry smack a wee better, but I said old only cause there's so little new poetry that I care about comes my gate. Mr. Graham's uncle taken with Mr. Wordsworth, not an ill name for a poet. Do ye can anything about him, my lady? I never heard of him. I wouldn't have given old Scots ballant for a barrowful of his. There's grand bits here and there, no doubt, but it's o'er mim mode for me. What do you mean by that? It's o'er soft and slittery like in your mould, my lady. What sort do you like, then? I like Milton Whale. You get a fine mouthful of him. I do not like the verse that you can murl out between your lips and your teeth. I like the verse that you mun open your mouth whale to let gang. Sign it's worth your while, whether you understand it or no. I don't see how you can say that. Just here, my lady. Here is a bit I came upon last night. His volant touch, instinct through all proportions, low and high, fled and pursued transverse the resonant fugue. Here till it. It's grand, even though you didn't ken what it means a bit. I do know what it means, said Florimel. Let me see. Volant means... What does volant mean? It means flame, I suppose. Well, he means some musician or other. Of course, it mun be jubile. I ken all the words but fugue, though I cannot tell what business instinct and proportions have there. It's describing how the man's fingers, playing a fugue, on the organ, I suppose. A fugue'll be some kind of a tune, then. That casts a heap of light on it, my lady. I never saw an organ. What is it like? Something like a pianoforte. But I never saw one of them, either. It's ill making things altogether out of your own head. Well, it's played with the fingers. Like this, said Florimel. And the fugue is a kind of piece where one part pursues the other. And sane, cried Malcolm eagerly, that one turns round and runs after the first. That'll be fled and pursued transverse. I have it. I have it. See, my lady, what it is to have such schooling, with music and all. The proportions, that's the relation of the notes to one another. And fugue, that comes for a fugare, to flee. Fled and pursued transverse the resonant fugue. The tain running after the tither, round and round. Aye, I have it, no. Resonant, that's echoing or resounding. But what's instinct, my lady? It mun be an adjective, I'm thinking. Although the modesty of Malcolm had led him to conclude the girl immeasurably his superior in learning, because she could tell him what a fugue was, he soon found she could help him no further, for she understood scarcely anything about grammar, and her vocabulary was limited enough. Not a doubt interfered, however, with her acceptance of the imputed superiority, for it is as easy for some to assume as it is for others to yield. "'I have it. It is an adjective,' cried Malcolm, after a short pause of thought. It's the touch that's instinct. But I fancy there should be a comma after instinct. His fingers were so used to it that they could most do the thing of themselves. Isn't it lucky, my lady, that I thought of saying it o'er to you? I'll read the book from the beginning. It's the nest to the last, I think, just to come upon the two lines in their own place, on their expecting me like, and see how grand they'll sound when a body understands them. Thank you, my lady. I suppose you read Milton to your grandfather? Aye, sometimes, in the long four nights. "'What do you mean by the four nights?' "'I mean after it's dark, and afore you gang to your bed. "'He likes the battles of the angels best. "'As soon as it comes to any fightin', "'up he gets and gang stridin' about the floor, "'and whiles he makes a clot at his claymore. "'In faith, once he must called off my head with it, "'for he had made a mistake about where I was sittin'. "'What's a claymore?' "'A muckle hale and broadsword, my lady. "'Clay for a gladius very likely, "'and more is the Gaelic for great. "'Claymore, great sword.' Blind as my grandfather is, you would swear he had fought in his day, gin ye heard how he'll got it word and whistle about his head, as gin it were a bit lay the wood. But that's very dangerous, said Florimel, something aghast at the recital. Oh, I assented Malcolm, indifferently. Gin ye would look in, my lady, I would let ye see his claymore, and his dirk, and his skein do and all. I don't think I could venture. He's too dreadful. I should be terrified at him. Dreadful, my lady. He's the quietest, kindliest old man. That is, provided you say nothing for a Connell, or again any other Highlandman. You see, he comes a Glencoe, and the Connells are just a hate to him, especially Connell a Glen Lyon, who is the worst of them all. You should hear him tell the story till his pipes, my lady. It's grand to hear him, and the poetry is all his own. End of chapter 15
Chapter Sixteen of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devora Allen. Chapter Sixteen, The Storm. There came a blinding flash, and a roar through the leaden air, followed by heavy drops mixed with huge hailstones. At the flash, Florimel gave a cry and half rose to her feet, but at the thunder, fell as if stunned by the noise on the sand. As if with a bound, Malcolm was by her side, but when she perceived his terror, she smiled, and laying hold of his hand, sprung to her feet. "'Come, come!' she cried, and still holding his hand, hurried up the dune and down the other side of it. Malcolm accompanied her step for step, strongly tempted, however, to snatch her up and run for the board crag. He could not think why she made for the road, high on an unscalable embankment, with the park wall on the other side but she ran straight for a door in the embankment itself, dark between two buttresses, which, never having seen it open, he had not thought of. For a moment she stood panting before it, while with trembling hand she put a key in the lock. The next she pushed open the creaking door and entered. As she turned to take out the key, she saw Malcolm yards away in the middle of the road and in a cataract of rain, which seemed to have with difficulty suspended itself only until the lady should be under cover. He stood with his bonnet in his hand, watching for a farewell glance. "'Why don't you come in?' she said impatiently. He was beside her in a moment. "'I didn't ken you would let me in,' he said. "'I wouldn't have you drowned,' she returned, shutting the door. "'Drowned,' he repeated. "'It would take a handle to drown me. I stuck to the bottom of a wommeled boat a whole night when I was but fifteen. They stood in a tunnel which passed under the road, affording immediate communication between the park and the shore. The further end of it was dark with trees. The upper half of the door by which they had entered was a wooden grating, for the admission of light, and through it they were now gazing, though they could see little but the straight lines of almost perpendicular rain that scratched out the colors of the landscape. The sea was troubled, although no wind blew. It heaved as with an inward unrest. But suddenly there was a great broken sound somewhere in the air, and the next moment a storm came tearing over the face of the sea, covering it with blackness innumerably rent into spots of white. Presently it struck the shore, and a great rude blast came roaring through the grating, carrying with it a sheet of rain, and, catching Florimel's hair, sent it streaming wildly out behind her. "'Dinna ye think, my lady,' said Malcolm, "'ye had better make for the house. What with the wind and the wit together, you'll be getting your death a-cold. I say gain with ye so far, gin ye'll allow me.' just to hold it on blown you away. The wind suddenly fell, and his last words echoed loud in the vaulted way. For a moment it grew darker in the silence, and then a great flash carried the world away with it, and left nothing but blackness behind. A roar of thunder followed, and even while it yet bellowed, a white face flitted athwart the grating, and a voice of agony shrieked aloud, I dinna ken where it comes frae. Florimel grasped Malcolm's arm, the face had passed close to hers, only the grating between, and the cry cut through the thunder like a knife. Instinctively, almost unconsciously, he threw his arm around her, to shield her from her own terror. "'Dinna be flayed, my lady,' he said. "'It's nothing but the mad laird. He's a quiet creature enough, only he does not ken what he comes frae. He does not ken what anything comes frae, and he cannot bide it. But he would not hurt living creature the laird.' "'What a dreadful face!' said the girl, shuddering. "'It's not an ill-fared face,' said Malcolm. "'Only the storm's frighted him by ordinary, and it's Uncle Gastly the know.' "'Is there nothing to be done for him?' she said compassionately. "'Not upon this side the grave, I doubt, my lady,' answered Malcolm. Here coming to herself, the girl became aware of her support, and laid her hand on Malcolm's to remove his arm. He obeyed instantly, and she said nothing. "'There was some speech,' he went on hurriedly, with a quaver in his voice, of putting him into the asylum at Aberdeen, and no letting him score the country this gate, they said, but it would have been sheer cruelty, for the creature likes nothing so well as running about, and does no manner of hurt. A vera bairn can guide him, and he has just as good a right to the liberty God gives him as any man alive, and mare nor a hantle. Is nothing known about him? Ah, things known about him, my lady, it's known about the Levelus. His father was the laird of Gersville, and for that matter, he's laird himself now. "'but they say he's ta'en sick as skinner at his mother, "'that he cannot bide the very word of mither. 
He just cries out when he hears it. It seems clearing, said Florimel. I doubt it's only holding up for a wee, returned Malcolm, after surveying as much of the sky as was visible through the bars. But I do think ye had better run for the house, my lady. I suggest just follow ye, a few yards ahind, till I see ye safe. Dinna ye be feared. I suggest take good care. I wouldna ha ye seen in the company o' a fisher lad like me. There was no doubting the perfect simplicity with which this was said, and the girl took no exception. They left the tunnel, and skirting the bottom of the little hill on which stood the Temple of the Winds, were presently in the midst of a young wood, through which a graveled path led towards the house. But they had not gone far ere a blast of wind, more violent than any that had preceded it, smote the wood, and the trees, young larches and birches and sycamores, bent streaming before it. Lady Florimel turned to see where Malcolm was, and her hair went from her like a maenad's, while her garments flew fluttering and straining, as if struggling to carry her off. She had never in her life before been out in a storm, and she found the battle joyously exciting. The roaring of the wind and the trees was grand, and what seemed their terrified struggles while they bowed and writhed and rose but to bow again, as in mad effort to unfix their earth-bound roots and escape, took such sympathetic hold of her imagination that she flung out her arms and began to dance and whirl, as if herself the genius of the storm. Malcolm, who had been some thirty paces behind, was with her in a moment. "'Isn't it splendid?' she cried. "'It blows well. Very near as well as my daddy,' said Malcolm, enjoying it quite as much as the girl. "'How dare you make game of such a grand uproar?' said Florimel with superiority. "'Make game of a blast of wind by comparing it to my grandfather,' exclaimed Malcolm. "'Hoot, my lady, it's a compliment to the biggest blast I ever blew to be compared to an old man like him. I'm more used to them to mind the muckle myself, except to fight with them. But when I watch the seagulls darting like arrowheads through the wind, I sometimes think it mon be grand for the angels to call about great flags o' wings and a mortal warsel with such a hurricane as this.' "'I don't understand you one bit,' said Lady Florimel petulantly. As she spoke, she went on, but the blast having abated, Malcolm lingered, to place a proper distance between them. "'You needn't keep so far behind,' said Florimel, looking back. "'As your ladyship pleases,' answered Malcolm, and was at once by her side. "'I'll gang till you tell me to stand. "'Eh, so different as you look for the other morning.' "'What morning?' "'When you were sitting at the foot of the board crag.' "'Board crag? What's that?' "'The rock with a hole through it. "'You ken the rock well enough, my lady. "'You were sitting at the foot of it, reading your book, "'as white as guinea had been made of snow. "'It came to me that the rock was the sepulchre, "'the hole, the open door of it, "'and yourself, one of the angels that had folded his wings "'and was waiting for somebody to tell the good news till, "'that he was up and away.' "'And what do I look like today?' she asked. "'Oh, the day! You look like some creature of the storm, "'or the storm itself taking a living shape, "'and the bonniest it could. "'Or maybe, like Ariel, gone afore the wind, "'with a blast in his feathers, "'ruffling them all gates at once. "'Who's Ariel?' "'Oh, the flying creature in the tempest. "'But, in your bonny southern speech, "'I dare say you would call him, or her, "'I didn't ken whilk the creature was. "'You would call it Ariel?' "'I don't know anything about him, or her, or it,' said Lady Florimel. "'You'll have all about him up in the library there, though,' said Malcolm. "'The Tempest's the only one of Shakespeare's plays that I read, "'but it's a grand one, as Maister Graham has implored me to see.' "'Oh, dear!' exclaimed Florimel. "'I've lost my book!' "'I'll gang back and look for it this minute, my lady,' said Malcolm. "'I can ilk a foot of the road we've come, "'and it's not possible but I fall in with it. "'You'll soon be home now.' "'and it'll hardly be on again afore you went in,' he added, looking up at the clouds. "'But how am I to get it? I want it very much. "'I'll just fess it up to the house, and say it I found it, where I will find it. "'But I wish you would lend me your pocket napkin to row it in, "'for I'm feared for blood in it before I get it back to you.' "'Florimel gave him her handkerchief, and Malcolm took his leave, saying, "'I'll be up in the course of a half-hour at the farthest.' "'The humble devotion and absolute service of the youth, "'resembling that of a noble dog,' however unlikely to move admiration in Lady Florimel's heart, could not fail to give her a quiet and welcome pleasure. He was an inferior who could be depended upon, and his worship was acceptable. Not a fear of his attentions becoming troublesome ever crossed her mind. The wider and more impassable the distinctions of rank, the more possible they make it for artificial minds to enter into simply human relations. The easier for the oneness of the race to assert itself, 
in the offering and acceptance of a devoted service. There is more of the genuine human in the relationship between some men and their servants than between those men and their own sons. With eyes intent, and keen as those of a gaze-hound, Malcolm retraced every step up to the grated door, but no volume was to be seen. Turning from the door of the tunnel, for which he had no sesame, he climbed to the foot of the wall that crossed it above, and with a bound, a clutch at the top, a pull and a scramble, was in the high road in a moment. From the road to the links was an easy drop, where, starting from the grated door, he retraced their path from the dune. Lady Florimel had dropped the book when she rose, and Malcolm found it lying on the sand, little the worse. He wrapped it in its owner's handkerchief, and set out for the gate at the mouth of the river. As he came up to it, the keeper, an ill-conditioned, snarling fellow, who, in the phrase of the Seton folk, read on the rigano as authority, rushed out of the lodge, and just as Malcolm was entering, shoved the gate in his face. "'Ye come not in without the leave of me,' he cried, with a vengeful expression. "'What's that for?' said Malcolm, who had already interposed his great boot, so that the spring-bolt could not reach its catch. "'There's no land-loping rascals come in here,' said Bikes, setting his shoulder to the gate. That instant he went staggering back to the wall of the lodge, with the gate after him. "'Stick to the wall there,' said Malcolm, as he strode in. The keeper pursued him with frantic abuse, but he never turned his head. Arrived at the house, he committed the volume to the cook, with a brief account of where he had picked it up begging her to inquire whether it belonged to the house. The cook sent a maid with it to Lady Florimel, and Malcolm waited until she returned, with thanks and a half-crown. He took the money, and returned by the upper gate through the town. End of chapter 16《Chapter 17 of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 The Accusation The next morning, soon after their early breakfast, the gatekeeper stood in the door of Duncan MacPhail's cottage, with a verbal summons for Malcolm to appear before his lordship. "'And I'm not to lose sight o' ye till ye'd put in your appearance,' he added. "'Sa gin ye dinna come peaceable, I'm on guard ye.' "'Where's your warrant?' asked Malcolm coolly. "'Ye would have the impudence to demand my warrant, ye young sorner,' cried Bikes indignantly. "'Come your ways, my man, or I cigar ye smart for it.' "'Hold a quiet soft and gang home for your warrant,' said Malcolm. "'It's lying there, doubtless, or you wouldn't have dared to show your face on such an errand.' Duncan, who was dozing in his chair, awoke at the sound of high words. His jealous affection perceived at once that Malcolm was being insulted. He sprang to his feet, stepped swiftly to the wall, caught down his broadsword and rushed to the door, making the huge weapon quiver and whir about his head as if it had been a slip of tin plate. "'Where is the rascal?' he shouted. "'She'll cut him down! Short the lowland thief! She'll cut him down! Who'll be insulting her Malcolm?' But Bikes, at first sight of the weapon, had vanished in dismay. "'Who too, Daddy?' said Malcolm, taking him by the arm. "'There's nobody here. The poor crater couldn't abide the saw for the claymore. He fled like the autumn wind over the stubble.' "'There's Ossian for it.' "'The Lord be praised,' cried Duncan. "'She'll be confounded her foes. "'But what would the rascal be wanting, my son?' Leading him back to his chair, Malcolm told him as much as he knew of the matter. "'Don't you go for no warrant,' said Duncan. "'If my Lord Marquis will be sending for you as one gentleman sends for another, then you go.' Within an hour, Bikes reappeared, accompanied by one of the gamekeepers, an Englishman. The moment he heard the door open, Duncan caught again at his broadsword. "'We want you, my young man,' said the gamekeeper, standing on the threshold, with Bikes peeping over his shoulder, in an attitude indicating one foot already lifted to run. "'What for?' "'That's as may appear.' "'Where's your warrant?' "'There.' "'Lay it down on the table, and gang back to the door, till I get a sclent at it,' said Malcolm. "'You're an honest man, Wool. "'but I wouldn't a lip in a snuff mull "'it had mere no one pinch into it "'with yon coward creature ahind ye. "'He was afraid of the possible consequences "'of his grandfather's indignation. "'The gamekeeper did at once as he was requested, "'evidently both amused with the bearing of the two men "'and admiring it. "'Having glanced at the paper, "'Malcolm put it in his pocket, "'and whispering a word to his grandfather, "'walked away with his captors. "'As they went to the house, "'Bikes was full of threats, 
of which he sought to enhance the awfulness by the indefiniteness. But Will told Malcolm as much as he knew of the matter, namely, that the head gamekeeper, having lost some dozen of his sitting pheasants, had enjoined a strict watch, and that Bikes, having caught sight of Malcolm in the very act of getting over the wall, had gone and given information against him. No one about the premises except Bikes would have been capable of harboring suspicion of Malcolm, and the head gamekeeper had not the slightest. But knowing that his lordship found little enough to amuse him, and anticipating some laughter from the confronting of two such opposite characters, he had gone to the Marquis with Bikes' report, and this was the result. His lordship was not a magistrate, and the so-called warrant was merely a somewhat sternly worded expression of his desire that Malcolm should appear and answer to the charge. The accused was led into a vaulted chamber opening from the hall, a genuine portion to judge from its deep, low-arched recesses, the emergence of truncated portions of two or three groins, and the thicknesses of its walls, of the old monastery. Close by the door ascended a right-angled modern staircase. Lord Lossie entered, and took his seat in a great chair in one of the recesses. "'So, you young jackanapes,' he said, half angry and half amused, "'you decline to come when I send for you, without a magistrate's warrant, forsooth. It looks bad to begin with, I must say.' "'Your lordship would never have had me come at sick a summons as that cankered toad Johnny Bikes brought me. "'Gin ye had but heard him. "'He spake as gin he had been sent to fess me to your lordship by the scruff of the neck, "'and I didn't believe your lordship would do sick a thing. "'On a gate, I wasn't going to stand that. "'You would have thought him a cornel at the smallest, and me a ween head and guts. "'But it would have guard ye laugh, my lord, to see how the body ran when my blind grandfather, "'he cannot bide anybody interfering with me, made at him with his broadsword.' "'Ye layin' rascal!' cried Bikes. "'Me feared it an old spider. "'It has na breath enough to fill the bag of his pipes. "'Ca conny, Johnny Bikes. "'Gin ye say an ill word my grandfather, "'I should gi' your neck a thraw, "'and that the minute were out of his lordship's presence.' "'Threats, my lord,' said the gamekeeper, appealing. "'And well merited,' returned his lordship. "'Well, then,' he went on, again addressing Malcolm, "'what have you to say for yourself "'in regard of stealing my brood pheasants?' Mr. Macpherson, said Malcolm, with an inclination of his head towards the gamekeeper, might have found a fitter nook to fling that dirt into. Deed, my lord, it's so ridiculous, it hardly angers me. A man it can have all the fish in the whole ocean for the taking o' them, to be sick a sneck drawn contemptible wretch as take your lordship's bonny hen creatures for their chuckies, not to mention the sin of it. It's past an honest man's denying, my lord, and Maister Macpherson kens better, for look at him laughing in his aunt's sleeve. "'Well, we've no proof of it,' said the Marquis. "'But what do you say to the charge of trespass?' "'The policies that I've been open to honest folk, my lord. "'Then where was the necessity for getting in over the wall?' "'I beg your pardon, my lord. "'You had no proof again me of that either.' "'Dare you tell me?' cried Bikes, recovering himself. "'At I didn't see you with my two een. "'Lope the dyke and eat the temple. "'Aye, and something fluttering, uncle-like bird wings in your hand. "'Oat or in, Johnny Bikes?' "'Ow, oh, oat!' "'I did look the dyke, my lord, but it was out, no in. "'How did you get in, then?' asked the Marquis. "'I get in, my lord,' began Malcolm, and ceased. "'How did you get in?' repeated the Marquis. "'Oh, there's many ways of winning in, my lord. "'The last time I came in but one, it was messed o'er the carcass of Johnny there, "'who would fain a hold me out, only he had now my blind daddy ahind him to Isla's giants.' "'And didn't ye call that breaking in?' said Bikes. "'Na, nah, there was nothing to break.' "'Sep it had been your bones, Johnny, and that would have been a pity. "'They're so good for running with.' "'You had no right to enter against the will of my gatekeeper,' said his lordship. "'What is a gatekeeper for?' "'I had a right, my lord, so long as I was upon my lady's business.' "'And what was my lady's business, pray?' questioned the Marquis. "'I found a book upon the links, my lord, which was like to be hers, "'with the two beasts that stands at your lordship's door inside the broad of it. "'And so it turned out to be when I took it up to the house. "'There's the half-crown she gave me.' Little did Malcolm think where the daintiest of pearly ears were listening, and the brightest of blue eyes looking down, half in merriment, a quarter in anxiety, and the remaining quarter in interest. On a landing halfway up the stair stood Lady Florimel, peeping over the balusters, afraid to fix her eyes upon him, lest she should make him look up. "'Yes, yes, I dare say,' acquiesced the Marquis. "'But,' he persisted, "'what I want to know is how you got in that time.' "'You seem to have some reluctance to answer the question.' "'Well, I have, my lord.' "'Then I must insist on your doing so.' "'Well, I just went on, my lord.' 
"'It was all straightforward and fair, "'and gin your lordship were in my place, "'you would not say mare yourself.' "'He's been after one of the girls about the place,' "'whispered the Marquis to the gamekeeper. "'Speer at him, my lord, gin it please your lordship, "'what it was he had in his hand when he left the park wall,' said Bikes. "'Gin it be all one till his lordship,' said Malcolm, "'without looking at Bikes. "'It would be bitter not to speer, "'for it gangs sore against me to refuse him.' "'I should like to know,' said the Marquis. "'You mon trust me, my lord, that I was after no ill. "'I gie ye my word for that, my lord.' "'But how am I to know what your word is worth?' "'returned Lord Lossie, "'well pleased with the dignity of the youth's behaviour. "'To ken what a body's word is worth, "'you mon trust him first, my lord. "'It's no muckle trust I want o' ye. "'It comes but to this, "'that I had reasons, good to me, "'and no ill to you gin ye kent them, "'for not answering your lordship's questions. "'I'm not denying a word at Johnny Bike says. "'I never heard the creature called a liar. "'He's but a cantankerous argle bargalous body, "'no fit to be a gatekeeper.' "'Sip it was upon the bin side, where most nobody gangs in or out. "'He would maybe be softer hearted till a fellow creature sign. "'Would you have him let in all the tramps in the country?' said the Marquis. "'Dale, one of them, my lord. "'But I would have him not trouble the likes of me "'if fesses the fish to your lordship's breakfast. Six no like to be after mischief.' "'There is some glimmer of sense in what you say,' returned his lordship. "'But you know it won't do to let anybody that pleases get over the park walls. "'Why didn't you go out at the gate?' "'The burn was atween me and hit, and it's a long road round. "'Well, I must lay some penalty upon you to deter others,' said the Marquis. "'Very well, my lord. So long as it's fair, I shall bide it on Groton. "'It shan't be too hard. It's just this. "'To give John Bikes the thrashing he deserves as soon as you're out of sight of the house.' "'No, nah, no, nah, my lord. I cannot do that,' said Malcolm. "'So you're afraid of him after all?' "'Feared it, Johnny Bikes, my lord. Ha, <laughs> ha! "'You threatened him a minute ago, and now when I give you leave to thrash him, you decline the honour. "'The disgrace, my lord. He's an older man, and not upon half the size. "'But, Figs, gin he says another word again, my grandfather, I will give his neck a bit thrall. "'Well, well, be off with you both,' said the Marquis, rising. "'No one heard the rustle of Lady Flormel's dress as she sped up the stair, "'thinking with herself how very odd it was to have a secret with a fisherman. "'For a secret it was.' seeing the reticence of Malcolm had been a relief to her, when she shrunk from what seemed the imminent mention of her name in the affair before the servants. She had even felt a touch of mingled admiration and gratitude when she found what a faithful squire he was, capable of an absolute obstinacy indeed where she was concerned. For her own sake, as well as his, she was glad that he had got off so well, for otherwise she would have felt bound to tell her father the whole story." and she was not at all so sure as Malcolm that he would have been satisfied with his reasons, and would not have been indignant with the fellow for presuming even to be silent concerning his daughter. Indeed, Lady Florimel herself felt somewhat irritated with him, as having brought her into the awkward situation of sharing a secret with a youth of his position. End of chapter 17《ハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッ and the day was glorious and blue and gold. Malcolm had been to Scarno's, to see his friend Joseph Mare, and was descending the steep path down the side of the promontory on his way home, when his keen eye caught sight of a form on the slope of the dune which could hardly be other than that of Lady Florimel. She did not lift her eyes until he came quite near, and then only to drop them again with no more recognition than if he had been any other of the fishermen. Already more than half inclined to pick a quarrel with him, she fancied that, presuming upon their very commonplace adventure and its resulting secret, he approached her with an assurance he had never manifested before, and her head was bent motionless over her book when he stood and addressed her. "'My lady,' he began, with his bonnet by his knee. "'Well,' she returned, without even lifting her eyes, for with the inherited privilege of her rank she could be insolent with coolness and call it to mind without remorse." "'I hope the bit bookie was not muckled aware, my lady,' he said. "'Tis of no consequence,' she replied. 
reckon it were mine, I wouldn't think so, he returned, eyeing her anxiously. Here's your ladyship's pocket napkin, he went on. I ha' keeped it ready rolled up, ever sin my daddy washed it out. It's no ill done for a blind man, as you'll see, and I ironed it myself as well as I could. As he spoke, he unfolded a piece of brown paper, disclosing a little parcel in a cover of immaculate post, which he humbly offered her. Taking it slowly from his hand, she laid it on the ground beside her with a stiff thank you, and a second dropping of her eyes that seemed meant to close the interview. "'I doubt my company's no welcome the day, my lady,' said Malcolm with trembling voice. "'But there is one thing I maun refer to. "'When I took home your ladyship's book the other day, "'you sent me half a crown by the hand of your servant lass. "'Afore her I wasn't going to disallow anything you pleased with regard to me, "'and I thought with myself it was maybe necessary for your ladyship's dignity in the look of things. "'How dare you hint at any understanding between you and me?' "'exclaimed the girl in cold anger. "'Lord, mim, what have I said to fists of a fire flit out of your bonny ain? I thought you only did it cause you wouldna like to look shabby afore the lass, no givin' anything to the lad that brought you your ain, and lippin' to me to understand that you did it but for the look of the thing, as I say. He had taken the coin from his pocket, and had been busy while he spoke rubbing it in a handful of sand, so that it was bright as new when he now offered it. You are quite mistaken, she rejoined ungraciously. You insult me by supposing I meant you to return it. Did you think I could bide to be paid for a turn to a neighbor? "'Let alone the lifting of a book to a lady,' said Malcolm with keen mortification. "'That would be to despise myself for a keel to truck. "'I like to be paid for my work, and I like to be paid well. "'But not a plaque bicycle like shall stick to my loaf. "'It can be no offence to give you back your half-crown, my lady.' "'And again he offered the coin. "'I don't in the least see why on your own principles you shouldn't take the money,' "'said the girl, with more than the coldness of an uninterested umpire. "'You worked for it, I'm sure.' first accompanying me home in such a storm, and then finding the book and bringing it back all the way to the house. Deed, my lady, sick a doctrine would take all the grace out of the earth. What would this life be worth gin all was to be paid for? I would cut my throat afore I would bide in sick a whirl. Take your half-crown, my lady, he concluded, in a tone of entreaty. But the energetic outburst was sufficing, in such her mood, only to the disgust of Lady Florimel. Do anything with the money you please. "'Only go away, and don't plague me about it,' she said freezingly. "'What can I do with what I would not pass through my fingers?' said Malcolm with the patience of deep disappointment. "'Give it to some poor creature. You know someone who'd be glad of it, I dare say. "'I can money one, my lady, whom it would will become your own bonny hand to give it till. "'But I'm not going to take credit for a liberality that would ill become me. "'You can tell how you earned it.' and profess myself disgraced by taking a reward for a born lady for what I would have done for any bigger wife in the land. No, no, my lady. Your services are certainly flattering when you put me on a level with any beggar in the country. In regard to such service, my lady, ye can well enough what I mean. Oblige me by taking back your siller. How dare you ask me to take back what I once gave? You could not account what you was doing when you gave it, my lady. Take it back, and take a hundred weight off my heart. He actually mentioned his heart. Was it to be borne by a girl in Lady Florimel's mood? I beg you will not annoy me, she said, muffling her anger in folds of distance, and again sought her book. Malcolm looked at her for a moment, then turned his face towards the sea, and for another moment stood silent. Lady Florimel glanced up, but Malcolm was unaware of her movement. He lifted his hand and looked at the half-crown gleaming on his palm. Then, with a sudden poise of his body, and a sudden fierce action of his arm, he sent the coin, swift with his heart's repudiation, across the sands into the tide. Ere it struck the water he had turned, and with long stride, but low bent head, walked away. A pang shot to Lady Florimel's heart. Malcolm, she cried. He turned instantly, came slowly back, and stood erect and silent before her. She must say something. Her eye fell on the little parcel beside her, and she spoke the first thought that came. "'Will you take this?' she said, and offered him the handkerchief. In a dazed way he put out his hand and took it, staring at it as if he did not know what it was. "'It's some sir,' he said at length, with a motion of his hands as if to grasp his head between them. 
"'You would not take even the washing of a pocket napkin from me, "'and you would gar me take a whole half-crown fra yourself. "'Mem, you're a grand lady and a bonny, "'and you had turns about you. "'Gin it were but the set of your head, "'it might gar an angel let fall what he was carrying. "'But afore I would affront one that wanted nothing on me but good will, "'I would... I would... "'Rather be the fisher lad that I am.' A weak need peroration, truly, but Malcolm was overburdened at last. He laid the little parcel on the sand at her feet, almost reverentially, and again turned. But Lady Florimel spoke again. "'It is you who are affronting me now,' she said gently. "'When a lady gives her handkerchief to a gentleman, it is commonly received as a very great favour indeed.' "'Gin I have made a mistake, my lady, I might well make it, not being a gentleman,' "'and not being used to the treatment of one. "'But I doubt gin a gentleman would have surmised "'what you was after with your napkin, "'gin ye had offered him half a crown first. "'Oh, yes, he would, perfectly,' said Florimel, "'with an air of offence. "'Then, my lady, for the first time in my life "'I wish I had been born a gentleman. "'Then I certainly wouldn't have given it you,' "'said Florimel with perversity. "'What for no, my lady? "'I do not understand ye again. "'There mun be an uncle differ atween us.' "'because a gentleman would have presumed on such a favour. "'I'm gladder nor ever it I wasna born one,' said Malcolm, "'and slowly stooping he lifted the handkerchief. "'And I was I glad of that, my lady, "'cause gin I had been, "'I would have been looking down upon working men like myself, "'as gin they weren't freely of the same flesh and blood. "'But I beg your ladyship's pardon for taking you up amiss, "'and so long as I live, "'I'll regard this as one of her feathers "'that the angel moulted as she sat by the board craig. "'And when I'm dead, "'I'll have it laid upon my face, "'and sign, maybe, I may get a sight of ye as I pass. "'Good day, my lady.' "'Good day,' she returned kindly. "'I wish my father would let me have a row in your boat.' "'It's at your service when you please, my lady,' said Malcolm. "'One who had caught a glimpse of the shining yet solemn eyes of the youth "'as he walked home, would wonder no longer that he should talk as he did, "'so sedately, yet so poetically, "'so long-windedly, if you like.' yet so sensibly, even wisely. Lady Florimel lay on the sand, and sought again to read the Fairy Queen. But for the last day or two she had been getting tired of it, and now the forms that entered by her eyes dropped half their substance and all their sense in the porch, and thronged her brain with the mere phantoms of things, with words that came and went and were nothing. Abandoning the harvest of chaff, her eyes rose and looked out upon the sea. Never, even from tropical shore, was richer-hued ocean beheld. Gorgeous in purple and green, in shadowy blue and flashing gold, it seemed to Malcolm as if at any moment the ever-new-born Anadiomene might lift her shining head from the wandering floor, and float away in her pearly luster to gladden the regions where the glaciers glide seawards in irresistible silence, there to give birth to the icebergs in tumult and thunderous uproar. But Lady Florimel felt merely the loneliness. One deserted boat lay on the long sand, like the bereft and useless half of a double shell. Without show of life the moveless cliffs lengthened far into a sea where neither white sail deepened the purple and gold, nor red one enriched it with a color it could not itself produce. Neither hope nor aspiration awoke in her heart at the sight. Was she beginning to be tired of her companionless liberty? Had the long stanzas bound by so many interwoven links of rhyme ending in long alexandrines, the long cantos, the lingering sweetness long drawn out through so many unended books, begun to weary her at last? Had even a quarrel with a fisher lad been a little pastime to her? And did she now wish she had detained him a little longer? Could she take any interest in him beyond such as she took in Demon, her father's dog, or Brazenose, his favorite horse? Whatever might be her thoughts or feelings at this moment, it remained a fact that Florimel Collinsey, the daughter of a marquis, and Malcolm, the grandson of a blind piper, were woman and man, and the man the finer of the two this time. As Malcolm passed on his way one of the three or four solitary rocks which rose from the sand, the skeleton remnants of larger masses worn down by wind, wave, and weather, he heard his own name uttered by an unpleasant voice and followed by a more unpleasant laugh. He knew both the voice and the laugh, and turning, saw Mrs. Catanagh, seated apparently busy with her knitting, in the shade of the rock. "'Will,' he said curtly, "'Will, sit ye up. 
"'Who's yon you was play actin' with out yonder? "'Who tellt ye to speer, Mistress Cottonaw? "'Ay, ay, lad, ye'll be a bon speakin' till an old wife "'after colloguin' with a young one, and sick a one. "'Isna she bonny, Malky? "'Isna hers a winsome shape and a laughin' eye? "'Didna she draw ye on and look in the hawk's ain' o' ye "'and lay herself out afore ye and... "'She did nothing of the sort, ye ill-tongued woman,' said Malcolm in anger. "'Ho, ho, trumpeted Mrs. Cattenaugh. "'Ill-tongued, am I? And what next? ill deed it, returned Malcolm, "'when ye flung my bonny salmon trot till your ugly devil of a dog. "'Ho, ho, ho, ill deed it, am I? I shall not forget the bonny names. "'Maybe your lordship would allow me the liberty of spearing another question at ye, Malcolm MacPhail. "'Ye may spear all ye like, so long as ye cannot gar me stand to hearken. "'Good day to ye, Mistress Katana. Your company was none of my seeking. "'I may leave it when I like.' "'Dinna ye be o'er sure o' that,' she called after him venomously. "'But Malcolm turned his head no more. "'As soon as he was out of sight, Mrs. Cattenaw rose, ascended the dune, "'and propelled her rotundity along the yielding top of it. "'When she arrived within speaking distance of Lady Florimel, "'who lay lost in her dreary regard of sand and sea, "'she paused for a moment, as if contemplating her. "'Suddenly, almost by Lady Florimel's side,' as if he had risen from the sand, stood the form of the mad laird. "'I dunna ken where I come frae,' he said. Lady Florimel started, half rose, and seeing the dwarf so near, and on the other side of her a repulsive-looking woman staring at her, sprung to her feet and fled. The same instant, the mad laird, catching sight of Mrs. Catana, gave a cry of misery, thrust his fingers in his ears, darted down the other side of the dune, and sped along the shore." Mrs. Cattenaugh shook with laughter. "'I have scaled the bonny doves,' she said. Then she called aloud after the flying girl, "'My lady, my bonny lady!' Florimel paid no heed, but ran straight for the door of the tunnel and vanished. Thence, leisurely climbing to the Temple of the Winds, she looked down from a height of safety upon the shore and the retreating figure of Mrs. Cattenaugh. Seating herself by the pedestal of the trumpet-blowing wind, she essayed her reading again, but was again startled, this time by a rough salute from Demon. Presently her father appeared, and Lady Florimel felt something like a pang of relief at being found there, and not on the farther side of the dune, making it up with Malcolm. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of Malcolm by George MacDonald – this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen. Chapter 19. Duncan's Pipes. A few days after the events last narrated, a footman in the Marquis's livery entered the Seton, snuffing with emphasized discomposure the air of the village, all ignorant of the risk he ran in thus openly manifesting his feelings. For the women, at least, were good enough citizens to resent any indignity offered their town. As vengeance would have it, Meg Parton was the first of whom, with supercilious airs and clippet tongue, he requested to know where a certain blind man, who played on an instrument called the bagpipes, lived. "'Spit in your loaf and call for him,' she answered, a reply of which he understood the tone and one disagreeable word. With reddening cheek, he informed her that he came on his lord's business. "'I dinna doubt it,' she retorted. "'Ye look sick like as runs other folks' errands.' "'I should be obliged if you would inform me where the man lives,' returned the lackey, with polite words in supercilious tones. "'What do you want with him, honest man?' grimly questioned the partoness, the epithet referring to Duncan, and not the questioner. "'That I shall have the honour of informing himself,' he replied. "'Well, ye can have the honour of informing yourself where he bides,' she rejoined, and turned away from her open door. All were not so rude as she, however— for he found at length a little girl willing to show him the way. The style in which his message was delivered was probably modified by the fact that he found Malcolm seated with his grandfather at their evening meal of water brose and butter, for he had been present when Malcolm was brought before the Marquis by bikes, and had in some measure comprehended the nature of the youth. It was in politest phrase, and therefore entirely to Duncan's satisfaction in regard of the manner as well as matter of the message, that he requested Mr. Duncan MacPhail's attendance on the Marquis the following evening at six o'clock, to give his lordship and some distinguished visitors the pleasure of hearing him play on the bagpipes during dessert. 
To this summons, the old man returned stately and courteous reply, couched in the best English he could command, which, although considerably distorted by Gaelic pronunciation and idioms, was yet sufficiently intelligible to the messenger, who carried home the substance for the satisfaction of his master, and what he could of the form for the amusement of his fellow servants. Duncan, although he received it with perfect calmness, was yet overjoyed at the invitation. He had performed once or twice before the late Marquis, and having ever since assumed the style of Piper to the Marquis of Lossie, now regarded the summons as confirmation in the office. The moment the sound of the messenger's departing footsteps died away, he caught up his pipes from the corner, where, like a pet cat, they lay on a bit of carpet, the only piece in the cottage, spread for them between his chair and the wall and, though cautiously mindful of its age and proved infirmity, filled the bag full, and burst into such a triumphant onset of battle, that all the children of the Seton were in a few minutes crowded about the door. He had not played above five minutes, however, when the love of finery natural to the gale, the gall, the galation, triumphed over his love of music, and he stopped with an abrupt groan of the instrument to request Malcolm to get him new streamers. Whatever his notions of its nature might be, he could not come of the Celtic race without having in him somewhere a strong faculty for colour. And no doubt, his fancy regarding it was of something as glorious as his knowledge of it must have been vague. At all events, he not only knew the names of the colours in ordinary use, but could describe many of the clan tartans with perfect accuracy. And he now gave Malcolm complete instructions as to the hues of the ribbons he was to purchase. As soon as he had started on the important mission, the old man laid aside his instrument, and taking his broadsword from the wall, proceeded with the aid of brick dust and lamp oil to furbish hilt and blade with the utmost care, searching out spot after spot of rust to the smallest with the delicate points of his great bony fingers. Satisfied at length of its brightness, he requested Malcolm, who had returned long before the operation was over, to bring him the sheath, which, for fear of its coming to pieces, so old and crumbling was the leather, he kept laid up in the drawer with his sporin and his Sunday coat, his next business, for he would not commit it to Malcolm, was to adorn the pipes with the new streamers. Asking the colour of each, and going by some principle of arrangement known only to himself, he affixed them, one after the other, as he judged right, shaking and drawing out each to its full length, with as much pride as if it had been a tone instead of a ribbon. This done, he resumed his playing, and continued it, notwithstanding the remonstrances of his grandson, until bedtime. That night he slept but little, and as the day went on grew more and more excited. Scarcely had he swallowed his twelve o'clock dinner of sowens and oatcake, when he wanted to go and dress himself for his approaching visit. Malcolm persuaded him, however, to lie down a while and hear him play, and succeeded, strange as it may seem with such an instrument, in lulling him to sleep. But he had not slept more than five minutes when he sprung from the bed, wide awake, crying, "'My boy, Malcolm, my son!' "'You have let her sleep in, and the great peoples will be impatient for her music and cursing her in their hearts.' Nothing would quiet him but the immediate commencement of the process of dressing, the result of which was, as I have said, even pathetic, from its intermixture of shabbiness and finery. The dangling brass cap tails of his sporin in front, the silver-mounted dirk on one side, with its hilt of black oak carved into an eagle's head, and the steel basket of his broadsword gleaming at the other— his great shoulder brooch of rudely chased brass, the pipes with their withered bag and gaudy streamers, the faded kilt oiled and soiled, the stockings darned in twenty places by the hands of the termagant Meg Parton, the brogues patched and patched until it would have been hard to tell a spot of the original leather, the round blue bonnet grown grey with wind and weather, the belts that looked like old harness ready to yield at a pull, his skein dew sticking out grim and black beside a knee like a lean knuckle. All combined to form a picture ludicrous to a vulgar nature, but gently pitiful to the lover of his kind. He looked like a half-moldered warrior, waked from beneath an ancient cairn, to walk about in a world other than he took it to be. Malcolm, in his commonplace Sunday suit, served as a foil to his picturesque grandfather, to whose oft-reiterated desire that he would wear the highland dress he had hitherto returned no other answer than a humorous representation of the different remarks with which the neighbours would encounter such a solecism. The whole Seton turned out to see them start. 
Men, women, and children lined the fronts and gables of the houses they must pass on their way, for everybody knew where they were going and wished them good luck. As if he had been a great bard with a henchman of his own, Duncan strode along in front, and Malcolm followed, carrying the pipes, and regarding his grandfather with a mingled pride and compassion lovely to see. But as soon as they were beyond the village the old man took the young one's arm, not to guide him, for that was needless, but to stay his steps a little, for when dressed he would, as I have said, carry no staff, and thus they entered the nearest gate of the grounds. Bikes saw them and scoffed, but with discretion, and kept out of their way. When they reached the house they were taken to the servants' hall, where refreshments were offered them. The old man ate sparingly, saying he wanted all the room for his breath, but swallowed a glass of whiskey with readiness, for although he never spent a farthing on it, he had yet a Highlander's respect for whiskey, and seldom refused a glass when offered him. On this occasion, besides, anxious to do himself credit as a piper, he was well pleased to add a little fuel to the failing fires of old age, and the summons to the dining-room being in his view long delayed, he had, before he left the hall, taken a second glass. They were led along endless passages, up a winding stone stair, across a lobby, and through room after room. "'It will be some glamour, sure, Malcolm,' said Duncan in a whisper as they went. Requested at length to seat themselves in an empty room, the air of which was filled with the sounds and odours of the neighbouring feast, they waited again through what seemed to the impatient Duncan an hour of slow vacuity. But at last they were conducted into the dining-room. Following their guide, Malcolm led the old man to the place prepared for him at the upper part of the room, where the floor was raised a step or two. Duncan would, I fancy, even unprotected by his blindness, have strode unabashed into the very halls of heaven. As he entered, there was a hush, for his poverty-stricken age and dignity told for one brief moment. Then the buzz and laughter recommenced, an occasional oath emphasizing itself in the confused noise of the talk, the gurgle of wine, the ring of glass, and the chink of china. In Malcolm's vision, dazzled and bewildered at first, things soon began to arrange themselves, the walls of the room receded to their proper distance, and he saw that they were covered with pictures of ladies and gentlemen, gorgeously attired. The ceiling rose and settled into the dim show of a sky, amongst the clouds of which the shapes of very solid women and children disported themselves, while about the glittering table, lighted by silver candelabra with many branches, he distinguished the gaily dressed company, round which, like huge ill-painted butterflies, the liveried footmen hovered. His eyes soon found the lovely face of Lady Florimel, but after the first glance he dared hardly look again. Whether its radiance had any smallest source in the pleasure of appearing like a goddess in the eyes of her humble servant, I dare not say. But more lucent she could hardly have appeared had she been the princess in a fairy tale, about to marry her much thwarted prince. She wore far too many jewels for one so young, for her father had given her all that belonged to her mother, as well as some family diamonds and her inexperience knew no reason why she should not wear them. The diamonds flashed and sparkled and glowed on a white rather than fair neck, which being very much uncollared, dazzled Malcolm far more than the jewels. Such a form of enhanced loveliness, reflected for the first time in the pure mirror of a high-toned manhood, may well be to such a youth as that of an angel with whom he has henceforth to wrestle in deadly agony until the final dawn. For lofty condition and gorgeous circumstance, while combining to raise a woman to an ideal height, ill sufficed to lift her beyond love, or shield the lowliest man from the arrows of her radiation. They leave her human still. She was talking and laughing with a young man of weak military aspect, whose eyes gazed unshrinking on her beauty. The guests were not numerous. A certain bold-faced countess, the fire in whose eyes had begun to tarnish, and the natural lines of whose figure were vanishing in expansion, the soldier, her nephew, a wasted elegance, a long, lean man who dawdled with what he ate and drank as if his bones thirsted, an elderly, broad, red-faced, bull-necked baron of the Hanoverian type, and two neighboring lairds and their wives, ordinary, and well pleased to be at the Marquis's table. Although the waiting were as many as the waited upon, Malcolm, who was keen-eyed and had a passion for service, a thing unintelligible to the common mind, soon spied an opportunity of making himself useful. 
seeing one of the men suddenly called away, set down a dish of fruit just as the countess was expecting it, he jumped up, almost involuntarily, and handed it to her. Once in the current of things, Malcolm would not readily make for the shore of inactivity. He finished the round of the table with the dish, while the men looked indignant, and the marquis eyed him queerly. While he was thus engaged, however, Duncan, either that his poor stock of patience was now utterly exhausted, or that he fancied a signal given, compressed of a sudden his full-blown waiting bag, and blasted forth such a wild howl of the pibroch that more than one of the ladies gave a cry and half started from their chairs. The marquis burst out laughing, but gave orders to stop him, a thing not to be effected in a moment, for Duncan was in full tornado, with the avenues of hearing, both corporeal and mental, blocked by his own darling utterance. Understanding at length, he ceased with the air and almost the carriage of a suddenly checked horse, looking half startled, half angry, his cheeks puffed, his nostrils expanded, his head thrown back, the port vent still in his mouth, the blown bag under his arm, and the fingers on the chanter, on the fret to dash forward again with redoubled energy. But slowly the strained muscles relaxed. He let the tube fall from his lips, and the bag descended to his lap. A man forbid, he heard the ladies rise and leave the room, and not until the gentlemen sat down again to their wine was there any demand for the exercise of his art. Now, whether what followed had been prearranged and old Duncan invited for the express purpose of carrying it out, or whether it was conceived and executed on the spur of the moment, which seems less likely, I cannot tell. But the turn things now took would be hard to believe where they dated in the present generation. Some of my elder readers, however, will, from their own knowledge of similar actions, grant likelihood enough to my record. While the old man was piping, as bravely as his lingering mortification would permit, the Marquis interrupted his music to make him drink a large glass of sherry, after which he requested him to play his loudest, that the gentleman might hear what his pipes could do. At the same time he sent Malcolm with a message to the butler about some particular wine he wanted. Malcolm went more than willingly, but lost a good deal of time from not knowing his way through the house. When he returned, he found things frightfully changed. As soon as he was out of the room, and while the poor old man was blowing his hardest, in the fancy of rejoicing his hearers with the glorious music of the highland hills, one of the company, it was never known which, for each merrily accused the other, took a penknife, and going softly behind him, ran the sharp blade into the bag and made a great slit, so that the wind at once rushed out, and the tune ceased without sob or wail. Not a laugh betrayed the cause of the catastrophe. In silent enjoyment, the conspirators sat watching his movements. For one moment Duncan was so astounded that he could not think. The next he laid the instrument across his knees, and began feeling for the cause of the sudden collapse. Tears had gathered in the eyes that were of no use but to weep withal, and were slowly dropping. "'She was afraid, my lord and gentlemen's,' he said with a quavering voice, "'that her bag will be near her latter end, but she believed she would be living beyond her name cell, my gentlemen's.' He ceased abruptly, for his fingers had found the wound, and were prosecuting an inquiry. They ran along the smooth edges of the cut, and detected treachery. He gave a cry like that of a wounded animal, flung his pipes from him, and sprang to his feet, but forgetting a step below him, staggered forward a few paces and fell heavily. That instant Malcolm entered the room. He hurried in consternation to his assistance. When he had helped him up and seated him again on the steps, the old man laid his head on his boy's bosom, threw his arms around his neck, and wept aloud. "'Malcolm, my son,' he sobbed, "'Duncan is wronged in the halls of the stranger. "'Dale have stabbed his best friend to the heart, "'and, oh, on, oh, on, "'she'll be all too blind to take vengeance. "'Malcolm, son of heroes, "'draw to claim or of the bard "'and fall upon the traitors. "'She'll be singing you to onset, "'for the pebrock is no more.' His quavering voice rose that instant in a fierce though feeble chant, and his hand flew to the hilt of his weapon. Malcolm, perceiving from the looks of the men that things were as his grandfather had divined, spoke indignantly. "'Ye ought to take shame to call yourselves gentlefolk, and play a poor blind man who was doing his best to please ye second ill-fired trick.' As he spoke, 
They made various signs to him not to interfere, but Malcolm paid them no heed, and turned to his grandfather, eager to persuade him to go home. They had no intention of letting him off yet, however. Acquainted, probably through his gamekeeper, who laid himself out to amuse his master, with the piper's peculiar antipathies, Lord Lossie now took up the game. "'It was too bad of you, Campbell,' he said, "'to play the good old man such a dog's trick.' At the word Campbell, the piper shook off his grandson, and sprang once more to his feet, his head thrown back, and every inch of his body trembling with rage. "'She might have known!' he screamed, half choking, "'that a cursed dog of a Carmel was in it!' He stood for a moment, swaying in every direction, as if the spirit within him doubted whether to cast his old body on the earth in contempt of its helplessness, or to fling it headlong on his foes. For that one moment, silence filled the room. "'You needn't attempt to deny it. It really was too bad of you, Glenlyon,' said the Marquis. A howl of fury burst from Duncan's laboring bosom. His broadsword flashed from its sheath, and brokenly panting out the words, "'Glenlyon! De great duffel! "'Have I been drinking with the hellhound Glenlyon?' "'He would have run a melee muck through the room with his huge weapon. "'But he was already struggling in the arms of his grandson, "'who succeeded at length in forcing from his bony grasp "'the hilt of the terrible claymore. "'But as Duncan yielded his weapon, Malcolm lost his hold on him. "'He darted away, caught his dirk, a blade of unusual length, "'from its sheath, and shot in the direction of the last word he had heard. "'Malcolm dropped the sword and sprung after him. "'Give her the villain by the throat!' screamed the old man. "'She'll stab his bag! She'll cut his tranter in two! She'll be doing it! "'Who but a great-grandson of Invergin should be cut in the throat of the dog Glen Lyon?' "'As he spoke, he was running wildly about the room, "'brandishing his weapon, knocking over chairs, "'and sweeping bottles and dishes from the table. "'The clatter was tremendous, "'and the smile had faded from the faces of the men "'who had provoked the disturbance. "'The military youth looked scared.' The Hanoverian pig cheeks were the color of lead. The long, lean man was laughing like a skeleton. One of the lairds had got on the sideboard, and the other was making for the door with the bell rope in his hand. The Marquis, though he retained his coolness, was yet looking a little anxious. The butler was peeping in at the door, with red nose and pale cheekbones, the handle in his hand, in instant readiness to pop out again, while Malcolm was after his grandfather intent upon closing with him. The old man had just made a desperate stab at nothing half across the table, and was about to repeat it, when, spying danger to a fine dish, Malcolm reached forward to save it. But the dish flew in splinters, and the dirk, passing through the thick of Malcolm's hand, pinned it to the table, where Duncan, fancying he had at length stabbed Glenlyon, left it quivering. "'Dear Glenlyon,' he said, and stood trembling in the ebb of passion, and murmuring to himself something in Gaelic. Meantime, Malcolm had drawn the dirk from the table and released his hand. The blood was streaming from it, and the Marquis took his own handkerchief to bind it up. But the lad indignantly refused the attention, and kept holding the wound tight with his left hand. The butler, seeing Duncan stand quite still, ventured with scared countenance to approach the scene of destruction. "'Dinna gang near him!' cried Malcolm. "'He has a skein do yet, and in grips that's worst of all.' Scarcely were the words out of his mouth when the black knife was out of Duncan's stocking and brandished aloft in his shaking fist. "'Daddy!' cried Malcolm. "'You would not kill two Glen Lyons in one day, would you?' "'She would, my son Malcolm. Fifty of the poor is in one breath. They are the children of wrath, and they have to be destructioned.' "'For an old man ye killed enough for one night,' said Malcolm, and gently took the knife from his trembling hand. "'You mun come home, then all. "'Is the dog dead, then?' "'asked Duncan eagerly. "'Oh, na, nah, he's breathing yet,' answered Malcolm. "'She'll not can go till the dog will be dead. "'The dog may want more killin.' "'What a horrible savage,' said one of the lairds, "'a justice of the peace. "'He ought to be shut up in a madhouse.' "'Can you sit about shutting up, sir, or my lord? "'I can a wilk. "'You'll had to begin near at home,' said Malcolm, "'as he stooped to pick up the broadsword "'and so complete his possession of the weapons.' "'and you'll please to hold in mind "'that none here is an injured man but my grandfather himself.' "'Hey,' said the Marquis, "'what do you make of all my dishes?' "'Deed, my lord, you may comfort yourself "'that they were not dishes with brains in them, "'for suck some scarce in the house of Lossie.' "'You're a long-tongued rascal,' said the Marquis. 
A long tongue may whiles be as canny as a long spoon, my lord, and ye ken what that's for. The Marquis burst into laughter. What do you make, then, of that horrible cut in your own hand? asked the magistrate. I make my own business of it, answered Malcolm. While this colloquy passed, Duncan had been feeling about for his pipes. Having found them, he clasped them to his bosom like a hurt child. "'Come home, come home,' he said. "'Your own bard has revenged you.' Malcolm took him by the hand and led him away. He went without a word, still clasping his wounded bagpipes to his bosom. "'You'll hear from me in the morning, my lad,' said the Marquis in a kindly tone, as they were leaving the room. "'I have no wish to hear anything more, your lordship. "'You had done a knock this night, my lord, "'to make ye ashamed of yourself to your dying day. "'Gin ye had any poor shame left in ye.' "'The military youth muttered something about insolence "'and made a step towards him. "'Malcolm quitted his grandfather "'and stepped again into the room. "'Come on,' he said. "'No, no,' interposed the Marquis. "'Don't you see the lad is hurt?' "'Let him come on,' said Malcolm. "'I have one sewn hand. "'Here, my lord,' "'Take the weapons, or the old man'll get a grip of them again.' "'I tell you no!' shouted Lord Lossie. "'Fred, get out, will you?' The young gentleman turned on his heel, and Malcolm led his grandfather from the house without further molestation. It was all he could do, however, to get him home. The old man's strength was utterly gone. His knees bent trembling under him, and the arm which rested on his grandson's shook as with an ague fit. Malcolm was glad indeed when at length he had him safe in bed by which time his hand had swollen to a great size, and the suffering grown severe. Thoroughly exhausted by his late fierce emotions, Duncan soon fell into a troubled sleep, whereupon Malcolm went to Meg Parton, and begged her to watch beside him until he should return, informing her of the way his grandfather had been treated, and adding that he had gone into such a rage that he feared he would be ill in consequence, and if he should be unable to do his morning's duty, it would almost break his heart." Eh, said the partoness in a whisper, as they parted at Duncan's door. A bad temper is a frightsome thing. I'm sure the times I had told him it would be the ruin of him. To Malcolm's gentle knock, Miss Horne's door was opened by Jean. What do you want at such an untimious hour, she said, when honest folks all in their nightcaps? I want to see Miss Horne, gin you please, he answered. I so warrant she'll be in her bed and snoring, said Jean, but I so gang and see. Ere she went, however, Jean saw that the kitchen door was closed, for whether she belonged to the class Honest Folk or not, Mrs. Catena was in Miss Horne's kitchen, and not in her nightcap. Jean returned presently with an invitation for Malcolm to walk up to the parlour. "'I have gotten a small Miss Hunter, Miss Horne,' he said, as he entered, "'and I thought I couldn't do better than come to you, "'cause ye can hold your tongue, and that's more nor many one in the port of Port Lossie can, ma'am.' The compliment, correct in fact as well as honest in intent, was not thrown away on Miss Horne, to whom it was the more pleasing that she could regard it as a just tribute. Malcolm told her all the story, rousing thereby a mighty indignation in her bosom, a great fire in her hawk nose, and a succession of wild flashes in her hawk eyes. But when he showed her his hand, "'Lord, Malcolm,' she cried, "'it's a mercy I was made wanton feelings, or I couldn't have bide the sight.' "'My poor bairn!' "'Then she rushed to the stair and shouted, "'Jean, ye limmer! "'Jean, fess some hot water and some linen clothes!' "'I had none a neither,' replied Jean from the bottom of the stair. "'Make up the fire and put on some water directly. "'I so find some clothes,' she added, turning to Malcolm. "'Gin I should drive the tail frae my best Sunday sark.' "'She returned with rags enough for a small hospital, "'and until the grumbling Jean brought the hot water,' They sat and talked in the glimmering light of one long-beaked tallow candle. "'It's a terrible house, Yona Lossie,' said Miss Horne, "'and there has been terrible things done into it. "'The old Marcus was an ill man. "'I dare not say what he wouldn't have done, "'gin half the tales be true at they tell him, "'and the last one was little better. "'This one wouldn't be so ill, "'but it's clear that he's tarred with the same stick.' "'I do not think he means anything muckle amiss,' agreed Malcolm, whose wrath had by this time subsided a little, through the quieting influences of Miss Horne's sympathy. He's mere thoughtless, I do believe, than ill-contrived, and all for his fun. He spake uncle kind to me after hein, but I couldn't accept it, you see, after the way he had sared my daddy. But wouldn't ye have thought he was old enough to kin better by this time? 
"'An old fool is the worst fool of all,' said Miss Horne. "'But nothing of that kind, be it as mad and pranksome as ever sick ploy could be, "'is to be made mention o' aside the things that was muttered of his brother. "'I'd but not come o'er them till a young lad like yourself. "'They were never said straight out, mind ye, but just minded at like, "'with a don't draw the brows and a wee side shake of the head, "'as gin the body would say, I could tell ye again I dare.' but I doubt myself gin anything was kent, though muckle was mare nor suspected. And where there's reek, there mun be fire. As she spoke, she was doing her best, with many expressions of pity, for his hand. When she had bathed and bound it up and laid it in a sling, he wished her good night. Arrived at home, he found, to his dismay, that things had not been going well. Indeed, while yet several houses off, he had heard the voices of the parton's wife and his grandfather in fierce dispute. The old man was beside himself with anxiety about Malcolm, and the woman, instead of soothing him, was opposing everything he said and irritating him frightfully. The moment he entered, each opened a torrent of accusations against the other, and it was with difficulty that Malcolm prevailed on the woman to go home. The presence of his boy soon calmed the old man, however, and he fell into a troubled sleep in which Malcolm, who sat by his bed all night, heard him at intervals, now lamenting over the murdered of Glencoe, now exulting in a stab that had reached the heart of Glenlyon, and now bewailing his ruined bagpipes. At length, towards morning, he grew quieter, and Malcolm fell asleep in his chair. End of chapter 19《by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen. Chapter 20. Advances. When he woke, Duncan still slept, and Malcolm having got ready some tea for his grandfather's, and a little brose for his own breakfast, sat down again by the bedside, and awaited the old man's waking. The first sign of it that reached him was the feebly uttered question, "'Will the dog be dead, Malcolm?' "'As sure as ye stab at him,' answered Malcolm. "'Then she'll be getting herself ready,' said Duncan, making a motion to rise. "'What for, Daddy?' "'For the hanging, my son,' answered Duncan coolly. "'Time enough for that, Daddy, when they send to tell ye,' returned Malcolm, cautious of revealing the facts of the case. "'Very good,' said Duncan, and fell asleep again. In a little while he woke with a start. "'She'll be having an evil dream, my son Malcolm,' he said. "'Or it was'll be more than a dream. Kamala Glenlyon, God curse him, came to her bedside, and he'll say to her, "'MacDonnell,' he said, "'for being a dead man he would be known my name. "'MacDonnell,' he said, "'what did you'll be meaning by dirking my posterity?' And she answered and said to him, I pray it had been yourself, you damned Glen Lyon. And he said to me, It'll be no good wishing that. It would be doing you no good to dirk me, for I'm a dead man. And a damned man, says herself, and would have taken him by the trot, but she couldn't move. Well, I'm not so sure of that, says he, for I've pegged all their pardons. And did they give them to you, you dog, says herself? Well, I'm not sure says he. Anyhow, I'm not damned very much yet. She'll be much sorry to hear it, says herself. And she took care always to be calling him some bad name, so that he shouldn't say she'll be forgiving him, whatever the rest of them might be doing. But what troubles me, said he, it'll not be about myself at all. That'll be a wonder, says her name sel. And what may it be about, you cutthroat? "'It'll be about yourself,' says he. "'About herself?' "'Yes, about yourself,' says he. "'I'm sorry for you, "'for the thing that's to be done with him that killed a man "'all because he bore my name, "'and he was not a son of mine at all. "'There is no pot in hell deep enough to put him in. "'Then they must make haste and dig one,' says herself, "'for she'll be hanged in a day or two. "'So she'll wake up, and behold, it was a dream. And no sick an ill dream after all, Daddy, said Malcolm. Not an evil dream, my son, 
when it makes her almost wish that she hadn't been quite killing the dog. Last night she would have made a boy of his skin like any other dog's skin, and today, no, my son, it was a very evil dream. And to be told that the great devil, Glen Lyon herself, was not very much damned, it was a very evil dream, my son. Well, Daddy, maybe you'll take it for ill news, but you killed nobody. Did she not drive her dirk into the dog? cried Duncan fiercely. Oh, con, oh, con, then she's ashamed of herself forever when she might have done it, and it'll have to be done yet. He paused a few moments and then resumed. And she'll not be going to be hanged. Maybe that will be better for you wouldn't have liked to see your old grandfather to be hanged, Malcolm, my son. Not that she would have minded it herself in such a good cause, Malcolm. But she didn't be very happy after she did think she had done it, for you see he wasn't the fairy man his own self, and that must be counted. But she did kill something. What was it, Malcolm? You sent a grand dish flying, answered Malcolm. I so warrant it cost a pound to judge by the gold upon it. She'll hear a noise of breaking, but she did stab something soft. You stuck your dirk into my lord's mahogany table, said Malcolm. It not a good rug to haul it out. Then her arm has not lost all its strength, Malcolm. I pray the table had been the ribs of Glenlyon. You mauna pray no such prayers, Daddy. Mine upon what Glenlyon said to you last night. Gin I was you, I would not have a pot howked express for my sail, down yonner in yon place that you dreamed about. Well, I'll forgive him a little, Malcolm. Not the one that's dead, but the one that didn't do it, you know. But how will she be forgiving him for ripping her poor bag? Oh, Con, oh, Con, no more musics for her dying days, Malcolm. Oh, Con, oh, Con, I shall go creeping to the grave with no loud noises to defy the enemy. Her pipes is dumb forever and ever. Oh, con, oh, con. The lengthening of his days had restored bitterness to his loss. I'll soon set the bag right, Daddy. Or gin I cannot do that, we'll get a new one. Money a pibrach will come skirling out of that chanter yet, it all be done. They were interrupted by the unceremonious entrance of the same footman who had brought the invitation. He carried a magnificent set of ebony pipes, with silver mountings. "'A present from my lord the Marquis,' he said bumptiously, almost rudely, and laid them on the table. "'Dinna lay them there. Take them frae that, or I'll fling them your puthered wig,' said Malcolm. "'It's a stand of pipes,' he added. "'And that a grand one, Daddy.' "'Take them away,' cried the old man, in a voice too feeble to support the load of indignation it bore." "'She'll be taking no presents from Marquis or Duke "'that would be deceiving old Duncan "'and making him drink with the cursed Glen Lyon. "'Tell the Marquis he'll be sending her grey hairs "'with sorrow to the grave, "'for she'll be dishonoured forever and henceforth.' "'Probably pleased to be the bearer of a message "'fraught with so much amusement, "'the man departed in silence with the pipes. "'The Marquis, although the joke had threatened "'and indeed so far taken a serious turn,' had yet been thoroughly satisfied with its success. The rage of the old man had been to his eyes ludicrous in the extreme, and the anger of the young one so manly as to be even picturesque. He had even made a resolve, half dreamy and of altogether improbable execution, to do something for the fisher fellow. The pipes which he had sent as a salatium to Duncan were a set that belonged to the house, ancient, and in the eyes of either connoisseur or antiquarian, exceedingly valuable. But the Marquis was neither the one nor the other, and did not in the least mind parting with them. As little did he doubt a propitiation through their means, was utterly unprepared for a refusal of his gift, and was nearly as much perplexed as annoyed thereat. For one thing, he could not understand such offence taken by one in Duncan's lowly position, for although he had plenty of highland blood in his own veins, he had never lived in the highlands, and understood nothing of the habits or feelings of the gale. What was noble in him, however, did feel somewhat rebuked, and he was even a little sorry at having raised a barrier between himself and the manly young fisherman, to whom he had taken a sort of liking from the first. Of the ladies in the drawing-room, 
to whom he had recounted the vastly amusing joke with all the graphic delineation for which he had been admired at court, none, although they all laughed, had appeared to enjoy the bad recital thoroughly, except the bold-faced countess. Lady Florimel regarded the affair as undignified at the best, was sorry for the old man, who must be mad, she thought, and was pleased only with the praises of her squire of low degree. The wound in his hand the Marquis either thought too trifling to mention, or serious enough to have clouded the clear sky of frolic under which he desired the whole transaction to be viewed. They were seated at their late breakfast when the lackey passed the window on his return from his unsuccessful mission, and the Marquis happened to see him, carrying the rejected pipes. He sent for him, and heard his report, then with a quick nod dismissed him, his way when angry, and sat silent. "'Wasn't it spirited? In such poor people, too,' said Lady Florimel, the colour rising in her face, and her eyes sparkling. "'It was damned impudent,' said the Marquis. "'I think it was damned dignified,' said Lady Florimel. The Marquis stared. The visitors, after a momentary silence, burst into a great laugh. "'I wanted to see,' said Lady Florimel calmly, "'whether I couldn't swear if I tried. "'I don't think it tastes nice. "'I shan't take to it, I think.' "'You'd better not in my presence, my lady,' said the Marquis, "'his eyes sparkling with fun. "'I shall certainly not do it out of your presence, my lord,' she returned. "'Now I think of it,' she went on, "'I know what I will do. "'Every time you say a bad word in my presence, "'I shall say it after you. "'I shan't mind who's there, parson or magistrate.' "'Now you'll see. "'You will get into the habit of it.' "'Except you get out of the habit of it first, Papa,' said the girl, laughing merrily. "'You confounded little Amazon,' said her father. "'But what's to be done about those confounded pipes?' she resumed. "'You can't allow such people to serve you so. "'Return your presence, indeed. "'Suppose I undertake the business. "'By all means, what will you do? "'Make them take them, of course.' "'It would be quite horrible never to be quits with the old lunatic. "'As you please, Puss. "'Then you put yourself in my hands, Papa. "'Yes, only you must mind what you're about, you know.' "'That I will, and make them mine, too,' she answered, "'and the subject was dropped. "'Lady Florimel counted upon her influence with Malcolm, "'and his again with his grandfather. "'But careful of her dignity, she would not make direct advances. "'She would wait an opportunity of speaking to him.' But, although she visited the Sand Hill almost every morning, an opportunity was not afforded her. Meanwhile, the state of Duncan's bag and of Malcolm's hand forbidding, neither pipes were played nor gun was fired to arouse Marquis or Burgess. When a fortnight had thus passed, Lady Florimel grew anxious concerning the justification of her boast, and the more so that her father seemed to avoid all reference to it. End of chapter 20《ハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッ nor did she forget that the unpiped silence of the royal borough was the memento of a practical joke of her father, so cruel that a piper would not accept the handsome propitiation offered on its account by a marquis. On a lovely evening, therefore, the sunlight lying slant on waters that heaved and sunk in a flowing tide, now catching the gold on lifted crests, now losing it in purple hollows, Lady Florimel found herself, for the first time, walking from the lower gate towards the Seton. Rounding the west end of the village, she came to the seafront, where, encountering a group of children, she requested to be shown the blind piper's cottage. Ten of them started at once to lead the way, and she was presently knocking at the half-open door, through which she could not help seeing the two at their supper of dry oat cake and still drier skim milk cheese, with a jug of cold water to wash it down. Neither, having just left the gentlemen at their wine, could she help feeling the contrast between the dinner just over at the house and the meal she now beheld? At the sound of her knock, Malcolm, who was seated with his back to the door, rose to answer the appeal. The moment he saw her, 
the blood rose from his heart to his cheek in similar response. He opened the door wide, and in low, something tremulous tones, invited her to enter, then caught up a chair, dusted it with his bonnet, and placed it for her by the window, where a red ray of the setting sun fell on a huge flowered hydrangea. Her quick eye caught sight of his bound-up hand. "'How have you hurt your hand?' she asked kindly. Malcolm made signs that prayed for silence, and pointed to his grandfather, but it was too late. "'Hurt your hand, Malcolm, my son!' cried Duncan, with surprise and anxiety mingled. "'How will you be doing that?' "'Here's a bonny young lady come to see you, Daddy,' said Malcolm, seeking to turn the question aside. "'She'll be very glad to see de bonny young lady, and she's greatly obliged for de honour. But if de bonny young lady will be excusing her, what'll be hurting your hand, Malcolm?' "'I'll tell you after hein, Daddy. This is my Lady Florimel, frae the house. Hm, said Duncan, the pain of his insult keenly renewed by the mere mention of the scene of it. But, he went on, continuing aloud the reflections of a moment of silence, she'll be a lady, and it's not to be laid to her charge. Sit down, my lady. De poor place is your own. But Lady Florimel was already seated, and busy in her mind as to how she could best enter on the object of her visit. The piper sat silent, revolving a painful suspicion with regard to Malcolm's hurt. "'So you won't forgive my father, Mr. Macphail,' said Lady Florimel. "'She would forgive any man but two men,' he answered. "'Clen Lyon, and a man, whoever he might be, who would put upon her the disgrace of drinking in his company.' "'But you're quite mistaken,' said Lady Florimel in a pleading tone. "'I don't believe my father knows the gentleman you speak of.' "'Gentlemen!' echoed Duncan. "'He is a dog. "'No, he is no dog. "'Dogs is good. "'He is a mongrel of a fox and a wolf.' "'There was no Campbell at our table that evening,' "'persisted Lady Florimel. "'Then who told Duncan Macphail a lie?' "'It was nothing but a joke, indeed,' said the girl, "'beginning to feel humiliated. "'It was a bad joke, "'and might have been the hanging of poor Duncan,' "'said the piper.' Now Lady Florimel had heard a rumour of someone having been hurt, hurt in the affair of the joke, and her quick wits instantly brought that and Malcolm's hand together. It might have been, she said, risking a miss for the advantage. It was well that you hurt nobody but your own grandson. Oh, my lady, cried Malcolm with despairing remonstrance, and me holding it frae him all this time. You should have considered an old man's feelings. He's as blind as a mole, my lady. His feelings! retorted the girl angrily. He ought to know the mischief he does in his foolish rages. Duncan had risen, and was now feeling his way across the room. Having reached his grandson, he laid hold of his head and pressed it to his bosom. Malcolm, he said, in a broken and hollow voice, not to be recognized as his. Malcolm, my eagle of the crag, my heart of the heather, was it yourself she stabbed with her evil hand, my son? Did she be hurting her own boy? She'll never wear Dirk more. Oh, hon, oh, hon. He turned, and with bowed head seeking his chair, seated himself and wept. Lady Florimel's anger vanished. She was by his side in a moment, with her lovely young hand on the bony expanse of his as it covered his face. On the other side, Malcolm laid his lips to his ear and whispered with soothing expostulation, It's most as weel as ever, Daddy. It's none the wear. It was but a bit of a skirt. It's no worth twice thinking of. The dirk went through it, Malcolm. It went into the table. She knows now. Oh, Malcolm, Malcolm, would to God she had killed herself before she hurted her boy. He made Malcolm sit down beside him, and taking the wounded hand in both of his, sunk into a deep silence, utterly forgetful of the presence of Lady Florimel, who retired to her chair kept silence also, and waited. "'It was not a good joke,' he murmured at length, "'upon an honest man, and might be calling herself a gentleman. "'A rage is not a joke. "'To put her in a rage was not good. "'See to it, and it was a very bad joke, too, "'to make a big hole in her poor bag. "'Oh, Cohn, oh, Cohn. "'But I'm glad Glenlyon was not there,' for she was too blind to kill him. But you will surely forgive my father when he wants to make it up. 
"'Those pipes have been in the family for hundreds of years,' said Florimel. "'Her own pipes has been in her own family for five or six generations at least,' said Duncan. "'And she was wondering why her boy didn't be mending her bag. "'My poor boy! Oh, Cone! Oh, Cone!' "'We'll get a new bag, Daddy,' said Malcolm. "'It's been long past menin with old age.' "'And then you will be able to play together,' urged Lady Florimel. Duncan's resolution was visibly shaken by the suggestion. He pondered for a while. At last he opened his mouth solemnly, and said, with the air of one who had found a way out of a hitherto impassable jungle of difficulty, "'If her Lord Marquis will come to Duncan's house, and say to Duncan it was but a joke and he is sorry for it, then Duncan will shake hands with the Marquis and take the pipes.' A smile of pleasure lighted up Malcolm's face at the proud proposal. Lady Florimel smiled also, but with amusement. "'Will my lady take Duncan's message to my lord de Marquis?' asked the old man. Now Lady Florimel had inherited her father's joy in teasing, and the thought of carrying him such an overture was irresistibly delightful. "'I will take it,' she said. "'But what if he should be angry?' "'If her lord be angry, Duncan is angry too.' "'answered the piper. "'Malcolm followed Lady Florimel to the door. "'Put it as soft as ye can, my lady,' he whispered. "'I cannot bide to anger folk mair than mon be. "'I shall give the message precisely as your grandfather gave it to me,' "'said Florimel, and walked away. "'While they sat at dinner the next evening, "'she told her father from the head of the table "'all about her visit to the piper, "'and ended with the announcement of the condition, "'word for word,' on which the old man would consent to a reconciliation. Could such a proposal have come from an equal whom he had insulted, the Marquis would hardly have waited for a challenge. To have done a wrong was nothing. To confess it would be disgrace. But here the offended party was of such ludicrously low condition, and the proposal therefore so ridiculous, that it struck the Marquis merely as a yet more amusing prolongation of the joke. Hence his reception of it was with uproarious laughter, in which all his visitors joined. "'Damn the old windbag!' said the Marquis. "'Damn the knife that made the mischief!' said Lady Florimel. When the merriment had somewhat subsided, Lord Michaelham, the youth of soldierly aspect, would have proposed whipping the Highland beggar, he said, were it not for the probability the old clothes horse would fall to pieces. Whereupon Lady Florimel recommended him to try it on the young fisherman, who might possibly hold together, whereat the young lord looked both mortified and spiteful. I believe some compunction, perhaps even admiration, mingled itself, in this case, with Lord Lossie's relish of an odd and amusing situation, and that he was inclined to compliance with the conditions of atonement, partly for the sake of mollifying the wounded spirit of the Highlander. He turned to his daughter and said, "'Did you fix an hour, Flory, for your poor father to make amende honorable?' "'No, Papa, I did not go so far as that.' The Marquis kept a few moments' grave silence. "'Your lordship is surely not meditating such a solecism,' said Mr. Morrison, the Justice Laird. "'Indeed I am,' said the Marquis. "'It would be too great a condescension,' said Mr. Cavins, "'and your lordship will permit me to doubt the wisdom of it. "'These fishermen form a class by themselves. "'They are a rough set of men, and only too ready to despise authority.' "'You will not only injure the prestige of your rank, my lord, "'but expose yourself to endless imposition. "'The spirit moves me, and we are commanded not to quench the spirit,' "'rejoined the Marquis with a merry laugh, "'little thinking that he was actually describing what was going on in him, "'that the spirit of good concerning which he jested "'was indeed not working in him, but gaining on him in his resolution of that moment. "'Come, Flory,' said the Marquis, "'to whom it gave a distinct pleasure to fly in the face of advice.' We'll go at once and have it over. So they set out together for the Seton, followed by the bagpipes, carried by the same servant as before, and were received by the overjoyed Malcolm and ushered into his grandfather's presence. Whatever may have been the projected attitude of the Marquis, the moment he stood on the piper's floor, the generosus, that is the gentleman in him, got the upper hand, and his behavior to the old man was not polite merely, but respectful. At no period in the last twenty years had he been so nigh the kingdom of heaven as he was now when making his peace with the blind piper. 
When Duncan heard his voice, he rose with dignity, and made a stride or two towards the door, stretching forth his long arm to its full length, and spreading wide his great hand with the brown palm upwards. "'Her name cell will be proud to see my lord Marquis under her roof,' he said. The visit itself had already sufficed to banish all resentment from his soul. The Marquis took the proffered hand kindly. "'I have come to apologize," he said. "'Not one word more, my lord, I beg,' interrupted Duncan. "'My lord has come out of his goodness to bring her a great gift, "'for he'll be hearing of the sad accident which befell her poor pipes one evening lately. "'Day was very old, my lord, and easily hurt.' "'I am sorry,' said the Marquis, but again Duncan interrupted him. "'I am glad, my lord,' he said, "'for it brings me to great joy.' If my lady and your lordship will honour her poor house by sitting down, she will have the pleasure of be offering them a little music. His hospitality would give them of the best he had, but ere the entertainment was over, the Marquis judged himself more than fairly punished by the pipes for all the wrong he had done the piper. They sat down, and at a sign from his lordship, the servant placed his charge in Duncan's hands and retired. The piper received the instrument with a proud gesture of gratification felt it all over, screwed at this and that for a moment, then filled the great bag gloriously full. The next instant a scream invaded the astonished air fit to rival the skirl produced by the tozy tyke of Kirk Alloway. Another instant, and the piper was on his legs, as full of pleasure and pride as his bag of wind, strutting up and down the narrow chamber like a turkey cock before his hens, and turning ever, after precisely so many strides, with a grand gesture and mighty sweep, as if he too had a glorious tail to mind, and was bound to keep it ceaselessly quivering to the tremor of the reed in the throat of his chanter. Malcolm, erect behind their visitors, gazed with admiring eyes at every motion of his grandfather. To one who had from earliest infancy looked up to him with reverence, there was nothing ridiculous in the display, in the strut, in all that to other eyes too evidently revealed the vanity of the piper. Malcolm regarded it all only as making up the orthodox mode of playing the pipes. It was indeed well that he could not see the expression upon the faces of those behind whose chairs he stood, while for moments that must have seemed minutes they succumbed to the wild uproar which issued from those splendid pipes. On an opposite hillside, with a valley between, it would have sounded poetic. In a charging regiment, none could have wished for more inspiriting battle strains. Even in a great hall, inspiring and guiding the merry reel, it might have been in place and welcome. But in a room of ten feet by twelve, with a wooden ceiling, acting like a drumhead, at the height of seven feet and a half, it was little below torture to the Marquis and Lady Florimel. Simultaneously they rose to make their escape. "'My lord and my lady mon be goin', daddy,' cried Malcolm. Absorbed in the sound which his lungs created and his fingers modulated, the piper had forgotten all about his visitors. But the moment his grandson's voice reached him, the tumult ceased. He took the port vent from his lips, and with sightless eyes turned full on Lord Lossie, said in a low, earnest voice, "'My lord, she'll be the grandest stand o' pipes she ever blew, and proud and thankful she'll be to her lord Marquis, and to the lord lords for the gift. The pipe shall go down from generation to generation to the end of time. Yes, my lord,' until the loud cry of them be drunk in the roar of the trump of the great archangel, when he'll be setting one foot on the land and the other foot upon the sea, and Glen Lyon shall be cast into the lake of fire. He ended with a low bow. They shook hands with him, thanked him for his music, wished him good night, and with a kind nod to Malcolm, left the cottage. Duncan resumed his playing the moment they were out of the house, and Malcolm, satisfied of his well-being for a couple of hours at least, he had been music-starved so long, went out also, in quest of a little solitude. End of chapter 21「Chapter 22 of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen. Chapter 22. Whence and Whither? He wandered along the shore on the land side of the mound, with a favourite old book of Scottish ballads in his hand, every now and then stooping to gather a sea anemone, a white flower something like a wild geranium, with a faint, sweet smell, or a small, short-stalked harebell, 
or a red daisy as large as a small primrose. For along the coast there, on cliff or in sand, on rock or in field, the daisies are remarkable for size, and often not merely tipped, but dyed throughout with a deep red. He had gathered a bunch of the finest, and had thrown himself down on the side of the dune, whence, as he lay, only the high road, the park wall, the temple of the winds, and the blue sky were visible. The vast sea, for all the eye could tell, was nowhere. Not a ripple of it was to be seen, but the ear was filled with the night gush and flow of it. A sweet wind was blowing, hardly blowing, rather gliding like a slumbering river from the west. The sun had vanished, leaving a ruin of gold and rose behind him, gradually fading into dull orange and lead and blue sky and stars. There was light enough to read by, but he never opened his book. He was thinking over something Mr. Graham had said to him a few days before, namely, that all impatience of monotony, all weariness of best things even, are but signs of the eternity of our nature, the broken human fashions of the divine everlastingness. "'I dinna ken where it comes frae,' said a voice above him. He looked up. On the ridge of the mound, the whole of his dwarfed form relieved against the sky and looking large in the twilight, stood the mad laird, reaching out his forehead towards the west, with his arms expanded as if to meet the ever-coming wind. "'Nebody kens where the wind comes frae, or where it gangs till,' said Malcolm. "'You're not a hair war off nor other folk there, laird.' "'Does it come frae a good place, or frae an ill?' said the laird, doubtingly. "'It's soft and kindly in the fine of it,' returned Malcolm suggestively, rising and joining the laird on the top of the dune, and like him spreading himself out to the western air. The twilight had deepened, merging into such night as the summer in that region knows, a sweet, pale memory of the past day. The sky was full of sparkles of pale gold in a fathomless blue. There was no moon. The darker sea lay quiet below, with only a murmur about its lip, and fitfully reflected the stars. The soft wind kept softly blowing. Behind them shone a light at the harbor's mouth, and a twinkling was here and there visible in the town above but all was as still as if there were no life, save in the wind and the sea and the stars. The whole feeling was as if something had been finished in heaven, and the outmost ripples of the following rest had overflowed, and were now pulsing faintly and dreamily across the bosom of the laboring earth, with feeblest suggestion of the mighty peace beyond. Alas, words can do so little. Even such a night is infinite. I answered the laird, but it makes me don't for it like in the inside. Some of the best things does that, said Malcolm. I think a kiss from my mother would guard me greet. He knew the laird's peculiarities well, but in the thought of his mother had forgotten the antipathy of his companion to the word. Stuart gave a moaning cry, put his fingers in his ears, and glided down the slope of the dune seawards. Malcolm was greatly distressed. He had a regard for the laird far beyond pity, and could not bear the thought of having inadvertently caused him pain. But he dared not follow him, for that would be but to heighten the anguish of the tortured mind and the suffering of the sickly frame. For when pursued, he would accomplish a short distance at an incredible speed, then drop suddenly, and lie like one dead. Malcolm therefore threw off his heavy boots, and starting at full speed along the other side of the dune, made for the board Craig, his object being to outrun the laird without being seen by him, and so, doubling the rock, return with leisurely steps and meet him. Sweetly the west wind whistled about his head as he ran. In a few minutes he had rounded the rock, towards which the laird was still running, but now more slowly. The tide was high and came near its foot, leaving but a few yards of passage between, in which space they approached each other, Malcolm with sauntering step as if strolling homewards. Lifting his bonnet, a token of respect he never omitted when he met the mad laird, he stood aside in the narrow way. Mr. Stewart stopped abruptly, took his fingers from his ears, and stared in perplexity. "'It's a right bonny night, Laird,' said Malcolm. The poor fellow looked hurriedly behind him, then stared again, then made gestures backward, and next pointed at Malcolm with rapid pokes of his forefinger. Bewilderment had brought on the impediment in his speech, and all Malcolm could distinguish in the babbling efforts at utterance which followed were the words, "'Two of them! Two of them!' Two of them, often and hurriedly repeated. "'It's a fine, soft, sleeked wind, Laird,' said Malcolm, as if they were meeting for the first time that night. 
I think at mon comfre the blue there, a yont the stars. There's a heap o' wonderful things there, they tell me, and whiles a stroke and win, and whiles a rosy smell, and whiles a bright light, and whiles, they say, an old yearnin' song will break out, and wonner away a dawn, and gang flittin' and fleein' among the sair hearts of the men and women folk that cannot get things puttin' right. I think there are two fools of them, said the Marquis, referring to the words of the laird. He was seated with Lady Florimel on the town side of the rock, hidden from them by one sharp corner. They had seen the mad laird coming, and had recognized Malcolm's voice. I dinna ken whar I come frae, burst from the laird, the word whar drawn out and emphasized almost to a howl, and as he spoke he moved on again, but gently now, towards the rocks of the Scarnos. Anxious to get him thoroughly soothed before they parted, Malcolm accompanied him. They walked a little way side by side in silence, the laird every now and then heaving his head like a fretted horse towards the sky, as if he sought to shake the heavy burden from his back, straighten out his poor twisted spine, and stand erect like his companion. I, Malcolm began again, as if he had in the meantime been thinking over the question, and was now assured upon it. The wind mon comfre yont the stars, for dinna ye mind, laird, ye was at the kirk last Sunday, wasna ye? The laird nodded an affirmative, and Malcolm went on. And dinna ye hear the minister read frae the book at how ilka good and ilka perfect gift was frae a bun, and kem frae the father o' lights? Father o' lights, repeated the laird, and looked up at the stars. I dinna ken where I come frae. I had na father. I have only a... I have only a woman. The moment he had said the word, he began to move his head from side to side, like a scared animal seeking where to conceal itself. The father o' lights is your father, and mine. The father o' all of us, said Malcolm. Of all good folk, I dare say, said the laird, with a deep and quivering sigh. Mr. Graham says, of all buddy, returned Malcolm, good and ill. Are the good to hold them good and make them better? Are the ill to make them good? Egg, and that were true, said the laird. They walked on in silence for a minute. All at once the laird threw up his hands, and fell flat on his face on the sand, his poor hump rising skywards above his head. Malcolm thought he had been seized with one of the fits to which he was subject, and knelt down beside him to see if he could do anything for him. Then he found he was praying. He heard him. He could but just hear him, murmuring over and over, all but inaudibly, Father o' lights, Father o' lights, Father o' lights. It seemed as if no other word dared mingle itself with that cry. Maniac or not, the mood of the man was supremely sane, and altogether too sacred to disturb. Malcolm retreated a little way, sat down in the sand, and watched beside him. It was a solemn time, the full tide lapping up on the long yellow sand from the wide sea, darkening out to the dim horizon, the gentle wind blowing through the molten darkness, overhead the great vault without arch or keystone, of dim liquid blue, and sown with worlds so far removed they could only shine, and on the shore, the center of all the cosmic order, a misshapen heap of man, a tumulus in which lay buried a live and lovely soul. The one pillar of its chapter-house had given way, and the down-rushing ruin had so crushed and distorted it, that thenceforth, until some resurrection should arrive, disorder and misshape must appear to it the law of the universe, and loveliness but the passing dream of a brain glad to deceive its own misery, and so to fancy it had received from above what it had itself generated of its own poverty from below. To the mind's eye of Malcolm, the little hump on the sand was heaved to the stars, higher than ever Roman tomb or Egyptian pyramid, in silent appeal to the sweet heavens, a dumb prayer for pity, a visible groan for the resurrection of the body. For a few minutes he sat as still as the prostrate laird. But bethinking himself that his grandfather would not go to bed until he went back, also that the laird was in no danger, as the tide was now receding, he resolved to go and get the old man to bed and then return. For somehow he felt in his heart that he ought not to leave him alone. He could not enter into his strife to aid him, or come near him in any closer way than watching by his side until his morning dawned, or at least the waters of his flood assuaged. Yet what he could he must. He would wake with him in his conflict. 
he rose and ran for the board craig, through which lay the straight line to his abandoned boots. As he approached the rock, he heard the voices of Lord Lossie and Lady Florimel, who, although the one had not yet verified her being, the other had almost ruined his, were nevertheless enjoying the same thing, the sweetness of the night, together. Not hearing Malcolm's approach, they went on talking, and as he was passing swiftly through the boar, he heard these words from the Marquis. "'The world's an ill-baked cake, Flory, and all that a woman at least can do is to cut as large a piece of it as possible for immediate use.' The remark being a general one, Malcolm cannot be much blamed if he stood with one foot lifted to hear Florimel's reply. "'If it's an ill-baked one, Papa,' she returned, "'I think it would be better to cut as small a piece of it as will serve for immediate use.' Malcolm was delighted with her answer, never thinking whether it came from her head or her heart, for the two were at one in himself. As soon as he appeared on the other side of the rock, the Marquis challenged him. "'Who goes there?' he said. "'Malcolm MacPhail, my lord.' "'You rascal,' said his lordship, good-humouredly. "'You've been listening.' "'No, Muckle, my lord. I heard but a word apiece, and I'm on say my lady had the best of the logic.' "'My lady generally has, I suspect,' laughed the Marquis. "'How long have you been in the rock there?' "'Not a minute, my lord. I fling off my boots to run after a friend, and that's how you didn't hear me come up. I'm going after them, no, to gang home in them. Good night, my lord. Good night, my lady.' He turned and pursued his way, but Florimel's face, glimmering through the night, went with him as he ran. He told his grandfather how he had left the mad laird lying on his face, on the sands between the board craig and the rocks of the promontory, and said he would like to go back to him. "'He'll be having a fit, poor man,' said Duncan. "'Yes, my son, you must go to him and do your best for him. After such an honour as we've had this day, we mustn't be forgetting our poor neighbours. Will you be taken to him a drop of the Ishkabeha? "'He takes nothing of that kind,' said Malcolm. He could not tell him that the madman, as men called him, lay wrestling in prayer with the Father of Lights. The old Highlander was not irreverent, but the thing would have been unintelligible to him. He could readily have believed that the supposed lunatic might be favoured beyond ordinary mortals, that at that very moment, lost in his fit, he might be wrapped in a vision of the future, a wave of time, far off as yet from the souls of other men, even now rolling over his. But that a soul should seek after vital content by contact with its maker— was an idea belonging to a region which, in the Highlander's being, lay as yet an unwatered desert, an undiscovered land, whence even no faintest odour had been wafted across the still air of surprised contemplation. About the time when Malcolm once more sped through the board craig, the Marquis and Lady Florimel were walking through the tunnel on their way home, chatting about a great ball they were going to give the tenants. He found the laird where he had left him, and thought at first he must now surely be asleep. But once more bending over him, he could still hear him murmuring at intervals, Father Lights! Father Lights! Not less compassionate, and more sympathetic than Eliphaz or Bildad or Zophar, Malcolm again took his place near him, and sat watching by him until the grey dawn began in the east. Then all at once the laird rose to his feet, and without a look on either side, walked steadily away towards the promontory. Malcolm rose also, and gazed after him until he vanished amongst the rocks, no motion of his distorted frame witnessing other than calmness of spirit. So his watcher returned in peace through the cool morning air to the side of his slumbering grandfather. No one in the Seton of Port Lossie ever dreamed of locking door or window at night. End of chapter 22《Chapter Twenty Three of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devora Allen. Chapter Twenty Three Armageddon. The home season of the herring fishery was to commence a few days after the occurrences last recorded. The boats had all returned from other stations, and the little harbor was one crowd of stumpy masts, each with its halyard the sole cordage visible, rove through the top of it, for the hoisting of a lug-sail, tanned to a rich red-brown. From this underwood towered aloft the masts of a coasting schooner, discharging its load of coal at the little quay. Other boats lay drawn up on the beach in front of the Seton, and beyond it on the other side of the burn. 
Men and women were busy with the brown nets, laying them out on the short grass of the shore, mending them with netting needles like small shuttles, carrying huge burdens of them on their shoulders in the hot sunlight. Others were mending, caulking, or tarring their boats, and looking to their various fittings. All was preparation for the new venture in their own waters, and everything went merrily and hopefully. Wives who had not accompanied their husbands now had them home again, and their anxieties would henceforth endure but for a night. Joy would come with the red sails in the morning. Lovers were once more together. The one great dread broken into a hundred little questioning fears. Mothers had their sons again, to watch with loving eyes as they swung their slow limbs at their labor, or in the evening sauntered about, hands in pockets, pipe in mouth, and blue bonnet cast carelessly on the head. It was almost a single family, bound together by a network of intermarriages, so intricate as to render it impossible for anyone who did not belong to the community to follow the threads or read the design of the social tracery. And while the Setons swarmed with the goings-on of life, the town of Port Lossie lay above it, still as a country hamlet, with more odors than people about. Of people it was seldom indeed that three were to be spied at once in the wide street, while of odors you would always encounter a smell of leather from the saddler's shop, and a mingled message of bacon and cheese from the very general dealers, in whose window hung what seemed three hams, and only he who looked twice would discover that the middle object was no ham, but a violin, while at every corner lurked a scent of gilly flowers in southern wood. Idly supreme, Port Lossie the Upper, looked down in condescension, that is, in half-concealed contempt, on the ant-heap below it. The evening arrived on which the greater part of the boats was to put off for the first essay. Malcolm would have made one in the little fleet, for he belonged to his friend Joseph Mare's crew, had it not been found impossible to get the new boat ready before the following evening. Whence, for this one more, he was still his own master, with one more chance of a pleasure for which he had been on the watch ever since Lady Florimel had spoken of having a row in his boat. True, it was not often she appeared on the shore in the evening. Nevertheless, he kept watching the dune with his keen eyes, for he had hinted to Mrs. Courthope that perhaps her young lady would like to see the boats go out. Although it was the fiftieth time his eyes had swept the links in vague hope, he could hardly believe their testimony when now at length he spied a form, which could only be hers, looking seaward from the slope, as still as a sphinx on Egyptian sands. He sauntered slowly towards her by the landward side of the dune, gathering on his way a handful of the reddest daisies he could find, then, ascending the sandhill, approached her along the top. "'Saw ye ever sick goins in your life, my lady,' he said, holding out his posy. "'Is that what you call them?' she returned. "'Oh, I am a lady. Daisies, ye call them. I didn't ken but yours is the bonnier name of the two. Can it be what Mr. Graham tells me the old poet Chaucer makes it?' "'What is that?' "'Oh, just the een of the day. The day's eyes, ye ken. They're small een for sick a great face, but sign there's a lot of them to make up for that. They've begun to close already, but the mare they close, the bonnier they look, with their bits of screwed-up moeys.' "'But saw ye ever sick red ones, or any sick a size, my lady?' "'I don't think I ever did. "'What is the reason they are so large and red?' "'I dinna ken. "'There canna be muckle nourishment in sick a thin soil, "'but there maun be something that agrees with them. "'It's the same all round about here.' "'Lady Florimel sat looking at the daisies, "'and Malcolm stood a few yards off "'watching for the first of the red sails, "'which must soon show themselves, "'creeping out on the ebb tide.' Nor had he waited long before a boat appeared, then another and another, six huge oars, ponderous to toil withal, urging each from the shelter of the harbour out into the wide, weltering plain. The fishing boat of that time was not decked as now, and each, with every lift of its bows, revealed to their eyes a gaping hollow, ready, if a towering billow should break above it, to be filled with sudden death. One by one the whole fleet crept out, and ever as they gained the breeze, up went the red sails and filled. Aside leaned every boat from the wind, and went dancing away over the frolicking billows towards the sunset, its sails, deep-dyed in oak bark, shining redder and redder in the growing redness of the sinking sun. Nor did Port Lossie alone send out her boats, like huge seabirds warring on the live treasures of the deep. From beyond the headlands east and west, 
out they glided on slow red wing. From Scarnos, from Sandand, from Clamrock, from the villages all along the coast, spreading as they came, each to its work apart through all the laborious night, to rejoin its fellows only as home drew them back in the clear grey morning, laden and slow with the harvest of the stars. But the night lay between, into which they were sailing over waters of heaving green that forever kept tossing up roses, a night whose curtain was a horizon built up of steady blue, but gorgeous with passing purple and crimson, and flashing with molten gold. Malcolm was not one of those to whom the sea is but a pond for fish, and the sky a storehouse of wind and rain, sunshine and snow. He stood for a moment gazing, lost in pleasure. Then he turned to Lady Florimel. She had thrown her daisies on the sand, appeared to be deep in her book, and certainly caught nothing of the splendour before her beyond the red light on her page. "'Saw ye ever a bonnier sight, my lady?' said Malcolm. She looked up and saw, and gazed in silence. Her nature was full of poetic possibilities, and now a formless thought foreshadowed itself in a feeling she did not understand. Why should such a sight as this make her feel sad? The vital connection between joy and effort had begun from afar to reveal itself with the question she now uttered. "'What is it all for?' she asked dreamily, her eyes gazing out on the calm ecstasy of colour, which seemed to have broken the bonds of law and ushered in a new chaos, fit matrix of new heavens and new earth. "'To catch Heron, answered Malcolm, ignorant of the mood that prompted the question, and hence mistaking its purport. But a falling doubt had troubled the waters of her soul, and through the ripple she could descry it settling into form. She was silent for a moment. "'I want to know,' she resumed, "'why it looks as if some great thing were going on. Why is all this pomp and show? Something ought to be at hand. All I see is the catching of a few miserable fish.' If it were the eve of a glorious battle now, I could understand it. If those were the little English boats rushing to attack the Spanish Armada, for instance, but they are only gone to catch fish. Or if they were setting out to discover the Isles of the West, the country beyond the sunset. But this jars. I cannot answer ye all at once, my lady, said Malcolm. I mun take time to think about it, but I ken brawly what ye mean. Even as he spoke, he withdrew and descending the mound, walked away beyond the board crag, regardless now of the far lessening sails and the sinking sun. The motes of the twilight were multiplying fast as he returned along the shore side of the dune, but Lady Florimel had vanished from its crest. He ran to the top. Thence, in the dim of the twilight, he saw her slow retreating form, phantom-like, almost at the grated door of the tunnel, which, like that of a tomb, appeared ready to draw her in, and yield her no more. "'My lady! My lady!' he cried. "'When are you bide for it?' He went bounding after her like a deer. She heard him call, and stood holding the door half open. "'It's the battle of Armageddon, my lady!' he cried, as he came within hearing distance. "'The battle of what?' she exclaimed, bewildered. "'I really can't understand your savage Scotch. Hoot, my lady! The battle of Armageddon's not one of the Scots' battles.' It's the battle between the right and the wrong, that you read about in the Book of the Revelations. What on earth are you talking about? returned Lady Florimel in dismay, beginning to fear that her squire was losing his senses. It's just what you was saying, my lady. Sick a pomp as yon bode to hang upon a grand battle, some gate or other. What has the catching of fish to do with a battle in the Revelations? said the girl, moving a little within the door. Well, my lady, gin I took it in hand to set it forth to you, I would have to tell you all that Mr. Graham has been learning me, so never I can mind. He says that the whole economy of nature is fashioned uncle like that of the kingdom of heaven. It's just a gradation of services, and the highest end of any animal is to contribute to the life of one higher than itself, so that it's the grand privilege of the fish we take to be eaten by human beings and uphold what's upon them. That's a poor consolation to the fish, said Lady Florimel. How can ye that, my lady? You can tell near hand as little about the heart of a heron, sick as it has, as the heron can tell about your own. Whilk, I'm thinking, mun be of the largest size. How should you know anything about my heart, pray? she asked, 
with more amusement than offence. "'Just by my own,' answered Malcolm. Lady Florimel began to fear she must have allowed the fisher lad more liberty than was proper, seeing he dared avow that he knew the heart of a lady of her position by his own. But indeed Malcolm was wrong, for in the scale of hearts Lady Florimel's was far below his. She stepped quite within the door, and was on the point of shutting it, but something about the youth restrained her, exciting at least her curiosity. His eyes glowed with a deep, quiet light, and his face, even grand at the moment, had a greater influence upon her than she knew. Instead, therefore, of interposing the door between them, she only kept it poised, ready to fall to the moment the sanity of the youth should become a hair's breadth more doubtful than she already considered it. "'It's all part of one thing, my lady,' Malcolm resumed. "'The heron's like the folk it carries the mate and the powder and sick like, for them it does the fighting. The heart of the living man's the place where the battle's fought, and it's aye going on and on there between God and Satan, and the fish they hold folk up to it.' "'Do you mean that the herrings help you to fight for God?' said Lady Florimel, with a superior smile. "'Either for God or for the devil, my lady. That depends upon the folk themselves. I say it holds them up to fight, and the thing mon be fought out. Folk to fight, mon live, and the heron holds the life in them, and so the catching of the heron comes in to be a part of the battle. "'Wouldn't it be more sensible to say that the battle is between the fishermen and the sea, for the sake of their wives and children?' "'suggested Lady Florimel supremely. "'Na, my lady, it wouldna be half so sensible, "'for it wouldna justify the grandeur that hangs o'er the fight. "'The battle with the sea is no so muckle of an affair. "'Indeed, gin it weren't that the wives and the very weans "'had themselves to fight in the same battle a good nail, "'I didn't see the muckle differ there would be "'atween them and the fish, "'nor what for they sudna eat one another "'as the creatures in the water do. "'But gin it be the battle, I say, "'there can be no pomp a sea or sky or grand for it. And it's a weel word, can it but hold the good ones merry and strong, and up to their work. For that, weel may the sun shine a celestial rosy red, and weel may the boaty row, and weel may the stars look down, blinkin' and lookin' again, ilk one doin' its bonny part to make a man a right-hearted, good-willed soldier. And, pray, what may be your rank in this wonderful army? asked Lady Florimel, with the air and tone of one humouring a lunatic. "'I'm nothing but a raw recruit, my lady. "'But can I had my choice, I would be piper to my regiment.' "'How do you mean?' "'I would make songs. "'Dinna laugh at me, my lady, "'for they're the best kind of weapon for the work I can. "'But I'm not a maker, "'and mon content myself with doing my work.' "'Then why,' said Lady Florimel, "'with the conscious right of social superiority "'to administer good counsel, "'why don't you work harder "'and get a better house and wear better clothes?' Malcolm's mind was so full of far other and weightier things that the question bewildered him. But he grappled with the reference to his clothes. "'Deed, my lady,' he returned, "'ye may well say that, seeing ye was never aboard a herring-boat. But gin ye once saw the inside o' one full of fish, what a body gang slitterin' about, maybe up to the middle his leg and whamlin' herring, and the next minute, maybe, wet to the skin with a splash of a muckled jaw, ye might think the clothes good enough for the work. Though, ill-fit, I confess with shame, "'to come afore your ladyship.' "'I thought you only fished about close by the shore in a little boat. "'I didn't know you went with the rest of the fishermen. "'That's very dangerous work, isn't it?' "'No or dangerous, my lady. "'There's some gangs down ilka season, but it's all in the way of your work. "'Then how is it you're not gone fishing tonight? "'She's a new boat, and there's another day's work on her before we went out. "'Wouldn't you like a row the night, my lady? "'No, certainly. It's much too late.' "'It'll be none marker nor tis. "'But I reckon you're right. "'I came o'er by just to see whether you wouldn't like to gang with the boats a bit. "'But your ladyship set me off thinking, and that put it out of my head. "'It's too late now, anyhow. "'Come tomorrow evening, and I'll see if I can't go with you.' "'I canna, my lady. "'That's the fash o' it. "'I'm on gang with Blue Peter the morn's night. "'It was my last chance, I'm sorry to say.' "'It's not of the slightest consequence,' Lady Florimel returned. "'And bidding him good night.' she shut and locked the door. The same instant she vanished, for the tunnel was now quite dark. Malcolm turned with a sigh and took his way slowly homeward along the top of the dune. All was dim about him, dim in the heavens, where a thin veil of grey had gathered over the blue, dim on the ocean, where the stars swayed and swung in faint flashes of dissolving radiance, cast loose like ribbons of seaweed. Dim all along the shore, 
where the white of the breaking wavelet melted into the yellow sand, and dim in his own heart, where the manner and words of the lady had half hidden her starry reflex with a chilling mist. End of chapter 23《Chapter Twenty Four of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devora Allen. Chapter Twenty Four, The Feast. To the entertainment which the Marquis and Lady Florimel had resolved to give, all classes and conditions in the neighbourhood now began to receive invitations. Shopkeepers, they are called merchants, and all socially above them, individually by notes in the name of the Marquis and Lady Florimel, but in the handwriting of Mrs. Crathy and her daughters, and the rest generally by the sound of bagpipes and proclamation from the lips of Duncan MacPhail. To the satisfaction of Johnny Bikes, the exclusion of improper persons was left in the hands of the gatekeepers. The thing had originated with the factor. The old popularity of the lords of the land had vanished utterly during the life of the Marquis's brother, and Mr. Crathy, being wise in his generation, sought to initiate a revival of it by hinting the propriety of some general hospitality, a suggestion which the Marquis was anything but loath to follow. For the present Lord Lossie, although as unready as most men to part with anything he cared for, could yet cast away magnificently, and had always greatly prized a reputation for liberality. For the sake of the fishermen, the first Saturday after the commencement of the home-fishing was appointed. The few serious ones, mostly Methodists, objected on the ground of the proximity of the Sunday, but their attitude was, if possible, of still less consequence in the eyes of their neighbours that it was well known they would in no case have accepted such an invitation. The day dawned propitious. As early as five o'clock Mr. Crathy was abroad, booted and spurred, now directing the workmen who were setting up tents and tables, now conferring with house-steward, butler, or cook, now mounting his horse and galloping off to the home farm or the distillery, or into the town to the lossy arms, where certain guests from a distance were to be accommodated, and whose landlady had undertaken the superintendence of certain of the victualling departments. For canny Mr. Crathy would not willingly have the meanest guest ask twice for anything he wanted. So invaluable did he consider a good word from the humblest quarter. And the best labours of the French cook, even had he reverenced instead of despising Scotch dishes, would have ill sufficed for the satisfaction of appetites critically appreciative of hotchpotch, sheep's head, haggis, and black puddings. The neighbouring nobility and landed gentlemen, the professional guests also, including the clergy, were to eat with the Marquis in the great hall. On the grass near the house, tents were erected for the burgesses of the borough, and the tenants of the Marquis's farms. I would have said on the lawn, but there was no lawn proper about the place, the ground was so picturesquely broken, in parts with all but precipices, and so crowded with trees. Hence its aspect was specially unlike that of an English park and grounds. The whole was Celtic, as distinguished in character from Saxon. For the lake-like lawn, for the wide sweeps of airy room, in which expand the mighty boughs of solitary trees, for the filmy grey-blue distances and the far-off segments of horizon, here were the tree-crowded grass, the close windings of the long glen of the burn, heavily overshadowed, and full of mystery and covert but leading at last to the widest vantage of outlook, the wild, heathery hill down which it drew its sharp furrow, while in front of the house, beyond hidden river and plain of treetops, and far-sunk shore with its dune and its bored crag and its tortuous caves, lay the great sea, a pouting under-lip, met by the thin, reposeful, shall I say sorrowful, upper lip of the sky. A bridge of stately span, level with the sweep in front, honourable embodiment of the savings of a certain noble countess, one end resting on the same rock with the house, their foundations almost in contact, led across the burn to more and more trees, their roots swathed in the finest grass, through which ran broad carriage drives and narrower footways, hard and smooth with yellow gravel. Here amongst the trees were set long tables for the fishermen, mechanics, and farm labourers. Here also was the place appointed for the piper, as the hour drew near, the guests came trooping in at every entrance. By the sea-gate came the fisher-folk, many of the men in the blue jersey, the women mostly in short print gowns of large patterns, the married with huge wide-frilled caps, 
and the unmarried with their hair gathered in silken nets. Bonnets there were very few. Each group that entered had a joke or a jibe for Johnny Bikes, which he met in varying but always surly fashion. In that of utter silence, in the case of Duncan and Malcolm, at which the former was indignant, the latter merry. By the town gate came the people of Port Lossie. By the new main entrance from the high road beyond the town, through lofty Greekish gates, came the lords and lairds, in yellow coaches, gigs, and post-chases. By another gate, far up the glen, came most of the country folk, some walking, some riding, some driving, all merry, and with the best intentions of enjoying themselves. As the common people approached the house, they were directed to their different tables by the sexton, for he knew everybody. The Marquis was early on the ground, going about amongst his guests, and showing a friendly off-hand courtesy which prejudiced everyone in his favour. Lady Florimel soon joined him, and a certain frank way she had inherited from her father, joined to the great beauty her mother had given her, straightway won all hearts. She spoke to Duncan with cordiality. The moment he heard her voice, he pulled off his bonnet, put it under his arm, and responded with what I can find no better phrase to describe than a profuse dignity. Malcolm she favoured with a smile which swelled his heart with pride and devotion. The bold-faced countess next appeared. She took the marquis's other arm, and nodded to his guests condescendingly and often, but seemed, after every nod, to throw her head farther back than before. Then, to haunt the goings of Lady Florimel, came Lord Michaelham, receiving little encouragement, but eager after such crumbs as he could gather. Suddenly the great bell under the highest of the gilded veins rang a loud peal, and the marquis having led his chief guests to the hall, as soon as he was seated, the tables began to be served simultaneously. At that where Malcolm sat with Duncan, Grace was grievously foiled by the latter, for unaware of what was going on, he burst out, at the request of a waggish neighbour, with a tremendous blast, of which the company took advantage to commence operations at once, and presently the clatter of knives and forks and spoons was the sole sound to be heard in that division of the feast. Across the valley, from the neighbourhood of the house, came now and then a faint peal of laughter, for there they knew how to be merry while they ate. But here the human element was in abeyance, for people who work hard seldom talk while they eat. From the end of an overhanging bough a squirrel looked at them for one brief moment, wondering, perhaps, that they should not prefer cracking a nut in private, and vanished. But the birds kept singing, and the scents of the flowers came floating up from the garden below, and the burn went on with its own noises and its own silences, drifting the froth of its last passion down towards the doors of the world. In the hall, ancient jokes soon began to flutter their molted wings, and musty compliments to offer themselves for the acceptance of the ladies, and meet with a reception varied by temperament and experience. What the bold-faced countess heard with a hybrid contortion, half-sneer and half-smile, would have made Lady Florimel stare out of big, refusing eyes. Those more immediately around the Marquis were soon laughing over the story of the trick he had played the blind piper, and the apology he had had to make in consequence. And perhaps something better than mere curiosity had to do with the wish of several of the guests to see the old man and his grandson. The Marquis said the piper himself would take care they should not miss him, but he would send for the young fellow, who was equally fitted to amuse them, being quite as much of a character in his way as the other. He spoke to the man behind his chair, and in a few minutes Malcolm made his appearance, following the messenger. "'Malcolm,' said the Marquis kindly, "'I want you to keep your eyes open, and see that no mischief is done about the place.' "'I do not think there's one of our own folk would do any mischief, my lord,' answered Malcolm. "'But when you keep open yet, you cannot be sure who wins in, especially with such a gowk as Johnny Bikes at one of them. Not that he would wrong your lordship a hair, my lord.' "'At all events you'll be on the alert,' said the Marquis. "'I will that, my lord.' "'There's two or three about already that I didn't altogether like the looks of. "'They're not like country folk, and they're not fisher folk. "'It's not far off the time of year when the gypsies are in the way of paying us a visit, "'and they may a come in at the bin yet, where there's none but an old wife to hold them out.' "'Well, well,' said the Marquis, who had no fear about the behaviour of his guests, "'and had only wanted a colour for his request of Malcolm's presence. "'In the meantime,' he added, "'we are rather short-handed here.' "'Just give the butler a little assistance, will you?' "'Willingly, my lord,' answered Malcolm. 
forgetting altogether in the prospect of being useful and within sight of Lady Florimel, that he had but half finished his own dinner. The butler, who had already had an opportunity of admiring his aptitude, was glad enough to have his help, and after this day used to declare that in a single week he could make him a better servant than any of the men who waited at table. It was indeed remarkable how, with such a limited acquaintance with the many modes of an artificial life, he was yet, by quickness of sympathetic insight, capable not only of divining its requirements, but of distinguishing, amid the multitude of appliances around, those fitted to their individual satisfaction. It was desirable, however, that the sitting in the hall should not be prolonged, and after a few glasses of wine the Marquis rose and went to make the round of the other tables. Taking them in order, he came last to those of the rustics, mechanics, and fisherfolk. These had advanced considerably in their potations, and the fun was loud. His appearance was greeted with shouts, into which Duncan struck with a pean from his pipes. But in the midst of the tumult, one of the oldest of the fishermen stood up, and in a voice accustomed to battle with windy uproars, called for silence. He then addressed their host. "'Ye'll just make us proud by drinking a tumbler with us, your lordship,' he said. "'It's no ilk a day we have the honour of your lordship's company.' "'Or I of yours,' returned the Marquis, with hearty courtesy. "'I will do it with pleasure, or at least a glass. My head's not so well seasoned as some of yours.' "'Gin your lordship's head had as many blasts a night wind, "'and as many jops a cold sea-water about its lugs as ours, "'it would have been fit to stand as muckle o' the barley brie "'as the stavest o' the lot, I see warrant. "'I hope so,' returned Lord Lossy, "'who, having taken a seat at the end of the table, "'was now mixing a tumbler of toddy. "'As soon as he had filled his glass, he rose, "'and drank to the fishermen of Port Lossy, "'their wives and their sweethearts, "'wishing them a mighty conquest of herring,' and plenty of children to keep up the breed and the war on the fish. His speech was received with hearty cheers, during which he sauntered away to rejoin his friends. Many toasts followed, one of which, damnation to the dogfish, gave opportunity to a wag, seated near the piper, to play upon the old man's well-known foible by adding, "'And Kamala Glenlion,' whereupon Duncan, who had by this time taken more whiskey than was good for him, rose, and made a rambling speech, in which he returned thanks for the imprecation, adding thereto the hope that never might one of the brood accursed go down with honour to the grave. The fishermen listened with respectful silence, indulging only in nods, winks, and smiles for the interchange of amusement, until the utterance of the wish recorded, when, apparently carried away for a moment by his eloquence, they broke into loud applause. But from the midst of it, a low gurgling laugh close by him reached Duncan's ear, Excited though he was with strong drink and approbation, he shivered, sunk into his seat, and clutched at his pipes convulsively, as if they had been a weapon of defence. "'Malcolm, Malcolm, my son,' he muttered feebly, "'there is a woman will be laughing. She is a bad woman. She makes me cold.' Finding from the no response that Malcolm had left his side, he sat motionless, drawn into himself, and struggling to suppress the curdling shiver. Some of the women gathered about him, but he assured them it was nothing more than a passing sickness. Malcolm's attention had, a few minutes before, been drawn to two men of somewhat peculiar appearance, who, applauding louder than any, only pretended to drink, and occasionally interchanged glances of intelligence. It was one of these peculiar looks that first attracted his notice. He soon discovered that they had a comrade on the other side of the table, who apparently, like themselves, had little or no acquaintance with anyone near him. He did not like either their countenances or their behaviour, and resolved to watch them. In order, therefore, to be able to follow them when they moved, as he felt certain they would before long, without attracting their attention, he left the table, and making a circuit, took up his position behind a neighbouring tree. Hence it came that he was not, at the moment of his need, by his grandfather's side, whither he had returned as soon as dinner was over in the hall. Meantime, it became necessary to check the drinking by the counter-attraction of the dance. Mr. Craythy gave orders that a chair should be mounted on a table for Duncan, and the young hinds and fishermen were soon dancing zealously with the girls of their company to his Strathspeys and reels. The other divisions of the Marquis's guests made merry to the sound of a small brass band, a harp, and two violins. When the rest forsook the toddy for the reel, the objects of Malcolm's suspicion remained at the table, not to drink, 
but to draw nearer to each other and confer. At length, when the dancers began to return in quest of liquor, they rose and went away loiteringly through the trees. As the twilight was now deepening, Malcolm found it difficult to keep them in sight, but for the same reason he was able the more quickly to glide after them from tree to tree. It was almost moonrise, he said to himself, and if they meditated mischief, now was their best time. Presently he heard the sound of running feet, and in a moment more spied the unmistakable form of the mad laird, darting through the thickening dusk of the trees, with gestures of wild horror. As he passed the spot where Malcolm stood, he cried out in a voice like a suppressed shriek, "'It's my mother! It's my mother! I dinna ken what I come for!' His sudden appearance and outcry so startled Malcolm that for a moment he forgot his watch, and when he looked again the men had vanished. Not having any clue to their intent, and knowing only that on such a night the house was nearly defenseless, he turned at once and made for it. As he approached the front, coming over the bridge, he fancied he saw a figure disappear through the entrance, and quickened his pace. Just as he reached it, he heard a door bang, and supposing it to be that which shut off the second hall, whence rose the principal staircase, he followed this vaguest of hints, and bounded to the top of the stair. Entering the first passage he came to, he found it almost dark, with a half-open door at the end, through which shone a gleam from some window beyond. This light was plainly shut off for a moment, as if by someone passing the window. He hurried after noiselessly, for the floor was thickly carpeted, and came to the foot of a winding stone stair. Afraid beyond all things of doing nothing, and driven by the formless conviction that if he stopped to deliberate, he certainly should do nothing, he shot up the dark screw like an ascending bubble, passed the landing of the second floor without observing it, and arrived in the attic regions of the ancient pile, under low, irregular ceilings, here ascending in cones, there coming down in abrupt triangles, or sloping away to a hidden meeting with the floor in distant corners. His only light was the cold blue glimmer from here and there a storm window or a skylight. As the conviction of failure grew on him, the ghostly feeling of the place began to invade him. All was vague, forsaken, and hopeless, as a dreary dream, with the superadded miserable sense of lonely sleepwalking. I suspect that the feeling we call ghostly is but the sense of abandonment in the lack of companion life. But be this as it may, Malcolm was glad enough to catch sight of a gleam, as from a candle, at the end of a long, low passage on which he had come after mazy wandering. Another similar passage crossed its end, somewhere in which must be the source of the light. He crept towards it, and laying himself flat on the floor, peeped round a corner. His very heart stopped to listen. Seven or eight yards from him, with a small lantern in her hand, stood a short female figure, which, the light falling for a moment on her soft, evil countenance, he recognized as Mrs. Catanaugh. Beside her stood a tall, graceful figure, draped in black from head to foot. Mrs. Catanaugh was speaking in a low tone, and what Malcolm was able to catch was evidently the close of a conversation. "'I'll do my best, you may be sure, my lady,' she said. "'There is something no canny about the creature, and doubtless ye was an ill-used woman, and ye're in the right. But it's a some fearsome venture, and may be looked in till ye can. There I so be your scog. Lip into me, and ye so no repent it.' As she ended speaking, she turned to the door, and drew from it a key, evidently after a foiled attempt to unlock it therewith. For from a bunch she carried she now made choice of another, and was already fumbling with it in the keyhole, when Malcolm bethought himself that, whatever her further intent, he ought not to allow her to succeed in opening the door. He therefore rose slowly to his feet, and stepping softly out into the passage, sent his round blue bonnet spinning with such a certain aim that it flew right against her head. She gave a cry of terror, smothered by the sense of evil secrecy, and dropped her lantern. It went out. Malcolm pattered with his hands on the floor, and began to howl frightfully. Her companion had already fled, and Mrs. Catanaugh picked up her lantern and followed. But her flight was soft-footed, and gave sign only in the sound of her garments, and a clank or two of her keys. Gifted with a good sense of relative position, Malcolm was able to find his way back to the hall without much difficulty, and met no one on the way. When he stepped into the open air, a round moon was visible through the trees, and their shadows were lying across the sward. The merriment had grown louder. 
for a good deal of whisky having been drunk by men of all classes, hilarity had ousted restraint, and the separation of classes having broken a little, there were many stragglers from the higher to the lower divisions, whence the area of the more boisterous fun had considerably widened. Most of the ladies and gentlemen were dancing in the checker of the trees in moonlight, but, a little removed from the rest, Lady Florimel was seated under a tree, with Lord Michaelham by her side, probably her partner in the last dance. She was looking at the moon, which shone upon her from between two low branches, and there was a sparkle in her eyes, and a luminousness upon her cheek, which to Malcolm did not seem to come from the moon only. He passed on, with the first pang of jealousy in his heart, feeling now for the first time that the space between Lady Florimel and himself was indeed a gulf. But he cast the whole thing from him for the time, with an inward scorn of his foolishness, and hurried on from group to group, to find the Marquis. Meeting with no trace of him, and thinking he might be in the flower-garden, which a few rays of the moon now reached, he descended thither. But he searched it through with no better success, and at the farthest end was on the point of turning to leave it and look elsewhere, when he heard a moan of stifled agony on the other side of a high wall which here bounded the garden. Climbing up an espalier, he soon reached the top, and looking down on the other side, to his horror and rage, espied the mad laird on the ground, and the very men of whom he had been in pursuit, standing over him and brutally tormenting him, apparently in order to make him get up and go along with them. One was kicking him, another pulling his head this way and that by the hair, and the third punching and poking his hump, which last cruelty had probably drawn from him the cry Malcolm had heard. Three might be too many for him. He descended swiftly, found some stones and a stake from a bed of sweet peas, then climbing up again, took such effectual aim at one of the villains that he fell without uttering a sound. Dropping at once from the wall, he rushed at the two with stick upheaved. "'Dinna be in sick a rage, man!' cried the first, avoiding his blow. "'We're about nothing ayont the lawful. It's only the mad laird. We're taking him to the asylum at Eberdeen, by the order of his ain mither.' At the word a choking scream came from the prostrate victim. Malcolm uttered a huge imprecation, and struck at the fellow again, who now met him in a way that showed it was noise more than wounds he had dreaded. Instantly the other came up, and also fell upon him with vigour. But his stick was too much for them, and at length one of them, crying out, "'It's the blind piper's bastard! I'll mark him yet!' took to his heels, and was followed by his companion. More eager after rescue than punishment, Malcolm turned to the help of the laird, whom he found in utmost need of his ministrations, gagged, and with his hands tied mercilessly tight behind his back. His knife quickly released him, but the poor fellow was scarcely less helpless than before. He clung to Malcolm, and moaned piteously, every moment glancing over his shoulder in terror of pursuit. His mouth hung open, as if the gag were still tormenting him. Now and then he would begin his usual lament, and manage to say, "'I dinna ken,' but when he attempted the where, his jaw fell and hung as before." Malcolm sought to lead him away, but he held back, moaning dreadfully. Then Malcolm would have him sit down where they were, but he caught his hand and pulled him away, stopping instantly, however, as if not knowing whither to turn from the fears on every side. At length the prostrate enemy began to move, when the laird, who had been unaware of his presence, gave a shriek and took to his heels. Anxious not to lose sight of him, Malcolm left the wounded man to take care of himself, and followed him up the steep side of the little valley. They had not gone many steps from the top of the ascent, however, before the fugitive threw himself on the ground exhausted, and it was all Malcolm could do to get him to the town, where, unable to go a pace further, he sank down on Mrs. Catanaugh's doorstep. A light was burning in the cottage, but Malcolm would seek shelter for him anywhere rather than with her, and in terror of her quick ears, caught him up in his arms like a child and hurried away with him to Miss Horne's. "'Eh, hey, sirs!' exclaimed Miss Horne when she opened the door, for Jean was among the merrymakers. "'Who's this it's kilt now?' "'It's the laird, Mr. Stewart,' returned Malcolm. "'He's no freely kilt, but nigh han.' "'Na, weel I wat. Come in and set him down till we see,' said Miss Horne, turning and leading the way up to her little parlour. There Malcolm laid his burden on the sofa, and gave a brief account of the rescue. "'Lord, preserve us, Malcolm!' cried Miss Horne, as soon as he had ended his tale, to which she had listened in silence, 
with fierce eyes and threatening nose. "'Is not a mercy I wasn't a maid like some folk, or I couldn't have bidden to see the poor fellow misguided that gate. It's a special mercy Malcolm MacPhail to be made wantin' any such thing as feelings.' She was leaving the room as she spoke, to return instantly with brandy. The laird swallowed some with an effort, and began to revive. "'Eh, sirs!' exclaimed Miss Horne, regarding him now more narrowly. "'But he's in an awful state of dirt. I'm on wash his face and hands and put him till his bed. Could you help off with his clothes, Malcolm? Though I have not any feelings, I'm just some eerie-like at the poor body's back.' The last words were uttered in what she judged a safe aside. As if she had been his mother, she washed his face and hands and dried them tenderly, the laird submitting like a child. He spoke but one word, when she took him by the hand to lead him to the room where her cousin used to sleep. "'Father lights,' he said, and no more. Malcolm put him to bed, where he lay perfectly still, whether awake or asleep, they could not tell. He then set out to go back to Lossie House, promising to return after he had taken his grandfather home, and seen him also safe in bed. End of chapter 24《Chapter Twenty Five of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen. Chapter Twenty Five, The Night Watch. When Malcolm returned, Jean had retired for the night, and again it was Miss Horne who admitted him and led him to her parlor. It was a low-ceilinged room with lean, spider-legged furniture and dingy curtains. Everything in it was suggestive of a comfort slowly vanishing. An odor of withered rose leaves pervaded the air. A Japanese cabinet stood in one corner, and on the mantelpiece a pair of Chinese fans with painted figures whose faces were embossed in silk, between which ticked an old French clock, whose supporters were a shepherd and shepherdess in prettily painted china. Long faded as was everything in it, the room was yet very rich in the eyes of Malcolm, whose home was bare even in comparison with that of the poorest of the fisherwomen. They had a passion for ornamenting their chimney-pieces with china ornaments, and their dressers with the most gorgeous crockery that their money could buy, a certain metallic orange being the prevailing hue, while in Duncan's cottage, where woman had never initiated the taste, there was not even a china poodle to represent the finished development of luxury in the combination of the ugly and the useless. Miss Horne had made a little fire in the old-fashioned grate, whose bars bellied out like a sail almost beyond the narrow chimney-shelf, and a tea-kettle was singing on the hob, while a decanter, a sugar-basin, a nutmeg-grater, and other needful things on a tray, suggested negus, beyond which Miss Horne never went in the matter of stimulants, asserting that, as she had no feelings, she never required anything stronger. She made Malcolm sit down at the opposite end of the fire, and mixing him a tumbler of her favorite drink, began to question him about the day and how things had gone. Miss Horne had the just repute of discretion, for, gladly hearing all the news, she had the rare virtue of not repeating things to the prejudice of others without some good reason for so doing. Malcolm, therefore, seated thus alone with her in the dead of the night, and bound to her by the bond of a common well-doing, had no hesitation in unfolding to her all his adventures of the evening. She sat with her big hands in her lap, making no remark, not even an exclamation, while he went on with the tale of the garret. But her listening eyes grew not larger, darker and fiercer as he spoke. The space between her nostrils and mouth widened visibly. The muscles knotted on the sides of her neck, and her nose curved more and more to the shape of a beak. "'There's some devilry there,' she said at length, after he had finished, breaking a silence of some moments, during which she had been staring into the fire." "'Where two ill women come together, "'there mun be the old man himself atween them.' "'I dinna doubt it,' returned Malcolm. "'And one of them's an ill woman, sure enough, "'but I ken nothing about the tither, "'only that she mun be a lady "'by the way the howdy wife spacked her. "'The word's oaken when a lady colloques "'with a woman in aether own station, "'and when it has kept many a secret in her day, "'and by her callin' has had mere opportunity, "'not to say farther, "'than other folk a doin' ill things. "'And gin ye dinna ken her,' "'That's no reason that I shouldn't have a gruff guess at her "'by the marks ye read off of her.' "'Hm. I'll just have to tell ye a story, "'sick as an old wife like me seldom tells to a young man like herself. "'Your own bridle shall rule my tongue, ma'am,' said Malcolm. "'I shall lip into your discretion,' 
said Miss Horn, and straightway began. Some years ago, and I swore in its wheel o'er twenty, that same woman, Bobby Katna, who was now home-born woman, nor had been long about the town, coming as she did, for nobody kent where, except maybe it was the Marcus that then was, presumed to make up to me in the way of friendly acquaintance, sick as a maiden lady might have with a howdy, and not that she forgot her proper behaviour to one like myself. But I could not have bidden the jade, except that I had reasons for letting her jaw wag. She was cunning, the old wretch, not that old, maybe about forty, but I was o'er money for her. She had the design to win at something she thought I kent, and so, to entice me to open my pook, she opened hers, and tellt me story after story about this neighbour and that, all of them things that ought not to have been true, and that she ought not to have let pass her lips they were true, seeing she came by the knowledge of them so as she said she did. But she got nothing of me, the fat-brained cat, and she hates me like the very mischief. Miss Horne paused and took a sip of her negus. One day I came upon her sitting by the inglenook in my own kitchen, holding a close and a like combab with Jean. I had Jean then, and how I a kip the hizzy I hardly ken. I think it mun be that, having no feelings of my own, I have o'er muckle regard to other folks, and so I never like to put her away without don right provocation. But dinna ye lip into Jean, Malcolm. Na, na. At that time, my cousin, Miss Grizel Camel, my third cousin she was, had come to bide with me, a bonny young thing as ye would see, but in sair ill health. And maybe she had frets, and maybe no, but she couldn't abide to see the woman Katna about the place. And in very truth, she was to my cell like one of the ill-fired birds. I didn't mind upon the name of them. The hings were an army, for wherever there was anybody now well, or anybody did, there was Bobby Katna. I had heard of creeping things that visits folk it's no well, and Bobby was and is one sick like. So I was angered at seeing her collogan with Jean, and I cried Jean to me to the door of the kitchen. But with that up jumps Bobby, and coming after her, says to me, says she, "Eh, hey, Miss Horn, there's terrible news. Lady Lossie's dead. She's been three weeks dead. Well, says I, what's so terrible about that? For ye ken, I never had any feelings, and I could see nothing so awful about a body dying in the ordinary way of nature like. We'll know Miss Rumuckle down here, says I, for I never heard of her being at the house and ever I can mine. But that's no all, says she. Only I would be lathe to speak about it in the trance. Let me up the stair with ye, and I'll tell ye more. Well, partly that I was taken by surprise, like, and partly that I was not so old as I am now, and partly that I was curious to hear, ill that I liked her, what nace the woman would say, I did as I oughtna, and I turned and got up the stair and let her follow me. When she came in, she put to the door behind her, and turned to me and said, says she, And who's dead for by, think ye? I heard of nobody, I answered. Who but the laird of Gersfell, says she. I'm sorry to hear that honest man, says I, for nobody liked Mr. Stewart. And what think ye o it, says she, with a wrinkling o' her brows, and a shake o' her head, and a sitting o' her round knees upon the fat hips o' her. Think o it, says I. What sort I think o it, but that it's the will o' Providence? With that she lucht till she wobbled o' o'er like cold skink, and says she, "'Well, that's just what it is no, and that let me tell you, Miss Horne.' I glowered at her, most frighted into believing she was the witch folk called her. "'Whose son's the hump-backed creature?' says she. "'It comes in the gig whiles with the groom lad, think ye. "'Who oh, but the poor man it's dead?' says I. "'Deal a bit o' it,' says she. "'And I beg your pardon for mentioning o' him,' says she. "'And sign she screwed up her mow and came close up till me, "'for I would not sit down myself.' and less would I bid her, and was sorry enough by this time that I had brought her up the stair. And says she, laying her hand upon my arm with a clap, as gin her and me was to be friends upon such a grand foundation of dirt as that. Says she, making like tutmo o' it, he's Lord Lossie's, says she, and makes a face that might have turned a cat sick, only by good luck I had no feelings. And no sooner's my lady did, nor her man follows her, says she. And what do you make o' that? says she. "'Ay, what do ye make o' that?' says I till her again. "'Oh, what can I?' says she, with another ill look, and with that she laughed and turned away, but turned back again or she went to the door, and says she, "'Maybe ye did not ken that she was brought to bed herself about six weeks ago.' "'Poor lady,' said I, thinking more o' her evil reporting out of the pains of childbirth. "'Ay,' says she, 
with a devilish kind of a laugh, like in spite of herself. For the bairn's dead, they tell me. As bonny a lad bairn as you would see, just uncommon. And where did you think she had her down lion? Just at Lossy Hose. With that she was out of the door with a swag of her tail, and down the stair to Jean again. I was just at one more with anger at myself and scunner at her, and in two minds to gang after her and turn her out of the house, her and Jean together. I could hear her snickering till herself as she go down the stair. My very stomach turned at the poisonous toad. I cannot say what was true or what was false in the scandal of her tale, nor at what for she took the trouble to carry it to me, but it soon came to be said that the young laird was but half-witted as well as humped, and that his mother could not bite him, and certain it was that the poor wee chap could as little bite his mother. Gin she came near him unlooked for, they said, he would give a great screech, and run as fast as his wee wavered legs could wag aneath the weight of his humpy, and whiles her after him, with anything she could lay her hand upon, they said, but I can na. On a gate, the widow herself grew wur and wur in the temper, and I misdoubt me Sarah was gay hard upon the poor wee object, fell cruel to them, they said, till at length, as all but he kens, he forhood the house altogether, and putting this and that together, for I hear a hantle said it I say na o'er again, it seems to me at her first gunner at her poor misformed bairn, who they say was humped when he was born, and must cost her her life to get lost to him. Her scunner at him has been grown and grown till it's grown to downright hate. It's an awful thing that you say, ma'am, and I doubt it's o'er true. But who can a mother hate her own bairn? said Malcolm. Deed, it's no wonder you should spear, laddie, for it's well kent at most mothers, gin there be a shargar, or a natural, or a crooked one among their bairns, make more of that one nor of all the lave putting together, as gin they would make it up till him for the fair play of the world. But you see, in this case, He's able the child a sin, for a liar may tell an ill truth, and bears the marks of it, you see. So to her he's just her sin, running about the world incarnate, and that cannot be pleasant to look upon. But except she were ashamed of it, she wouldn't take it so muckle to heart to be reminded o' it. Many one's ashamed of the consequences, it's not ashamed of the deed. Many one could do the sin o'er again, it cannot bide the sight or even the word o' it. I ha' seen a body it would steal a thing as soon as look at it, gang daft with rage at being called a thief. And maybe she would not care, gin it were not for the ugliness o' him. So be he was a bonny sin, I'm thinking she would bide him well enough. But seeing he's neither in the image of her it bore him, nor him it got him, but bears on his back for ever in her sight the sin it was the getting o' him, he's a hump to her, and her heart's eye how can a grave for him to lay him out of sight until. She bore him and she would bury him. And I'm thinking she bears the Marcus, gin so it be so, dead and gone as he is a grudge yet, for passing such an offspring upon her, and sign no Mary in her after and all, and the road clear of both that stood between them. It was said that the man that killed him in a twosome fight, so many a year after, was a friend of hers. But would folk do such awful ill things, ma'am? Her a married woman, and him a married man? There's no saying, laddie, what a handle of men and some women would do. I have muckle to be thankful for that I was sick as no man ever looked twice at. I was not well fired enough, though I had bonny hair, and my mither eyes said at her Maggie had good sense, whatever else she might or might not have. But gin I could a gotten a good man, sick likes is scarce, I could a loved him well enough. But that's neither here nor there, and has nothing to do with anybody of all. The pint I had to come to was this. The woman ye saw holding a tootmoot, that cut in our wife, was none other, I do believe, than Mistress Stuart, the poor laird's mither. And I have as little doubt that when you took his part, you brought to not a plot of the twosome against him. It bodes good to nobody when there's a conjunct of two sick wandering stars of blackness as yon two. His ain mither, exclaimed Malcolm, brooding in horror over the frightful conjecture. The door opened, and the mad laird came in. His eyes were staring wide, but their look and that of his troubled visage showed that he was awake only in some frightful dream. Father lights, he murmured once and again, but making wild gestures, as if warding off blows. Miss Horne took him gently by the hand. The moment he felt her touch, his face grew calm, and he submitted at once to be led back to bed. "'You may take your oath upon it, Malcolm,' she said when she returned. "'She means nothing but ill by that poor creature. But you and me will ding her yet, gin it be as wool. She wants a grip o' him for some ill reason or other, to lock him up in a madhouse, maybe, as the villain said.' or deed, maybe, to make away with him altogether. But what good would that do her? said Malcolm. It's ill to say, 
but she would have him out of her sight any gate. She can have but little sight when as tis, objected Malcolm. Ay, but she aye kens he's where she does not ken, putting her to shame all about the country with that hump of his. Out of folk's sight would be to her out altogether. A brief silence followed. No, said Malcolm. We come to the question what the two limmers could want with that door. Dear kens, it bud to be something wrong. That's all it mortal can say, but you may be sure of that. I hae heard tell, she went on reflectingly, o oh, some room or other in the house that there's a fearsome story about, and it's never opened on no account. I have heard about it, but I canna mind upon it no, for I paid little attention to it at the time, and it's money a year since syne. But it would be some devilish ploy of their own they would be after. It's little the likes them would heed sick old world tales. Would ye have me tell the Marcus? asked Malcolm. "'Na, nah, I would not. And yet you mun do it. "'Ye had no business to canna anything wrong in a body's house and not tell them. "'For by it he put you in charge. "'But it'll do nothing for the laird. "'For what cares the Marcus for anything or anybody but himself?' "'He cares for his daughter,' said Malcolm. "'Oh, aye, as sick folk call Karen. "'There's not a blackguard in the hale country he wouldn't sell her till, "'so be he was of an old enough family, and had Ralph a siller. "'Haith, nowadays the last'll come first. "'and a fish-catcher with siller will be counted a better bargain nor a lord wanting it. "'Only he mun have a heap o' it to core the stink o' the fish.' "'Dinna scorn the fish, mem said Malcolm. "'They're innocent creatures, and dinna smell warner they can help. "'And that's mair nor ye can say for ilka lord ye come athort. "'Aye, or cadger either, rejoined Miss Horn. "'They are oft enough just sick like, the main differ lying and what they're defiled with. "'Indeed, whiles there's no differ there, or most any gate, maybe.' "'but in the set of the shoulders and the wag of the tongue. "'And what'll we do with the laird?' said Malcolm. "'We maun first see what we can do with him. "'I would try to keep him my sail, that is, Genny would bide. "'But there's that jade Jean. "'She's aye gabbin and clakin and cognostin with the enemy, "'and I canna lip into her. "'I think it would be better you should take charge o' me yourself, Malcolm. "'I would willingly bear any expense, "'for you would not be able to look after him and do so well at the fishing ye can.' Gin it had been my own lion fish, and I could have taken him in the boat with me, but I didn't ken for the heron. Blue Peter wouldn't object, but it's some rough work, and for a wakely body like the laird to be out all night some nights, sick weather as we had to encounter whiles, might be the dead o' him. They came to no conclusion beyond this, that each would think it over, and Malcolm would call in the morning. Ere then, however, the laird had dismissed the question for them. When Miss Horne rose, after an all but sleepless night, she found that he had taken the affairs again into his own feeble hands and vanished. End of chapter 25「Chapter 26 of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen. Chapter 26 – Not at Church it being well known that Joseph Mare's cottage was one of the laird's resorts, Malcolm, as soon as he learned his flight, set out to inquire whether they knew anything of him there. Scarnose was perched almost on the point of the promontory, where the land made its final slope, ending in a precipitous descent to the shore. Beneath lay rocks of all sizes and of fantastic forms, some fallen from the cape in tempests perhaps, some softly separated from it by the slow action of the winds and waves of centuries. A few of them formed, by their broken defense seawards, the unsafe natural harbor which was all the place enjoyed. If ever there was a place of one color, it was this village. Everything was brown. The grass near it was covered with brown nets. At the doors were brown heaps of oak bark, which, after dyeing the nets, was used for fuel. The cottages were roofed with old brown thatch, and the one street and the many closes were dark brown with the peaty earth, which, well mixed with scattered bark, scantily covered the surface of its huge foundation rock. There was no pavement, and it was the less needed that the ways were rarely used by wheels of any description. The village was but a roost, like the dwellings of the seabirds which also haunted the rocks. It was a grey morning, with a grey sky and a grey sea. All was brown and grey. "'peaceful and rather sad. "'Brown-haired, grey-eyed Feemy Mare sat in the threshold, "'intently rubbing in her hands a small object like a moonstone. 
That she should be doing so on a Sunday would have shocked few in Scarnos at that time, for the fisher folk then made but small pretensions to religion, and for his part Joseph Mare could not believe that the Almighty would be offended at seeing a bairn sit and do with her playox, though the day was his. "'Well, Feemy, you're busy,' said Malcolm. "'Ay,' answered the child, without looking up. The manner was not courteous, but her voice was gentle and sweet. "'What are you doing there?' he asked. "'Making a string of beads to wear at Auntie's marriage. "'What are you making them of?' he went on. "'Haddocks ain. "'Are they all haddocks?' "'Na, there's some cods among them, but they're mostly haddocks. "'I pikes them out before they're salted, and boils them, "'and sign I polish them in my hands till they're ale bonny.' "'Can you tell me anything about the mad laird, Vini? asked Malcolm, in his anxiety, too abruptly. "'You can gang and spear at my father. He's out about,' she answered, with a sort of marked coolness, which, added to the fact that she had never looked him in the face, made him more than suspect something behind. "'Div ye can anything about him?' he therefore insisted. "'Maybe I div, and maybe I div na,' answered the child, with an expression of determined mystery. "'You'll tell me where you think he is, Feemy? "'Na, I winna.' "'What for no? "'Oh, just for fear you should ken. "'But I'm a friend till him. "'Ye may think I, and the laird may think no. "'Does he think you a friend, Feemy? asked Malcolm, "'in the hope of coming at something by widening the sweep of the conversation. "'Ay, he kens I'm a friend,' she replied. "'And do ye aye ken where he is? "'Na, no I. "'He gangs here and he gangs there, just as he likes.' It's when nobody kens where he is that I ken, and gang to him. Is he in the house? No, he's not in the house. Where is he then, Feemy? said Malcolm coaxingly. There's ill folk about it's after doing him an ill turn. The mare need not to tell, retorted Feemy. But I want to take care of him. Tell me where he is, like a good lassie, Feemy. I'm not sure. I may say, I dinna ken. You say ye ken when ither folk does na. No, nobody kens. "'How can ye that? "'Cause he's run away. "'Who frae? "'His mither? "'Na, na, from his horn. "'I ken nothing about her, "'but gin nobody kens, "'I ken where he is well enough. "'War, then, "'you'll be doing him a good turn to tell me. "'What I winna tell, "'and where you nor nae other body to get him. "'And ye need not spear, "'for I winna be right to tell, "'and gin ye gang on spearin', "'you and me winna be long friends.' "'As she spoke, the child looked straight up into his face with wide-opened blue eyes, as truthful as the heavens, and Malcolm dared not press her, for it would have been to press her to do wrong. "'You would tell your father, wouldna ye?' he said kindly. "'My father would not spear. My father's a good man. Well, Feemy, though you winna trust me, supposing I was to trust you. You can do that gin ye like. And ye winna tell? I should make no promises. It's no trusting to get me promise.' "'Well, I will trust you. "'Tell the laird to hold Weel out of sight for a while.' "'He'll do that,' said Feemy. "'And tell him, gan anything befall him, "'to send to Miss Horn, "'for Malcolm MacPhail may be out with the boats. "'You will not forget that?' "'I'm not likely to forget it,' answered Feemy, "'apparently absorbed in boring a hole in a haddock's eye with a pin "'so bent as to act like a brace and bit. "'You'll not get your string of beads in time for the wedding, Feemy,' "'remarked Malcolm.' going on to talk from a desire to give the child a feeling of his friendliness. "'I will, I. Find that,' she rejoined. "'When is it to be?' "'Oh, Miss Saturday. You'll be coming o'er?' "'I hanna gotten a call. You'll be getting one. Div you think they'll give me one? As soon as anybody. Maybe by that time I'll be able to give you some news of the laird. There is a good lassie.' "'Na, na. I'm making no promises,' said Feemy. Malcolm left her and went to find her father, who, although it was Sunday, was already out to boat, as she had said. He found him strolling in meditation along the cliffs. They had a little talk together, but Joseph knew nothing of the laird. Malcolm took Lossie House on his way back, for he had not yet seen the Marquis, to whom he must report his adventures of the night before. The signs of past reveling were plentifully visible as he approached the house. The Marquis was not yet up. But Mrs. Courthope, undertaking to send him word as soon as his lordship was to be seen, he threw himself on the grass and waited, his mind occupied with strange questions, started by the Sunday coming after such a Saturday. Among the rest, how God could permit a creature to be born so distorted and helpless as the laird, 
and then permit him to be so abused in consequence of his helplessness. The problems of life were beginning to bite. Everywhere things appeared uneven. He was not one to complain of mere external inequalities. If he was inclined to envy Lord Michaelham, it was not because of his social position. He was even now philosopher enough to know that the life of a fisherman was preferable to that of such a marquis as Lord Lossie. That the desirableness of a life is to be measured by the amount of interest, and not by the amount of ease in it. For the more ease, the more unrest. Neither was he inclined to complain of the gulf that yawned so wide between him and Lady Florimel. The difficulty lay deeper. Such a gulf existing, by a social law only less inexorable than a natural one, why should he feel the rent invading his individual being? In a word, though Malcolm put it in no such definite shape, why should a fisher lad find himself in danger of falling in love with the daughter of a marquis? Why should such a thing, seeing the very constitution of things rendered it an absurdity, be yet a possibility? The church bell began, rang on, and ceased. The sound of the psalms came, softly mellowed, and sweetly harmonized across the churchyard through the grey Sabbath air, and he found himself, for the first time, a stray sheep from the fold. The service must have been half through before a lackey, to whom Mrs. Courthope had committed the matter when she went to church, brought him the message that the Marquis would see him. "'Well, Macphail, what do you want with me?' said his lordship as he entered. "'It's my duty to acquaint your lordship with certain proceedings that took place last night,' answered Malcolm. "'Go on.' said the Marquis. Thereupon Malcolm began at the beginning, and told of the men he had watched, and how, in the fancy of following them, he had found himself in the garret, and what he saw and did there. "'Did you recognize either of the women?' asked Lord Lossie. "'One of them, my lord,' answered Malcolm. "'It was Mistress Catanagh, the howdy. "'What sort of a woman is she?' "'Some folk can abide her, my lord. "'I ken no ill to lay till her charge, but I wouldn't lip until her.' My grandfather, and he's blind, ye ken, just trembles when she comes near him. The Marquis smiled. What do you suppose she was about? he asked. I ken no more than the bonnet I fling in her face, my lord, but it could hardly be good she was after. At any rate, seeing your lordship put me in a manner in charge, I bode to hold her out of a closed room, and her goin' creepin' about your lordship's house like a worm. Quite right. Will you pull the bell there for me? He told the man to send Mrs. Courthope, but he said she had not yet come home from church. "'Could you take me to the room, Macphail?' asked his lordship. "'I'll try, my lord,' answered Malcolm. As far as the proper quarter of the attics, he went straight as a pigeon. In that labyrinth he had to retrace his steps once or twice, but at length he stopped, and said confidently, "'This is the door, my lord.' "'Are you sure?' "'As sure as death, my lord.' The Marquis tried the door and found it immovable. You say she had the key? No, my lord. I said she had keys, but whether she had the key, I doubt if she kent herself. It may have been one of the bundle yet to tray. You are a sharp fellow, said the Marquis. I wish I had such a servant about me. I would make a sum rough when I doubt, returned Malcolm, laughing. His lordship was of another mind, but pursued the subject no farther. "'I have a vague recollection,' he said, "'of some room in the house having an old story or legend connected with it. "'I must find out. "'I dare say Mrs. Courthope knows. "'Meantime, you hold your tongue. "'We may get some amusement out of this. "'I will, my lord, like a dead man and bear it. "'You can, can you?' "'I can, my lord.' "'You're a rare one,' said the Marquis. "'Malcolm thought he was making game of him as heretofore, "'and held his peace.' "'You can go home now,' said his lordship. "'I will see to this affair. "'But just be canny meddling with Mistress Catanel, my lord. "'She's no mouse. "'What, you're not afraid of an old woman? "'Deal a bit, my lord. "'That is, I'm not feared at a dogfish or a rotten, "'but I would take tent and grip them the right gate, "'for they had teeth. "'Some folk think Mistress Catanel has mere teeth nor she shows. "'Well, if she's too much for me, I'll send for you,' "'said the Marquis good-humouredly. "'You cannot get me so easy, my lord.' "'We're after the hair and no. "'Well, well, we'll see. "'But I wanted to tell you another thing, my lord,' said Malcolm, "'as he followed the Marquis down the stairs. "'What is that?' "'I came upon another plot, a more serious one, "'being against a man it can ill hold off of himself, "'and could war bide anything than your lordship. "'The poor mad laird. "'Who's he?' "'Ilkabody kens him, my lord. 
"'He's son to the Lady of Kirkbyers.' Oh, "'I remember her. An old flame of my brother's.' "'I ken nothing about that, my lord. But he's her son. What about him, then?' They had now reached the hall, and seeing the Marquis impatient, Malcolm confined himself to the principal facts. "'I don't think you had any business to interfere, Macphail,' said his lordship seriously. "'His mother must know best.' "'I'm not so sure of that, my lord. "'To say nothing of the ill guideship, "'which might a garden minister swear, "'it would be a cruelty nothing short of devilage "'to lock up a poor harmless creature like that, "'as innocent as he's ill-shaped.' "'He's as God made him,' said the Marquis. "'He's not as God will make him,' returned Malcolm. "'What do you mean by that?' asked the Marquis. "'It stands to reason, my lord,' answered Malcolm, "'that what's ill-made mon be made o'er again.' "'There's a day coming when all's wrong will be set right, ye ken.' "'And the crooked made straight?' suggested the Marquis, laughing. "'Doubtless, my lord. He'll be straighted out bonny that day,' said Malcolm, with absolute seriousness. "'Bah! You don't think God cares about a misshapen lump of flesh like that?' exclaimed his lordship, with contempt. "'As muckle is about yoursel, or my lady,' said Malcolm. "'Gin he didna, he wouldna be nae God of all.' The Marquis laughed again. He heard the words with his ears, but his heart was deaf to the thought they clothed. Hence he took Malcolm's earnestness for irreverence, and it amused him. "'You've not got to set things right anyhow,' he said. "'You mind your own business.' "'I'll try, my lord. It's the business o' Ilkaman where he can, to loose the weighty burns, and let the forfoughten gang free. Good day to you, my lord.' So saying, the young fisherman turned, and left the Marquis laughing in the hall. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devora Allen. Chapter 27. Lord Gurnan. When his housekeeper returned from church, Lord Lossie sent for her. "Sit down, Mrs. Courthope," he said. I want to ask you about a story I have a vague recollection of hearing when I spent a summer at this house, some twenty years ago. It had to do with a room in the house that was never opened. There is such a story, my lord, answered the housekeeper. The late Marquis, I remember well, used to laugh at it and threaten now and then to dare the prophecy, but old Eppie persuaded him not, or at least fancied she did. Who is old Eppie? She's gone now, my lord. She was over a hundred then. She was born and brought up in the house, lived all her days in it, and died in it, so she knew more about the place than anyone else. "'Is ever likely to know,' said the Marquis, superadding a close to her sentence. "'And why wouldn't she have the room opened?' he asked. "'Because of the ancient prophecy, my lord. I can't recall a single point of the story.' "'I wish old Eppie were alive to tell it,' said Mrs. Courthope. "'Don't you know it, then?' "'Yes, pretty well, but my English tongue can't tell it properly.' It doesn't sound right out of my mouth. I've heard it a good many times, too, for I had often to take a visitor to her room to hear it, and the old woman liked nothing better than telling it. But I couldn't help remarking that it had grown a good bit, even in my time. The story was like a tree. It got bigger every year. That's the way with a good many stories, said the Marquis. But tell me the prophecy, at least. That is the only part I can give, just as she gave it. It's in rhyme. I hardly understand it, but I'm sure of the words. Let us have them, then, if you please. Mrs. Courthope reflected for a moment, and then repeated the following lines. The Lord Kuha would sup on three thalms of cold iron. The air Kuha would kai the bastard and kerna. The maid Kuha would tine her man and her bairn, lift the sneck, and enter and ferna. That's it, my lord, she said in conclusion. And there's one thing to be observed, she added, that that door is the only one in all the passage that has a sneck, as they call it. What is a sneck? asked his lordship, who was not much of a scholar in his country's tongue. What do we call a latch in England, my lord? I took pains to learn the Scotch correctly, and I've repeated it to your lordship word for word. I don't doubt it, returned Lord Lossie, but for the sense I can make nothing of it. And you think my brother believed the story? He always laughed at it, my lord, but pretended at least to give in to old Eppie's entreaties. "'You mean that he was more near believing it than he liked to confess?' "'That's not what I mean, my lord. "'Why do you say pretended, then?' "'Because when the news of his death came, "'some people about the place would have it that he must have opened the door some time or other.' "'How did they make that out?' "'From the first line of the prophecy.' "'Repeat it again.' 
"'The Lord Coha would sup on three thalms of cold iron,' said Mrs. Courthope with emphasis, adding, "'The three she always said was a figure three. "'That implies it was written somewhere. "'She said it was legible on the door in her day, "'as if burnt with a red-hot iron. "'And what does the line mean?' Eppy said it meant that the lord of the place who opened that door would die by a sword wound. Three inches of cold iron, it means, my lord. The Marquis grew thoughtful. His brother had died in a sword duel. For a few moments he was silent. Tell me the whole story, he said at length. Mrs. Courthope again reflected, and began. I will tell the story, however, in my own words, reminding my reader that if he regards it as an unwelcome interruption, he can easily enough avoid this bend of the river of my narrative, by taking a shortcut across to the next chapter. In an ancient time there was a lord of Lossie who practised unholy works. Although he had other estates, he lived almost entirely at the house of Lossie, that is, after his return from the east, where he had spent his youth and early manhood. But he paid no attention to his affairs. A steward managed everything for him, and Lord Gurnan, for that was the outlandish name he brought from England, where he was born while his father was prisoner to Edward Longshanks, trusted him for a great while, without making the least inquiry into his accounts, apparently contented with receiving money enough to carry on the various vile experiments which seemed his sole pleasure in life. There was no doubt in the minds of the people of the town, the old town, that is, which was then much larger, and clustered about the gates of the house, that he had dealings with Satan, from whom he had gained authority over the powers of nature, that he was able to rouse and lay the winds, to bring down rain, to call forth the lightnings and set the thunders roaring over town and sea. Nay, that he could even draw vessels ashore on the rocks, with the certainty that not one on board would be left alive to betray the pillage of the wreck. This and many other deeds of dire note were laid to his charge in secret. The town cowered at the foot of the house in terror of what its lord might bring down upon it, as a brood of chickens might cower if they had been hatched by a kite, and saw, instead of the matronly head and beak of the hen of their instinct, those of the bird of prey projected over them. Scarce one of them dared even look from the door when the thunder was rolling over their heads, the lightnings flashing about the roofs and turrets of the house, the wind raving in fits between, as if it would rave its last, and the rain falling in sheets. Not so much from fear of the elements, as for horror of the far more terrible things that might be spied careering in the storm. And indeed, Lord Gurnan himself was avoided in like fashion, although rarely had anyone the evil chance of seeing him, so seldom did he go out of doors. There was but one in the whole community, and that was a young girl, the daughter of his steward, who declared she had no fear of him. She went so far as to uphold that Lord Gurnan meant harm to nobody, and was in consequence regarded by the neighbours as unrighteously bold. He worked in a certain lofty apartment on the ground floor, with cellars underneath, reserved, it was believed, for frightfulest conjurations and interviews, where, although no one was permitted to enter, they knew from the smoke that he had a furnace, and from the evil smells which wandered out that he dealt with things altogether devilish in their natures and powers. They said he always washed there, in water medicated with distillments to prolong life and produce invulnerability. But of this they could, of course, know nothing. Strange to say, however, he always slept in the garret, as far removed from his laboratory as the limits of the house would permit, whence people said he dared not sleep in the neighborhood of his deeds, but sought shelter for his unconscious hours in the spiritual shadow of the chapel, which was in the same wing as his chamber. His household saw nearly as little of him as his retainers. When his tread was heard, beating dull on the stone turnpike, or thundering along the upper corridors in the neighborhood of his chamber or of the library, the only other part of the house he visited, man or maid would dart aside into the next way of escape, all believing that the nearer he came to finding himself the sole inhabitant of his house, the better he was pleased. Nor would he allow man or woman to enter his chamber any more than his laboratory. When they found sheets or garments outside his door, they removed them with fear and trembling, and put others in their place. At length, by means of his enchantments, he discovered that the man whom he had trusted had been robbing him for many years. All the time he had been searching for the philosopher's stone, the gold already his had been tumbling into the bags of his steward. But what enraged him far more was that the fellow had constantly pretended difficulty in providing the means necessary for the prosecution of his idolized studies. Even if the feudal lord could have accepted the loss and forgiven the crime, 
Here was a mockery which the man of science could not pardon. He summoned his steward to his presence, and accused him of his dishonesty. The man denied it energetically, but a few mysterious waftures of the hand of his lord set him trembling, and after a few more, his lips, moving by a secret compulsion, and finding no power in their owner to check their utterance, confessed all the truth, whereupon his master ordered him to go and bring his accounts. He departed all but bereft of his senses, and staggered home as if in a dream. There he begged his daughter to go and plead for him with his lord, hoping she might be able to move him to mercy, for she was a lovely girl, and supposed by the neighbors, judging from what they considered her foolhardiness, to have received from him tokens of something at least less than aversion. She obeyed, and from that hour disappeared. The people of the house averred afterwards that the next day, and for days following, they heard at intervals moans and cries from the wizard's chamber, or somewhere in its neighborhood, certainly not from the laboratory. But as they had seen no one visit their master, they had paid them little attention, classing them with the other and hellish noises they were but too much accustomed to hear. The steward's love for his daughter, though it could not embolden him to seek her in the tyrant's den, drove him at length to appeal to the justice of his country for what redress might yet be possible. He sought the court of the great Bruce, and laid his complaint before him. That righteous monarch immediately dispatched a few of his trustiest men-at-arms, under the protection of a monk, whom he believed a match for any wizard under the sun, to arrest Lord Gurnan and release the girl. When they arrived at Lossie House, they found it silent as the grave. The domestics had vanished, but by following the minute directions of the steward, whom no persuasion could bring to set foot across the threshold, they succeeded in finding their way to the parts of the house indicated by him. Having forced the laboratory and found it forsaken, they ascended, in the gathering dusk of a winter afternoon, to the upper regions of the house. Before they reached the top of the stair that led to the wizard's chamber, they began to hear inexplicable sounds, which grew plainer, though not much louder, as they drew nearer to the door. They were mostly like the grunting of some small animal of the hog kind, with an occasional one like the yelling roar of a distant lion, but with these were now and then mingled cries of suffering, so fell and strange that their souls recoiled as if they would break loose from their bodies to get out of hearing of them. The monk himself started back when first they invaded his ear, and it was no wonder then that the men-at-arms should hesitate to approach the room. And as they stood irresolute, they saw a faint light go flickering across the upper part of the door, which naturally strengthened their disinclination to go nearer. "'If it weren't for the girl,' said one of them in a scared whisper to his neighbor, "'I would leave the wizard to the devil and his dam.' Scarcely had the words left his mouth, when the door opened, and out came a form. Whether phantom or living woman none could tell. Pale, forlorn, lost and purposeless, it came straight towards them, with wide, unseeing eyes. They parted in terror from its path. It went on, looking to neither hand, and sank down the stair. The moment it was beyond their sight, they came to themselves and rushed after it. But although they searched the whole house, they could find no creature in it, except a cat of questionable appearance and behavior, which they wisely let alone. Returning, they took up a position whence they could watch the door of the chamber, day and night. For three weeks they watched it, but neither cry nor other sound reached them. For three weeks more they watched it, and then an evil odor began to assail them, which grew and grew, until at length they were satisfied that the wizard was dead. They returned therefore to the king and made their report, whereupon Lord Gurnan was decreed dead, and his heir was in fiefed. But for many years he was said to be still alive, and indeed whether he had ever died in the ordinary sense of the word was to old Epi doubtful for at various times there had arisen whispers of peculiar sounds, even strange cries, having been heard issue from that room, whispers which had revived in the house in Mrs. Courthope's own time. No one had slept in that part of the roof within the memory of old Eppie. No one, she believed, had ever slept there since the events of her tale. Certainly no one had in Mrs. Courthope's time. It was said also that, invariably, sooner or later after such cries were heard, some evil befell either the Lord of Lossie or some one of his family. "'Show me the room, Mrs. Courthope,' said the Marquis, rising, as soon as she had ended. The housekeeper looked at him with some dismay. "'What?' said his lordship. 
you an Englishwoman and superstitious? I am cautious, my lord, though not a Scotchwoman, returned Mrs. Courthope. All I would presume to say is, don't do it without first taking time to think over it. I will not, but I want to know which room it is. Mrs. Courthope led the way, and his lordship followed her to the very door, as he had expected, with which Malcolm had spied Mrs. Catena tampering. He examined it well, and on the upper part of it found what might be the remains of a sunk inscription, so far obliterated as to convey no assurance of what it was. He professed himself satisfied, and they went down the stairs together again. End of chapter 27《Chapter Twenty Eight of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen. Chapter Twenty Eight A Fisher Wedding. When the next Saturday came, all the friends of the bride or bridegroom who had gotten a call to the wedding of Annie Mare and Charlie Wilson assembled respectively at the houses of their parents. Malcolm had received an invitation from both, and had accepted that of the bride. Whiskey and oatcake having been handed round, the bride, a short but comely young woman, set out with her father for the church, followed by her friends and couples. At the door of the church, which stood on the highest point in the parish, a centre of assault for all the winds that blew, they met the bridegroom and his party. The bride and he entered the church together, and the rest followed. After a brief and somewhat bare ceremony, they issued, the bride walking between her brother and the groomsman each taking an arm of the bride, and the company following mainly in trios. Thus arranged, they walked eastward along the high road, to meet the bride's first foot. They had gone about halfway to Port Lossie, when a gentleman appeared, sauntering carelessly towards them, with a cigar in his mouth. It was Lord Michaelham. Malcolm was not the only one who knew him. Lizzie Findlay, only daughter of the Parton, and the prettiest girl in the company, blushed crimson. She had danced with him at Lossie House, and he had said things to her by way of polite attention, which he would never have said had she been of his own rank. He would have lounged past with a careless glance, but the procession halted by one consent, and the bride, taking a bottle and glass which her brother carried, proceeded to pour out a bumper of whiskey, while the groomsman addressed Lord Michaelham. "'You're the bride's first foot, sir,' he said. "'What do you mean by that?' asked Lord Michaelham. "'Here's the bride, sir. She'll tell you.' Lord Michaelham lifted his hat. "'Allow me to congratulate you,' he said. "'You're my first foot,' returned the bride, eagerly yet modestly, as she held out to him the glass of whisky. "'This is to console me for not being in the bridegroom's place, I presume. But notwithstanding my jealousy, I drink to the health of both,' said the young nobleman, and tossed off the liquor. <coughs> "'Would you mind explaining to me what you mean by this ceremony?' he added, to cover a slight choking caused by the strength of the dram." "'It's for luck, sir,' answered Joseph Mare. "'A first foot who wouldn't bring ill luck upon a new married couple. "'Mon I do as ye ha' done this minute. "'Take a dram frae the bride.' "'Is that the sole privilege connected with my good fortune?' said Lord Michaelham. "'If I take the bride's dram, I must join the bride's regiment. "'My good fellow,' he went on, approaching Malcolm, "'you have more than your share of the best things of this world.' "'For Malcolm had two partners, "'and the one on the side next Lord Michaelham, "'who, as he spoke, offered her his arm, was Lizzie Findlay. "'No, as share is gang, my lord,' returned Malcolm, tightening his arm on Lizzie's hand. "'Ye mauna gang wi' one of our customs to gang again another. Fisher folk is ready enough to part with their whisky, but not with their lasses. Na, haith. Lord Michaelham's face flushed, and Lizzie looked down, very evidently disappointed. But the bride's father, a wrinkled and brown little man, with a more gentle bearing than most of them, interfered. "'Ye see, my lord, gin it be so I mun call ye.' and Malcolm seems to ken. We are like by ourselves for the present, and we're but a rough set of folk for such like as your lordship to hold where to mouth with. But gin it would please you to come o'er the gate any time of the evening, and take your share o' what's gone, you should be welcome, and we would count it a great honour for as as your lordship. I shall be most happy, answered Lord Michaelham, and taking off his hat, he went his way. The party returned to the home of the bride's parents. Her mother stood at the door with a white handkerchief in one hand, and a quarter of oat-cake in the other. When the bride reached the threshold, she stood, and her mother, first laying the handkerchief on her head, broke the oat-cake into pieces upon it. These were distributed among the company, to be carried home and laid under their pillows. 
The bridegroom's party betook themselves to his father's house, where, as well as at old mare's, a substantial meal of tea, bread and butter, cake and cheese was provided. Then followed another walk, to allow of both houses being made tidy for the evening's amusement. About seven, Lord Michaelham made his appearance, and had a hearty welcome. He had bought a showy brooch for the bride, which she accepted with the pleasure of a child. In their games, which had already commenced, he joined heartily, gaining high favour with both men and women. When the great clothes-basket full of sweeties, the result of a subscription among the young men, was carried round by two of them, he helped himself liberally with the rest, and at the inevitable game of forfeits met his awards with unflinching obedience, contriving ever through it all that Lizzie Findlay should feel herself his favourite. In the general hilarity, neither the heightened colour of her cheek nor the vivid sparkle in her eyes attracted notice. Doubtless some of the girls observed the frequency of his attentions, but it woke nothing in their minds beyond a little envy of her passing good fortune. Michaelam was handsome and a lord. Lizzie was pretty, though a fisherman's daughter. A sort of Darwinian selection had apparently found place between them. But as the same entertainment was going on in two houses at once, and there was naturally a good deal of passing and repassing between them, no one took the least notice of several short absences from the company on the part of the pair. Supper followed, at which his lordship sat next to Lizzie, and partook of dried skate and mustard, bread and cheese, and beer. Every man helped himself. Lord Michaelam and a few others were accommodated with knives and forks, but the most were independent of such artificial aids. Whiskey came next, and Lord Michaelam being already, like many of the young men of his time, somewhat fond of strong drink, was not content with such sipping as Lizzie honoured his glass withal. At length it was time, according to age-long custom, to undress the bride and bridegroom and put them to bed. The bride's stocking, last ceremony of all, being thrown amongst the company, as by its first contact prophetic of the person next to be married. Neither Lizzie nor Lord Michaelam, however, had any chance of being thus distinguished, for they were absent and unmissed. As soon as all was over, Malcolm set out to return home. As he passed Joseph Mare's cottage, he found Feemy waiting for him at the door, still in the mild splendour of her pearl-like necklace. "'I tell the laird what you tell me to tell him, Malcolm,' she said. "'And what did he say, Feemy?' asked Malcolm. "'He said he kent you was a friend.' "'Was that all?' "'Aye, that was all.' "'Well, you're a good lassie.' "'Ow, middlin,' answered the little maiden. Malcolm took his way along the top of the cliffs, pausing now and then to look around him. The crescent moon had gone down, leaving a starlit night in which the sea lay softly moaning at the foot of the broken crags. The sense of infinitude which comes to the soul when it is in harmony with the peace of nature arose and spread itself abroad in Malcolm's being, and he felt with the Galileans of old, when they forsook their nets and followed him who called them, that catching fish was not the end of his being, although it was the work his hands had found to do. The stillness was all the sweeter for its contrast with the merriment he had left behind him, and a single breath of wind, like the waft from a passing wing, kissed his forehead tenderly, as if to seal the truth of his meditations. End of chapter 28《Chapter 29 of Malcolm by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Devorah Allen. Chapter 29 Florimel and Duncan. In the course of a fortnight, Lord Michaelam and his aunt, the bold faced Countess, had gone, and the Marquis, probably finding it a little duller in consequence, began to pay visits in the neighbourhood. Now and then he would be absent for a week or two, at Bogagite, or Huntley Lodge, or Frendrocht, or Balvany, and although Lady Florimel had not much of his society, she missed him at meals and felt the place grown dreary from his being nowhere within its bounds. On his return from one of his longer absences, he began to talk to her about a governess, but, though in a playful way, she rebelled utterly at the first mention of such an incubus. She had plenty of material for study, she said, in the library, and plenty of amusement in wandering about with the sullen demon, who was her constant companion during his absences. And if he did force a governess upon her, she would certainly murder the woman, if only for the sake of bringing him into trouble. Her easy-going father was amused, 
laughed and said nothing more on the subject at the time. Lady Florimel did not confess that she had begun to feel her life monotonous, or mention that she had for some time been cultivating the acquaintance of a few of her poor neighbours, and finding their odd ways of life and thought and speech interesting. She had especially taken a liking to Duncan MacPhail, in which, strange to say, Demon, who had hitherto absolutely detested the appearance of anyone not attired as a lady or gentleman, heartily shared. She found the old man so unlike anything she had ever heard or read of, so full of grand notions in such contrast with his poor conditions, so proud, yet so overflowing with service, dusting a chair for her with his bonnet, yet drawing himself up like an offended hidalgo if she declined to sit in it, more than content to play the pipes while others dined, yet requiring a personal apology from the Marquis himself for a practical joke, so full of kindness, and yet of revenges, lamenting over demon when he hurt his foot, yet cursing, as she overheard him once, in fancied solitude, with an absolute fervour of imprecation, a continuous blast of poetic hate which made her shiver, and the next moment sighing out a most wailful coronach on his old pipes. It was all so odd, so funny, so interesting. It nearly made her aware of human nature as an object of study. But Lady Florimel had never studied anything yet, had never even perceived that anything wanted studying, that is, demanded to be understood. What appeared to her most odd, most inconsistent, and was indeed of all his peculiarities alone distasteful to her, was his delight in what she regarded only as the menial and dirty occupation of cleaning lamps and candlesticks. The poetic side of it, rendered tenfold poetic by his blindness, she never saw. Then he had such tales to tell her, of mountain, stream, and lake, of love and revenge, of beings less and more than natural, brownie and boneless, kelpie and fairy, such wild legends also, haunting the dim, emergent peaks of mist-swathed Celtic history, such songs, come down, he said, from Oshin himself, that sometimes she would sit and listen to him for hours together. It was no wonder, then, that she should win the heart of the simple old man speedily and utterly, for what can bard desire beyond a true listener? A mind into which his own may, in verse or tale or rhapsody, in pibroch or coronach, overflow. But when one evening in girlish merriment she took up his pipes, blew the bag full, and began to let a highland air burst fitfully from the chanter, the jubilation of the old man broke all the bounds of reason. He jumped from his seat and capered about the room, calling her all the tenderest and most poetic names his English vocabulary would afford him, then abandoning the speech of the Sassenach, as if in despair of ever uttering himself through its narrow and rugged channels, overwhelmed her with a cataract of soft-flowing Gaelic, returning to English only as his excitement passed over into exhaustion, but in neither case aware of the transition. Her visits were the greater comfort to Duncan, that Malcolm was now absent almost every night, and most days a good many hours asleep. Had it been otherwise, Florimel, invisible for very width as was the gulf between them, could hardly have made them so frequent. Before the fishing season was over, the piper had been twenty times on the verge of disclosing every secret in his life to the high-born maiden. "'It's a pity you haven't a wife to take care of you, Mr. MacPhail,' she said one evening. "'You must be so lonely without a woman to look after you.' A dark cloud came over Duncan's face, out of which his sightless eyes gleamed. "'She'll have her boy, and she'll be wanting no wife,' he said sullenly. "'Wife's as bad.' Ah, said Florimel, the teasing spirit of her father uppermost for the moment. That accounts for your swearing so shockingly the other day? Swearing, was she? That will be wrong. And who was she'll be swearing at? That's what I want you to tell me, Mr. MacPhail. Did you hear her, my lady? He asked in a tone of reflection, as if trying to recall the circumstance. Indeed I did. You frightened me so that I didn't dare come in. Then she'll be punished enough. But it was no harm to curse the wicked Carmel. It was not Glenlyon. It wasn't a man at all. It was a woman you were in such a rage with. Was it the rascal's wife then, my lady? He asked, as if he were willing to be guided to the truth that he might satisfy her, but so much in the habit of swearing that he could not well recollect the particular object at a given time. 
Is his wife as bad as himself, then? Wife's is always worser. But what is it makes you hate him so dreadfully? Is he a bad man? A very bad man, my dear lady. He is dead more than a hundred years. Then why do you hate him so? Oh, Con, don't you'll never hear why. He can't have done you any harm. Not done Duncan any harm. Didn't you all know what a dog would be doing to her ancestors of Glencoe? Oh, Con, oh, Con. Give her the dog's heart of him in her teeth, and she'll be tearing it, tearing it, tearing it, cried the piper in a growl of hate, and with the look of a maddened tiger, the skin of his face drawn so tight over the bones that they seemed to show their whiteness through it. You quite terrify me, said Florimel, really shocked. If you talk like that, I must go away. Such words are not fit for a lady to hear. The old man heard her rise. He fell on his knees and held out his arms in entreaty. "'She's begging your pardons, my lady. Sit down once more, angel from heaven, and she'll not say it no more. But she'll be telling you the story, and then you'll be knowing that what'll not be fit for ladies to hear, as good ladies had to bear.' He caught up the lossy pipes, threw them down again, searched in a frenzy till he found his own, blew up the bag with short, quick pants, forced from them a low wail which ended in a scream, then broke into a kind of chant, the words of which were something like what follows. He had sense enough to remember that for his listener they must be English. Doubtless he was translating as he went on. His chanter all the time kept up a low, pitiful accompaniment, his voice only giving expression to the hate and execration of the song. Black rise the hills round the vale of Glencoe, Hard rise its rocks up the sides of the sky. Cold fall the streams from the snow on their summits. Bitter are the winds that search for the wanderer. False are the vapors that trail o'er the corre. Blacker than the caverns that hollow the mountain. Harder than crystals in the rock's bosom. Colder than ice borne down in the torrents. More bitter than hail windswept o'er the corre. Falser than vapors that hide the dark precipice is the heart of the Campbell. THE HELLHOUND GLENLION. IS IT BLOOD THAT IS STREAMING DOWN INTO THE VALLEY? HA! TIS THE RED-COATED BLOODHOUNDS OF ORANGE. TO HUNT THE RED DEER, IS THIS A FIT SEASON? GLENLION, SAID IAN, THE SON OF THE CHIEFTAIN, WHAT SEEK YE WITH GUNS AND WITH GILLIES SO MANY? FRIENDS, A WARM FIRE, GOOD CHEER, AND A DRINK, SAID THE LIAR OF HELL WITH THE DEATH IN HIS HEART. COME HOME TO MY HOUSE, IT IS POOR BUT YOUR OWN. Cheese of the goat and flesh of black cattle, and dew of the mountain to make their hearts joyful, they gave them in plenty. They gave them with welcome, and they slept on the heather and skins of the red deer. O oh, chone for the chief, God's curse on the traitors. O oh, chone for the chief, the father of his people. He is struck through the brain, and not in the battle. O oh, chone for his lady, the teeth of the badgers have torn the bright rings from her slender fingers. They have stripped her and shamed her in sight of her clansmen. They have sent out her ghost to cry after her husband. Nine men did Glenlyon slay, nine of the true hearts. His own host he slew, the laird of Inverigan. Fifty they slew, the rest fled to the mountains. In the deep snow the women and children fell down and slept, nor awoke in the morning. The bard of the glen, alone among strangers, Alistair, bard of the glen in the mountain, Sings peace to the ghost of his father's father, slain by the curse of Glencoe, Glenlyon. Curse on Glenlyon, his wife's fair bosom, dry up with weeping the fates of her children. Curse on Glenlyon, each drop of his heart's blood turned to red fire and burned through his arteries. The pale, murdered faces haunt him to madness. The shrieks of the ghosts from the mists of Glencoe ring in his ears through the caves of perdition. Men, woman, and child, to the last born Campbell, rush howling to hell and fall cursing Glenlyon, the liar who drank with his host and then slew him. While he chanted, the whole being of the bard seemed to pour itself out in the feeble and quavering tones that issued from his withered throat. His voice grew in energy for a while as he proceeded, but at last gave way utterly under the fervor of imprecation and ceased. Then, as if in an agony of foiled hate, he sent from chanter and drone a perfect screech of execration, with which the instrument dropped from his hands, 
and he fell back in his chair, speechless. Lady Florimel started to her feet, and stood trembling for a moment, hesitating whether to run from the cottage and call for help, or do what she might for the old man herself. But the next moment he came to himself, saying, in a tone of assumed composure, "'You will be knowing now, my lady, why she'll be hating the very name of Glenlyon.' "'But it was not your grandfather that Glenlyon killed, Mr. Macphail, was it?' "'And whose grandfather would it be, then, my lady?' returned Duncan, drawing himself up. "'The Glencoe people weren't Macphails. I've read the story of the massacre and know all about that.' He might have been her mother's father, my lady. But you said father's father in your song. She said Alistair's father's father, my lady, she believes. I can't quite understand you, Mr. Macphail. Well, you see, my lady, her father was out in the forty-five and fought the redcoats at Culloden. That's his claymore on the wall there. A good blade, though she's not an Andrew Ferrara. She was forged in Glencoe, by a cousin of her own, Angus by name, and she's a very good blade. She'll can well whistle the pibroch of Ian Lom about the ears of the Sassenach. Her grandfather was with his uncle in the battle of Killycrenky after Tundi. A great man, my lady, and he died there. And so did her granduncle, for a villain of a Mackay, from Lord Ray's cursed country, where they always was rebels, my lady. Just as her uncle was be cutting down to wicked General Mackay, turned him round without giving no warnings, and killed a poor man at one blow. But what has it all to do with your name? I declare I don't know what to call you. Call her your own bard, old Duncan Macphail, my sweet lady, and have the patience with her, and she'll be telling you all about everything. Only you must give her old brains time to tumble themselves about. Her head grows very stupid. Yes, as she was saying, after the bloody massacre at Culloden, her father had to hide himself away out of sight, and to forge himself. I mean, to put upon himself a name that didn't mean himself at all. And my poor mother, who bored me, big old Duncan, the very day of that battle, would not be here in one word of him for three months that he was away, and when he would be creep back like a fox to see her one fine night when the moon was not be up, they'll make an agreement to go away together for a time and to call themselves Macphails. But by and by they took their own names again. And why haven't you your own name now? I'm sure it's a much prettier name. Because she'll be taking the other, my dear lady. And why? Because... Because... She will tell you another time. She'll be tired to talk more about the cursed Comals this very day. "'Then Malcolm's name is not Macphail either?' "'No, it is not, my lady.' "'Is he your son's son, or your daughter's son?' "'Perhaps not, my lady.' "'I want to know what his real name is. "'Is it the same as yours? "'It doesn't seem respectable not to have your own names.' "'Oh, yes, my lady, very respectable. "'Many good men has to borrow names of their neighbours.' We've all got our very own names, only in bad days, my lady, we don't always know which they are exactly. But we all know which we are each other, and we get on very good without the names. We lay them by with our Sabbath clothes for a few days, and they come out the fresher and the sweeter for keeping the Sabbath so long, my lady. And now she'll be playing you the Coronach of Glencoe, which she was make herself for her own pipes. I want to know first what Malcolm's real name is, persisted Lady Florimel. "'Well, you see, my lady,' returned Duncan, "'some people has names and does not know them, "'and some people hasn't names and will be supposing they have.' "'You are talking riddles, Mr. Macphail, and I don't like riddles,' "'said Lady Florimel, with an offence which was not altogether pretended. "'Yes, surely. Oh, yes. "'Call her Duncan Macphail, and neither more or less, my lady. "'Not yet,' he returned, most evasively. "'I see you won't trust me,' said the girl, and rising quickly she bade him good-night and left the cottage. Duncan sat silent for a few minutes, as if in distress. Then slowly his hand went out feeling for his pipes, wherewithal he consoled himself till bedtime. Having plumed herself upon her influence with the old man, believing she could do anything with him she pleased, 
Lady Florimel was annoyed at failing to get from him any amplification of a hint in itself sufficient to cast a glow of romance about the youth who had already interested her so much. Duncan also was displeased, but with himself, for disappointing one he loved so much. With the passion for confidence which love generates, he had been for some time desirous of opening his mind to her upon the matter in question, and had indeed, on this very occasion, intended to lead up to a certain disclosure. But just at the last he clung to his secret, and could not let it go. Compelled thereto against the natural impulse of the Celtic nature which is open and confiding, therefore in the reaction cunning and suspicious, he had practised reticence so long that he now recoiled from a breach of the habit which had become a second false nature. He felt like one who, having caught a bird, holds it in his hand with the full intention of letting it go, but cannot make up his mind to do it just yet, knowing that, the moment he opens his hand, nothing can make that bird his again. A whole week passed, during which Lady Florimel did not come near him, and the old man was miserable. At length one evening, for she chose her time when Malcolm must be in some vague spot between the shore and the horizon, she once more entered the piper's cottage. He knew her step the moment she turned the corner from the shore, and she had scarcely set her foot across the threshold before he broke out, "'Ah, my dear lady, and did you think old Duncan such a stupid old man as not to be trusting the light of her blind eyes? But her lady must forgive her, for it is a long tale, not like anything you'll be in the way of believing. And also, it'll be but a tassel to another long tale which tears the bag of her heart and makes her feel a burning devil in the pocket of her bosom. But she'll tell you to one half of it that belongs to her boy Malcolm. He's a big boy now, but he wasn't always. No, he was once a very little small child in her old blind arms. But he wasn't old then. Why must young peoples grow old, my lady? But she'll be glad of it herself, for she'll can hate the better. Lady Florimel, incapable either of setting forth the advantages of growing old, or of enforcing the duty, which is the necessity, of forgiveness, answered with some commonplace. And as to fortify his powers of narration, a sailor would cut himself a quid, and a gentleman fill his glass or light a fresh cigar, Duncan slowly filled his bag. After a few strange notes, as of a spirit wandering in pain, he began his story. But I will tell the tale for him, lest the printed oddities of his pronunciation should prove wearisome. I must mention first, however, that he did not commence until he had secured a promise from Lady Florimel that she would not communicate his revelations to Malcolm, having, he said, very good reasons for desiring to make them himself, so soon as a fitting time should have arrived. Avoiding all mention of his reasons, either for assuming another name, or for leaving his native glen, he told how, having wandered forth with no companion but his bagpipes, and nothing he could call his own beyond the garments and weapons which he wore, he traversed the shires of Inverness and Nairn and Moray, offering at every house on his road to play the pipes, or clean the lamps and candlesticks, and receiving sufficient return, mostly in the shape of food and shelter, but partly in money, to bring him all the way from Glencoe to Port Lossie. Somewhere near the latter was a cave in which his father, after his flight from Culloden, had lain in hiding for six months, in hunger and cold, and in constant peril of discovery and death, all in that region being rebels, for as such Duncan of course regarded the adherents of the houses of Orange and Hanover. And having occasion, for reasons, as I have said, unexplained, in his turn to seek like a hunted stag, a place far from his beloved glen, wherein to hide his head, he had set out to find the cave, which the memory of his father would render far more of a home to him now than any other place left him on earth. On his arrival at Port Lossie, he put up at a small public house in the Seton, from which he started the next morning to find the cave, a somewhat hopeless as well as perilous proceeding. But his father's description of its situation and character had generated such a vivid imagination of it in the mind of the old man that he believed himself able to walk straight into the mouth of it, nor was the peril so great as must at first appear to one who had been blind all his life. But he searched the whole of the east side of the promontory of Scarnos, where it must lie, without finding such a cave as his father had depicted. Again and again he fancied he had come upon it, but was speedily convinced of his mistake. Even in one who had his eyesight, however, 
such a failure would not surprise those who understood how rapidly, as well as constantly, the whole faces of some cliffs are changing by the fall of portions, destroying the very existence of some caves, and utterly changing the mouths of others. From a desire of secrecy, occasioned by the haunting dread of its approaching necessity, day and night being otherwise much alike to him, Duncan generally chose the night for his wanderings amongst the rocks, and probings of their hollows. One night, or rather morning, for he believed it was considerably past twelve o'clock, he sat weary in a large open cave, listening to the sound of the rising tide, and fell fast asleep, his bagpipes, without which he never went abroad, across his knees. He came to himself with a violent start, for the bag seemed to be moving, and its last faint sound of wail was issuing. Heavens! There was a baby lying upon it! For a time he sat perfectly bewildered, but at length concluded that some wandering gypsy had made him a too ready gift of the child she did not prize. Someone must be near. He called aloud, but there was no answer. The child began to cry. He sought to soothe it, and its lamentation ceased. The moment that its welcome silence responded to his blandishments, the still, small, here I am, of the eternal love, whispered its presence in the heart of the lonely man. Something lay in his arms so helpless that to it, poor and blind and forsaken of man and woman as he was, he was yet a tower of strength. He clasped the child to his bosom, and rising forthwith, set out, but with warier steps than heretofore, over the rocks for the Seton. Already he would much have preferred concealing him lest he should be claimed, a thing, in view of all the circumstances, not very likely, but for the child's sake he must carry him to the salmon, where he had free entrance at any hour, not even the public house locking its doors at night. Thither then he bore his prize, shielding him from the night air as well as he could, with the bag of his pipes. But he waked none of the inmates, lately fed the infant slept for several hours, and then did his best both to rouse and astonish the neighborhood. Closely questioned, Duncan told the truth, but cunningly in such manner that some disbelieved him altogether, while others, who had remarked his haunting of the rocks ever since his arrival, concluded that he had brought the child with him and had kept him hidden until now. The popular conviction at length settled to this, that the child was the piper's grandson, but base-born, whom therefore he was ashamed to acknowledge, although heartily willing to minister to and bring up as a foundling. The latter part of this conclusion, however, was not alluded to by Duncan in his narrative. It was enough to add that he took care to leave the former part of it undisturbed. The very next day he found himself attacked by a low fever. But as he had hitherto paid for everything he had at the inn, they never thought of turning him out when his money was exhausted. And as he had already, by his discreet behavior, and the pleasure his bagpipes afforded, made himself not a few friends amongst the simple-hearted people of the Seton, some of the benevolent inhabitants of the upper town, Miss Horne in particular, were soon interested in his favor, who supplied him with everything he required until his recovery. As to the baby, he was gloriously provided for. He had at least a dozen foster mothers at once. No woman in the Seton who could enter a claim founded on the possession of the special faculty required, failing to enter that claim, with the result of an amount of jealousy almost incredible. Meantime, the town drummer fell sick and died, and Miss Horne made a party in favor of Duncan, but for the baby, I doubt if he would have had a chance, for he was a stranger and interloper. The women, however, with the baby in their forefront, carried the day. Then his opponents retreated behind the instrument, and strove hard to get the drum recognized as an essential of the office. When Duncan recoiled from the drum with indignation, but without losing the support of his party, the opposition had the effrontery to propose a bell. That he rejected with a vehemence of scorn that had nearly ruined his cause and assuming straightway the position of chief party in the proposed contract, declared that no noise of his making should be other than the noise of bagpipes, that he would rather starve than beat drum or ring bell. If he served in the case, it must be after his own fashion, and so on. Hence it was no wonder, some of the Baileys being not only small men and therefore conceited, but powerful Whigs, who despised everything Highland, and the bagpipes especially, if the affair did for a while seem hopeless but the more noble-minded of the authorities approved of the piper none the less for his independence, a generosity partly rooted, it must be confessed, 
in the amusement which the annoyance of their weaker brethren afforded them, whom at last they were happily successful in outvoting, so that the bagpipes superseded the drum for a season. It may be asked whence it arose that Duncan should now be willing to quit his claim to any paternal property in Malcolm, confessing that he was none of his blood. One source of the change was doubtless the desire of confidences between himself and Lady Florimel. Another, the growing conviction, generated it may be by the admiration which is born of love, that the youth had gentle blood in his veins. And a third, that Duncan had now so thoroughly proved the heart of Malcolm as to have no fear of any change of fortune ever alienating his affections, or causing him to behave otherwise than as his dutiful grandson. It is not surprising that such a tale should have a considerable influence on Lady Florimel's imagination. Out of the scanty facts which formed but a second volume, she began at once to construct both a first and a third. She dreamed of the young fisherman that night, and reflecting in the morning on her intercourse with him, recalled sufficient indications in him of superiority to his circumstances, noted by her now, however, for the first time, to justify her dream. He might indeed well be the lost scion of a noble family. I do not intend the least hint that she began to fall in love with him. To balance his good looks and the nobility, to keener eyes yet more evident than to hers, in both his moral and physical carriage, the equally undeniable clownishness of his dialect and tone had huge weight, while the peculiar straightforwardness of his behavior and address not unfrequently savored in her eyes of rudeness. Besides which objectionable things, there was the persistent odor of fish about his garments, in itself sufficient to prevent such a catastrophe. The sole result of her meditations was the resolve to get some amusement out of him by means of a knowledge of his history superior to his own. End of chapter 29